for 600 kilometres, um, which was one that we, ta Catherine tagged on the west coast of Ireland and was picked all the way up off the north of Scotland. The really great thing about the Sea Monarch project is it's such a collaborative project. There are multiple partners from Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and we've all been working together now for a few years, so we've got some really strong collaborative bonds. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been working with Queen's University Belfast um, on the basking shark and the flapper skate. Um, and we've been actually been tagging those individuals for them. And very little is known about those animals, they're really sensitive species. Um, so anything that we can do, um, any information we can give is new and is novel. Um, so it's been really great to work with all different partners in the different jurisdictions because as you know, like the animals we've been working on, they don't know any borders um, or jurisdictions. So um, yeah, it's been really great to be able to track them further than we ever have before up the west coast of Ireland and Scotland. Um, as we, I suppose as we go into the future, the work that been undertaken by the Sea Monitor Project uh, lays the foundation for a better understanding of how climate change is impacting uh, the ocean, not only uh, physical oceanography but also on the animals that live there. Um, the animals, you know, that, that move and migrate and feed and completely live in the ocean, they're the best indicators of change in the ocean. So by understanding how their natural behaviour is changing, we can understand what's actually going on in the ocean. And yep, yeah, hopefully we can build on Sea Monitor now and into the future. Exactly. A unique marine research project was launched in April 2019. Sea Monitor is aiming to help address some of the issues facing our ocean life and our regional waters. So I guess at the core of it, kind of the original thinking of it, there's a strong sort of salmon heart to the project, which isn't the reason. But looking at that offshore movement of salmon and looking at that kind of survivorship out in the open water areas, the original idea expanded very rapidly. So to include basking sharks, to include skate, to include porpoise, to include the seals. Delivered on an unprecedented scale, this is Europe's largest marine life tracking project. A variety of species are tagged with transmitters, sending out a range of information, including location and depth, with the data recorded as they pass a line of underwater receivers called an array. The information will help us better understand and protect some of the most vulnerable species in our seas. In March 2020, the Marine Institute's research vessel, Celtic Voyager, was commissioned to deploy the line of underwater receivers which make up the array. Using the latest in GPS and acoustic telemetry technology, these receivers will stretch from Mallon Head in Ireland to Isla in Scotland. With the data collected, tracks and models will be generated to better understand species and the pressures they face. Agency and an international consortium of partners. Together, we will produce marine spatial models for each species. Working collaboratively with a variety of stakeholders and our sister projects. For the first time, marine management plans will be developed for Atlantic salmon in the Foyle and Clyde River systems. To learn more, please visit our website, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our joint easy. Research on the cetaceans 
is important for many reasons. First off, or to protect them as species, but also to protect the whole marine environment. The main objective um, of GMIT's involvement in sea monitor is to carry out the acoustic monitoring. So we are looking at cetacean occurrence. It also allows us to identify threats that could, you know, in the long term have huge issues for these animals. So by doing this research, then we're able to look at best practices for the conservation of the species. And we're using acoustics because it can allow us to monitor for a very long period of time. And also cetaceans are kind kind of hard to see. Like first, we only see them when they come to the surface. And then you need very calm sea conditions, which doesn't happen every day. So the acoustic is really interesting for us. We can leave the hydrophone in the water for months at a time. And then when we get them back, we get detections. Uh, it works pretty well with cetaceans because they are very vocal species. They, they use sound for navigation, foraging, communication. How can we tell which species it is when we are recording uh, with the hydrophone? Some cetaceans have a signature um, and then the patterns in their call can help us determine the species. The main cetacean species that we um, think that we're going to get is harbour porpoise, bottomless dolphins, common dolphins, wristless dolphins if they were in the area we can target, baleen whales as well. We set up a collaboration with two other projects, MARPAM and Compass. So we conducted land-based surveys and then based on this we can compute where the animal was and the idea is getting a detection range for the hydrophones. I think what's interesting with this project is also that it shows that conservation efforts needs to be um, needs to be carried out like in collaboration. Like for example, cetacean, they are very mobile creatures and they don't know our borders. So I think this project really shows that we need to work together uh, if we want to make things happen.
If I can have your attention, please call people to their seats. We'll get started. Is that everybody in now? Can we seal the doors? No? Okay. Well, this is different. Welcome, everyone. I um, hope everybody's ready for a few action packed days of um, science and sharing the results of this project. Um, we couldn't have got a better venue. I think we did well, did we? No? It's good? It's good to see everyone in the flesh. Um, we're sick of looking at everyone's avatars and screens. Um, convenient as it can be, I don't think it can beat face to face sometimes. And this has been a, a strange project that way. Some project officers and staff were meeting for the first time, hopefully not the last time, uh, face to face. But we made it. Um, Many of you know who I am, but if you don't, I'm Ross McGill. I'm with the LOX agency, the principal project officer for the Sea Monitor project. And bad news, I'll be your compare for the day, but good news tomorrow, we've got the professionals coming in with Simon Watt to do the comparing. So we're really looking forward to sharing our research and findings with you. Um, we've got a lot to get through, um, so grab yourself a refreshment. We're here now, we're all seated. Um, bit of housekeeping, there's no planned fire drills or anything. Everyone knows where the exits are. It's been a while since the mobile phones were invented, but still, please switch them on silent if you haven't already. Um, the seating plan, yes, collaboration is a pretty big theme that you'll hear about. Forced collaboration is a theme to, for, for us. Um, if you don't like it, it'll switch tomorrow in this evening, so you can get friendly with someone else. Um, before we dive into stuff, I'm gonna hand it over to Sharon. Uh, McMahon, our CEO, for a few remarks. So, Sharon, if you're ready, just grabbing a bit of water. Um, look, folks, this is not the most formal uh, event that we want to keep this sort of collaborative and open. Um, we have Slido for your use, which we'll test afterwards. Um, but we do encourage people to maybe step out of their comfort zones a little bit and keep an open mind about stuff. And we've deliberately invited um, a mixture of people, not just all scientists, not just all government policy people. We have a range of people that have um, been involved in this project at different levels. So we would encourage you to keep that in mind and enjoy the time together, enjoy um, the see monitor results and the launch of Straits. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sharon. Distinguished guests and colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this beautiful historic guild hall situated in the heart of the Wall City in Derry, Londonderry for the Sea Monitor Straits Conference. We are delighted to be joined by marine scientists 
and academics from all of the organizations and institutions involved in the project, who have come together to share their knowledge, expertise, and research on the tracking of aquatic life in our oceans, seas, and rivers. As lead partner, the LOX Agency is delighted and honored to host this event, which will provide a summary of the research and findings obtained by the talented and experienced teams of people who have worked tirelessly to ensure the project's success. Before I talk a bit more about the Sea Monitor and Straits projects, I'd like to extend my thanks to a number of organizations for their support and guidance throughout the development phase and delivery of the project's objectives. First of all, a huge thanks must go to our funders, namely the Special EU Programs Body, the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in Northern Ireland, and the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government in Ireland. Without their funding and support, Sea Monitor would simply not have been possible. I would also like to extend my gratitude to all the partners who are here today, the Atlantic Technological University, University College Cork, University College Davis in California, the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute, Queen's University Belfast, the Ocean Tracking Network at Dalhousie University in Canada, the Marine Institute and the University of Glasgow, all who whom have worked tirelessly to ensure that Sea Monitor is a success. A huge thank you must go to Ross McGill, the Principal Project Officer for Sea Monitor, and the team at Grays for putting this event together and ensuring that hopefully it will all run as smoothly as possible. Finally, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Derry City and Straban District Council for allowing us to use this stunning venue. We're in a great location here, right in the heart of the city by the banks of the Foyle, which will give you ample opportunity to explore the historic walls and immerse yourself in the vibrant culture of the city. I'd like to briefly touch on the reason why we're all here in this historic venue today. The celebration of two unique projects Sea Monitor as it comes to an end and Straits as it begins. For those who aren't familiar with the project, it is a unique marine research program studying the seas around Ireland and Western Scotland through the use of advanced acoustic telemetry equipment, ensuring the provision of infrastructure and resources, which allows for collaboration with global partners working on acoustic tracking. Throughout the next two days, we will hear from the project partners who will present their findings on their individual unique areas of research. And I'm sure that all who have been involved in the project will agree that it has been a remarkable success. With over a thousand aquatic animals tagged and over 4.5 million detections recorded. The protection of vulnerable marine species is a key priority for the Sea Monitor project. And we hope that the data collated will be utilized to inform policy and management decisions, ensuring the long-term sustainability of our oceans and rivers. The species targeted in this project included salmon, seals, basking sharks, cetaceans, and skate, which are all vital to the health and well-being of our marine ecosystems. And it is our responsibility to protect them for future generations. Tomorrow afternoon will be focused on Straits, which has received EU funding of 3.5 million euros as part of the Horizon 2030 initiative, the four-year project in collaboration with partners from the European Tracking Network will ensure the redeployment and integration of the landmark counter in the North Channel with other major counters around Europe, such as those in the Danish Straits, the Strait of Gibraltar, and the Bosphorus Strait. The team can't wait to tell you more about this project tomorrow, which is essentially the spiritual successor of Sea Monitor. We have a packed schedule over the next two days, and we'll hope that you'll find both days informative and engaging. In finishing, I would like to say that LOX Agency has been honoured as, as to be entrusted as a lead partner on both of these projects, and we will continue to work in collaboration on Straits and many other research projects in order to develop plans which will help protect, manage, and develop marine species and habitats around the globe. I hope you enjoy both days, and thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, we are indeed hoping we can go from strength to strength with acoustic telemetry uh, moving forward. Um, just um, a quick thing. I had gone through some slides and photos from 
when we launched this back in 2019. And that's what we all looked like. At the time, uh, before COVID, young, fresh, and optimistic. That's how I feel at the moment, coming at the other end of uh, Seamonder. I can't speak for anyone else. Uh, but we're here now. Uh, we've made it. Uh, most of the people that were at the launch are here today, and we've picked up a lot of people and um, collaborated since. And we're proud of what we've accomplished, and we're excited to hear about the results of um, the individual partners in their work areas. Um, Another note I need to make before we, we dive into the science and hear from the first work package, uh, University College Cork and the SEAL research, is the sort of heart of this project was scaling up um, in this region of the world un before, unprecedented sort of infrastructure that hadn't been tested at this scale. And really that was down to everybody pitching in and, and working through all the logistical problems and procurement and everything. But when it got down to deploying the stuff and maintaining the stuff, you know, this was Europe's largest fish counter, Europe's largest telemetry array. And there's a few people that need to be pointed out at the beginning of this. Um, Diego de Villar is one of them, our senior scientist who led the charge. Um, but to give you a flavor of what it was like maintaining and, and doing all this work, um, the research vessel, uh, Celtic Voyager, Marine Institute were big partners. Morgan Pommier, also another scientist that helped Diego and was out on the boats. There's a lot of people to sort of thank. The skippers as well. Um, some of them are here today. Um, that's us cleaning the largest array. I don't know if the video will play, but that was on a nice day. Do we play the video on a nice day? No? doesn't work, never does. Anyway, we got a whole flavor of stuff in there. There was nice days on the ocean and there were not so nice days, seasick days. And then there were days when that's what cleaning Europe's largest array looked like. So it was a bit of a slog, but we got there in the end. Um, we've proven the concept and I'm excited to hear from the first uh, presenter today. Now we've had a slight change in the schedule. Um, unforeseen events, Dr. Sam Cox, from University College Cork couldn't make it up. Um, we have in her place uh, the PI and who also was involved in the research, Dr. Mark Jessup from the university. So University College Cork led on the SEAL research and this was something that had never been done before. Uh, government funded SEAL rescue center in Northern Ireland at Exploris. Um, they had never really empirically got empirical evidence to find out where the SEALs after release got up to. Um, so. I'll hand it over to Mark now to sort of tell us what they found. Thanks very much, Ross. Um, so, do apologize to start here. Um, I'm going to try and do some justice to Sam's slides that she produced and put up here. I didn't see them until about 10 o'clock last night, but um, I, I know most of the stuff, so do bear with me if I stumble a little bit here. So, this is work that we did um, led by University College Cork looking at rehabilitated harbour seal survival and movement post rehabilitation. So just to start with, just let you know that we've got two species of seal in Ireland. We've got the common or harbour seal and the grey seal. Common or harbour seals can grow up to maybe 100, 120 kilos. Grey seals maybe up to 200 kilos for the males. Um, both are protected under both the UK Conservation Seal Act um, and the Irish Wildlife Act and the EU Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. And they're also listed under Annex 2 of the Habitats Directive, um, requiring that populations are maintained at favorable levels. And that's key to the work that we were doing here because, generally speaking, seals in Ireland and across in Scotland are exposed to a variety of different threats. And they include things like bycatch in fisheries where they're caught in fishing nets. Um, we get death or injury from those entanglements. We have changes in prey abundance um, due to fisheries practices and climate change affecting um, prey distributions. We have contaminants, things like pollutions or toxins from harmful algal blooms affecting seal populations. There have been instances of culling or illegal kills. And we also have things like disease um, and worms, parasites, things like focine distemper virus and lungworm infections in seals. And one of the key things that we were looking at in relation to the rehabilitated seals is disturbance at their haul out sites, which will be um, resulting in pups being abandoned by the mothers. And when we're talking about the conservation of seals and the necessary means of, of maintaining them at their, their favorable conservation status, 
we can see from repeat surveys over the years that um, populations of both grey and harbour seals are rel relatively stable or increasing in the Republic of Ireland. However, when we come across to Northern Ireland, we see some evidence of increases in grey seal populations, but harbour seals have generally been in decline for the past number of years. And this is also reflected in Scotland, um, despite some increases in some areas that we have. Overall, the population in Scotland of harbour seals is decreasing as well. <coughs> so in order to try and maintain the populations, there's a number of rehabilitation programs. This is a common practice that's done worldwide, where essentially um, sick, injured, or abandoned pups, um, young seals, are taken into care. Um, they're taught how to sort of forage. They're brought up to a certain um, status of health before they're released back into the environment in the hopes that they will then grow up, mature, and contribute to the breeding population. So the goal of these programs is to have you know, a conservation impact by sort of bringing seals that would otherwise die and enabling them to, to reach maturity and, and um, reproduce. But despite the fact that we've got a lot of these programs running worldwide, there's very little evidence of their utility or their usefulness or their success once those seals have been released back into the wild. This is because when you put a tag or, or a flipper tag on an animal and release it back into the wild, 99.9% .9 of the time you're never going to see that again and you don't know whether that's because that animal has died or it's just traveled outside of an area that's being monitored. These are animals that spend quite a lot of time at sea. So what we wanted to do under the Sea Monitor project is look at how effective these um, rehabilitation programs were. So we were putting GPS-enabled tags onto seals once they'd finished their rehabilitation and track them out at sea for anywhere up to six months, and we'll go through the, the details of that in a second. So we were looking at those post-release um, tracks and behaviors of seals once they'd been done. So between November 2019 and July 2021, we had 17 rehabilitated juvenile seals fitted with these devices, and we had a number of different aims within the project. One was to assess their behavioral development. When did they start diving efficiently? When did they start capturing prey efficiently? Looking at their survival, how many of the released seals would actually go on to survive for a set period of time? Looking at their movements and their space use to identify important areas that these seals would um, habituate in? And Lastly, to look at overlap with um, anthropogenic or human activities that would include fisheries, things like wind farm developments, um, coastal developments, all that sort of stuff. So this is a, a quick rundown of the type of technology we put on. They're quite um, expensive tags. Each one is about 4,000 euros, hence the reason we only managed to get 17 of them put out. But essentially, this is a tag that stores data on board itself and then transmits it back to us as researchers in re near real time via the GSM mobile phone network. So first we've got an antenna on there that relays the data back to us um, on the computers. And we've got a GPS um, chip on here that gives a recording of the location of those animals every 10 to 15 minutes. So we get lots of really good data over the period of time that they're on. <coughs> we have a wet dry sensor so we can tell when seals are in the water or where they're hauled out um, and resting on land. We have a pressure sensor that can measure depth so we can get an indication of how deep these animals are diving and how that changes over time as they get more efficient at diving. And we have a, quite a large battery here that should provide around about six months' worth of data on transmission and recording. And there's an option on the tags that we can turn on this thing called an accelerometer, and this records very fine-scale behaviors in three dimensions. Um, it's quite power-hungry, and it creates an awful lot of data, so it does reduce the battery life of the tag by about two-thirds. So we're lucky to get around about two months out once we've put those on as well. But we get a lot of very, very good, high-quality data. So the tag attachment is quite simple. We wait for Explorus, um, the, the Port of Ferry um, Aquarium, to give us a call and say, we've got some seals that are ready to be released. We do the six hour drive from Cork up to Belfast. We glue a tag to it, we let it go, and then we drive six hours back to Cork. It's all done very, very quickly. Those tags are glued to the fur, and they should stay on those seals until the seal molts out its fur, which is a natural process that it does on an annual basis. So there should be a video that starts here. So this is just essentially going through seals in captivity. This is as simple as the tag attachment is, bit of super glue on the bottom of it, nice clean fur, put it in place, hold it for 20 seconds, and it's done. Um, and that seal is then ready for release. So it's very, very quick and painless. Um, for anyone in the audience, I know Oliver O'Kiley's here, um, who's helped us do some tagging of adult gray and harbor seals. It's much, much easier to put a tag on a 30 kilo pup than it is a biting, thrashing, 120 kilo um, fully grown adult. And then those seals are released. 
um, at a very nearby beach, going off quite happily there with the tags attached, um, and off to sea. I won't bother running the entire video here. It keeps going on a little bit. <coughs> so we had 17 tags deployed, um, essentially from um, 2019 through to 2021, and this just gives you an indication of the duration of each of those tags and which of the seals were put on there and when they were put on there. So these are rehabilitated seals, so they've been taken into care, and we can see from the map here, this is the location where all of those animals were recovered from. So it does represent the entire coast, pretty much, of Northern Ireland here. So we had quite a few um, taken down from around the Carlingford Lock area, but, you know, stretching right the way up to the northern coast here. So we had quite a wide um, spatial distribution of recovered seals. And the most common reason that these seals were taken into rehabilitation were due to abandonment or dog attacks. And both of these are related to human disturbance at their haul-out sites, on beaches, on rocky skerries. And more than half the seals that were um, taken into rehabilitation were considered to be healthy on arrival. And this essentially means there was nothing wrong with the animal apart from the fact that it had recently been disturbed or abandoned by its mother. And there's some education that we need to sort of put out here to the, the wider public as well, that if a seal is disturbed from a beach, there's not necessarily any reason to pick up that pup and take it to a rehabilitation center. If you leave it there nine times out of 10, the mother will probably come back and start to continue to care for that animal. But people just aren't really aware of that and they feel that they're doing a really good thing by taking it into rehab. Um, the majority of the seals requiring rescue were quite young, so seal pups would tend to get independence from their mother at around about four to six weeks of age. Um, and the majority of all of the, the animals that we had here were less than eight weeks of age, some being only one or two weeks old, so nowhere near their full development before they were abandoned and taken into care. Um, quite a number of them were underweight, um, quite low um, weight on the, the ones that were taken into care, and the time in rehabilitation does vary. So we had ones in here anywhere from 10 weeks up to six months. So it really depends on the seal and when it manages to learn to, to feed independently when it gets released. So the, the rehabilitation center tries to release seals at a target weight of around about 30 kilos with a good layer of blubber on it just to give it a good bit of a head start when it has to learn to feed for itself when it's been released. So when we start getting the data back from those tags, we can see some really interesting stuff here in terms of the behavioral development. So here on the graph, we've got the number of days since the tag was put on the seal and it was released. The, the bit you're already looking for here is the very dark line in the middle, and that's sort of the average um, amount that's done by all the seals that were released. And this is the distance traveled. So you can see that you know, within 28 days, many of those seals are traveling really um, essentially over 50 to 100 kilo, um, kilometers from the point of release. So quite a large distance and quite a large scale movement. And we can also look at their diving ability. So if you look at the top chart here, you can see in the first three to four days, they're actually not really diving all that much. Their dives are very shallow. But once they've done that three or four days, they're starting to dive much more regularly to larger durations and to much, much larger depths. So at the start, um, they were able to dive to depths of around 25 to 30 meters. And that's reflective of this sort of inshore distribution of the seals. These seals tend to be what we call benthic divers, so they feed down at the seabed. So generally speaking, when you see the dive depth of the seal, it indicates the depth of the water that it's feeding in. And then we did see dives that went up to 150 meters, um, which is quite deep. And this reflects their distribution when they move further offshore. And the dive duration is typically ranging from two to six minutes, and the maximum dive duration of around about 10 minutes. So extraordinary breath, breath holders here um, in terms of being able to, to hold their breath for that long. And when we turned on those accelerometers, we did this on five of the tags. We thought it was worth sacrificing a bit of battery life for that. We could actually see some really interesting um, details. So these tags will then record very jerky head movements. And those jerky head movements tend to be indicative of the seal lunging and trying to catch individual fish. So you can start to get this index of prey capture attempts, or PCAs, and start counting how many of those go on. And you can see that from the first couple of days of release, there's very, very little of this going on. And then after about three or four days, the seals start going, hang on a minute, these fish are not just sitting here waiting for me to eat them already dead. I have to actually chase and catch them and consume them. So it takes them a good couple of days to go, something's wrong here. I need to start feeding for myself. And then you start to see them massively increase their effort and those jerky head movements as they chase and catch um, prey. 
So we think this is actually the first recordings of prey capture attempts in any rehabilitated seals, you know, not only in Europe but worldwide. So this is quite new data and something that we need to explore further you know, to get sort of more um, understanding of. So one of the key things that we wanted to look at with this data was survival estimates. You know, how successful are these rehabilitation programs? Are we just fattening up seals in a rehabilitation center to release them into the wild and find that they can't survive and they all just die anyway and that's just a waste of, of time and resources? So one of the key things we were looking at in the data was trying to work out what the mortality of these post-release seals was. So we know that there were three individuals that had died. They were recovered or they were euthanized after being picked up again. So we had three seals, Ariel, Holby, and Mills. Um, the first two of those were picked up again by a rehab center in very poor condition, and they were euthanized because they had massive, massive parasite infection, so huge amounts of lungworm um, throughout their lungs, and they just had no hope of survival. So um, despite treating them, they weren't responding to the treatment very well um, and had to be euthanized. And Mills was found washed up dead on a beach um, and had been dead for you know, a, a good week or two before the, the corpse was found. So that's three out of the 17 that we know definitely died. And then we had one seal that was rescued in quite bad shape after one, um, after just a month after release. That was Baloo. This was a bit of a weird um, seal pup. It had been in care for nearly a year because it just refused to learn to feed for itself. Um, and then when it did start to do that, it got released and we found out, no, it, it just couldn't cope with this. So it was taken back into rehab um, and kept in rehab for at least another six months after that before being released. And then we could look at the data that the tags were giving us, and we have three seals here that we suspected died based on the activity of those tags. So it's really difficult to infer death of a seal if you stop getting a transmission. You don't know whether it's because the animal has died, or the tag has failed, or the battery has run out, or the tag has actually fallen off the animal and it's just not coming to the surface to transmit. So we have to do these much more nuanced analyses of the data that's coming through. And for example, this is um, Merida. We can see here the black line in the center here is the sort of the average amount of um, uh, distance traveled by all the seals that were tagged in the sort of two weeks prior to the last transmission. And you can kind of see that it's quite high and in the red line here is the seal that we're looking at and you can see that in the day or two prior to its, um, to its recapture and, and death, we can see that it's massively decreased its distance traveled on a daily basis and the dives that it's doing are very, very shallow um, and the, the duration of those dives is also very, very short. So it was actually not really foraging very efficiently at all. Similarly, we have from um, Hope, this was a very, very short deployment, but we can kind of see that this seal never really developed the ability to dive properly. So the, the dive durations were all very, very low compared to other seals and required a lot of time resting at the surface between dives, which indicates that there was just something wrong and very unhealthy with this seal prior to its, um, prior to its stopping um, transmitting. And then we've got Pip here, and this data is quite messy here, but you can kind of see that we've got swimming effort. So this is the amount of effort it takes to swim down and swim back up from the seabed, as well as things like the dive durations. And you can see that you know towards the end of the deployment here, just before the tag stopped transmitting, those dive durations became much, much smaller and lower. Um, the dive depths were a lot shallower and the swimming effort that was required to get down to the seabed and back up did increase. So there was a lot more effort being put into very little foraging. So we suspected that this animal was in very poor condition as well. But given all of this, with the confirmed, the suspected, we know that 41% of the seals had died or been suspected of dying, and that gives us around about 59% survival rate. Um, so this is actually on par with what we know about first year survival of harbour seal pups from other studies. Um, um, anywhere from the north of Scotland in Orkney, anywhere the, the estimates range from sort of 64%, which is similar to what we would have, anywhere up to 96% survival in other places like the US. But do note that these display quite a lot of high annual variability, so in some years you get very high mortality and in other years you get very low mortality and that's related to a whole heap of um, confounding factors, including prey availability and things like that. So this is a bit of an overview of the seal movements with a lovely little um, animation here, and it just essentially shows the seal's tracks showing a lot of variability between individuals. So seven of the seals that we tagged made quite extensive movements. They went across the Irish Sea, they went to Scotland, England, and Wales. They went around the coast, uh, to the coast of Wexford, to Donegal and Galway. 
while other seals actually remained quite close. They never really ventured very far away from their recovery or their release locations. So you can see some of those seals that are doing much, much longer trips, even around to the south coast of Wales. <coughs> and then the one seal that's just popped in around to, to the coast of Galway. So very large ranges um, with this, some of these seals and very, very large exploratory movements from some of those seals. And when we're looking at the data a little more um, forensically, I guess, we could see that the seals that had been rehabilitated and released in the autumn tended to do much, much longer exploratory movements. They went much, much further than those seals that were released in either the winter or in the summer. And this might indicate local prey availability or a lack of prey availability in those autumn months when those seals are released. So they're not finding it locally, and then they're going, I need to go and explore further off. And they're doing these much, much larger trips to try and find areas where there's much more prey resources. And those obviously in the winter and the spring, staying a lot more local. So that might indicate there's plenty of food around for them. And based on the observations of previously tracked adults um, of these same species in Irish waters, these exploratory movements by the pups are much more extensive than we would have predicted. Um, normally, harbour seals, um, as opposed to grey seals, don't really travel all that far. So these long-range movements of the seal pups were actually quite surprising to us. Um, we know that rehabilitated wild, um, rehabilitated and wild juvenile harbour seals in Western North America have shown some similar patterns with some large-scale exploratory movements as well. Um, but generally speaking, those pups are traveling much further than the adults. So generally, we would say that the adults are finding areas that they're able to support themselves in with plenty of food resources. They're learning to exploit those local areas, and they're staying put there. And there's some evidence that the seal pups were doing this as well. So these are two figures here that show the distance from the release site, and essentially what we have is a cumulative number of, I guess, areas visited over time. And you can see that within the first sort of 50 to 60 days, Nearly all of these seals have traveled whatever distance they have, and then they've not really started to explore any more areas. They've kind of got their area that they've explored, they know there's food there, and they're staying within those local areas. So that cumulative distance or the cumulative area that they've covered tends to plateau off after about 50 to 60 days. And we started to look at high use areas here. So the idea was to say, We've got a fairly small sample size compared to the size of the population, but where are those seals spending their time? And so we could start to look at the density of animal movements in certain areas and finding that we've got high use areas including Sprangford Lock, Dundrum Bay, offshore of Carlingford Lock and Dundalk, um, and around the Skerries and Lamb Bay Island a little further south. And this tends to be reflected in the known distribution of adult harbour seals. So the juveniles are obviously learning to go to areas where the adults are. They're possibly even seeing adults hauled out and they're joining them in haul out sites and foraging local for those as well. So we know from other studies, based on tracking studies and the location of colonies, that where our seal pups were ending up, very consistent with where those adult populations are concentrated. So the rehabilitated seals are then joining those wild populations and therefore increasing the chances of survival and reproduction later in life. So then we started to try and look at overlap with human activities. And one of the biggest threats to, to seals um, of both of our species is interactions with fisheries through things like bycatch and being drowned. So we started to get some vessel monitoring system data. And this is essentially um, two hourly locations of all the fishing vessels that are over 12 meters in length, operating in Northern Irish, Irish and Scottish waters that we got from a number of different um, government departments and did some analysis on where the locations of the seals were in relation to where the location of the fishing vessels were. And we found that there was very low overlap with where the fisheries were operating. So only 25% of all the seal locations were within two hours and eight kilometers of an active fishing vessel. So showing that they're kind of largely avoiding those larger vessels. Now it does have to be pointed out that we've only got fishing vessel data from larger vessels over 10 or 12 meters and therefore we're missing a lot of those inshore fisheries, the tangle nets, the gill nets, and then the potting fisheries that tend to be smaller vessels and we just don't have any tracking data for. So that's something we need to explore with those fishes um, in particular to sort of see what interactions we might have with those. And then we were starting to look at overlap with things like marine renewables. There's such a large push for renewed um, or for expanded marine um, resources, um, wind energy in particular. So in yellow here on the, the left-hand plot, you've got known um, operational wind farm areas, 
and here we've got a track of two of the individuals that sort of interacted with those wind farm areas. So in the middle here we've got Ariel, who sort of went up to Scotland, down around North, you know, North Wales, ending up there, and then started to do his residency period. I think I've got a over pointer here. Nope. Um, just down here in North Wales, where he spent quite a lot of time um, resident there. And that's right in the site of another wind farm area. And we've also got Merida, who have passed a number of passed and through a number of wind farm developments, but never stayed in any of those as well. So we can see this on the little animation here. This is Ariel after she sort of adopted a new home within a, a wind, wind farm site. And you can see her literally going around and foraging around individual turbines within that wind farm area, and then returning to haul out sites on the beach um, in North Wales to rest. So we know that this behavior has been documented in adult um, gray seals and harbor seals. It hasn't been shown in pups as yet. So this is the first example we've got of pups learning to, to forage around wind farm developments. And the thought is that the structures of the wind turbines in the water are providing an artificial reef effect, either through a fish aggregating device, something for fish to go around, or increased biodiversity because of these artificial reef effects. So the theory is that there is increased prey availability around those turbines because of the hard structures in an otherwise sort of soft sediment um, environment that might provide more biomass of fish. So they've learned to feed in those areas. So it's quite an interesting result here showing very, very detailed feeding records of this animal around that wind farm site. Unfortunately, this is one of the seals that was later found in very poor condition with a massive lungworm infection and had to be euthanized. But prior to that, um, lungworm infection and the parasites in there was doing quite well and repeatedly visiting that wind farm site. So in summary, and just about on time, um, we know that most of our common seals enter rehabilitation due to um, abandonment, um, disturbance of sites, and dog attacks. So both of these are linked to human disturbance. So being able to change human behavior in relation to how we might interact with seals may actually alleviate some of that problem as a conservation objective. Following release, they ad adapted quickly to life in the wild. Their survival rates were somewhat similar to what we would expect for wild animals. So the rehabilitation programs are actually working. And in addition to having animals that are released back into the wild and contributing to the population, the, the seal sanctuary itself performs a very good public um, outreach and, um, and knowledge transfer to members of the public to tell them what to do when they come across a seal that might be sitting um, abandoned on a beach, to know the signs to look for to sort of change behavior in relation to dog walking on a beach and having a dog on the lead, that sort of thing, to prevent dog attacks. So together, these results support the efforts of the rehabilitation team, um, not only at the Explorer Seal Sanctuary, but other seal rehabilitation centers worldwide. And the extensive exploratory behaviors that we saw, um, you know, some seal traveling more than 300 kilometers from their release site is quite new and novel. Um, and we know that five seals have stayed very, very, very close to their release sites within 100 kilometers of that. We know that their space use was concentrated in waters around Strangford Lock, Dundrum Bay, Carlingford Lock, Dundalk, the Skerries, and Land Bay Island, and these are areas where existing populations of harbor seals are resident. And these locations might be good candidates for protection sites because we know that this is where the population is, is recruiting to. We know that overlap with a certain sector of the commercial fishery um, enterprise was was minimal, but we still don't know about the smaller scale um, tangle net and gill net fisheries that operate in more coastal environments that are more likely to interact with these coastal species. And we know that one seal spent more than 10 weeks repeatedly visiting an established wind farm site. So these might be areas of increased biodiversity and prey abundance that might help support populations. And that's it. I would just like to thank the, the people who did all this work, Explorus Aquarium. They were very, very helpful at giving us last minute phone calls to say we're ready to go get in a car and drive up. Um, and obviously the funding um, that came with the sea, sea Monitor project. And I'll take any questions now or during the panel discussion. At the panel discussion, so I get off now. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, yeah, that was fascinating stuff. Has that whetted people's appetites for more? Yeah? A lot of data there, more data to come. Um, I was always sort of fascinated by the naming of the seals too, um, the different characters and stuff, and I think it's a good PR exercise, but as Mark explains, I don't know if, well, the, the story of the Little Mermaid usually doesn't end with longworm infection on a beach in Wales, but um, 
they learn that as they get older, don't they? The reality of, of things. Um, I neglected to say at the start um, about the sort of format and what we're doing with questions and stuff. So rather than having questions and answers at the end of every presentation, we're sort of gonna herd it all together at the end in a panel discussion. So the format for today and, and tomorrow is gonna run presentations and then we'll have before lunch a panel discussion with Mark and the other scientists up on stage and some special guests and experts. Um, we're gonna use Slido for that. So I'm told we can test that now. If you look at the QR codes on your tables and scan them with your phone, that should take you to a Slido page that looks, well, it's exactly like this. And we can all probably test it. I think they have a question geared up for people, a polling question, once people start to get on. So as we go through the presentations, if you have questions, you can log them on Slido real time or save them for the presentations and they'll be filtered and queued and we can, um, we can get them put to the experts for the panel discussions. So those are some questions that we have preloaded um, for the first panel discussion before lunch. Do we have a poll for what people's favorite marine animal is? I think that's the one we're gonna try. through the kinks here and get on. Is everybody logging in okay? Nods of yes, okay. Thank you. Do we have a polled question loaded up or we'll just move on? We'll just move on, good stuff. Well, we are running to time, which is good. We're actually a little bit early. Um, so. The next uh, presenter I'm going to introduce is um, Morgan Pommier, a PhD candidate uh, working with um, Atlantic Technological University. And we're switching gears in terms of the technology and the species a bit. So we've looked at seals and GPS technology, and now we're going to cetaceans and the use of passive acoustics. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to invite Morgan up. Thanks, Morgan. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. So I'm a student in the Atlantic Technological University. I work with Dr. John O'Brien, she's here today as well. And we were responsible for the cetacean side of things in, in C Monitor. So for a little bit of context, the area, what we know about cetaceans around Ireland uh, is very much limited to the west, south and east coast. Uh, we've got a lot of sightings here. There are even some MPAs that have been designated if you look at Scotland, we also know a lot about what's around the Everdees on the coast, on the east coast as well. But in between, we don't really know. So how come? Is there nothing here? Like, I think the answer is a bit more complicated than this. It's not that there is nothing. Actually, it might be the same animal moving from Ireland to Scotland for some species. It's just that we haven't really looked. And the reason for this is because there is a border in between. And when you design, like let's say you're going to go surveying for cetaceans, you're putting a sur survey together, it's easier if you stay within your national waters, like paperwork wise, <laughs> for example. And so when you design these surveys, the way they're designed to have equal coverage uh, over your survey area, you tend to have lower coverage near the borders or an area. So that's hap what's happening here. Uh, so it's it's really a challenge when it comes to monitoring spe uh, species that moves a lot if you forget part of the range when you're monitoring. So what you need to address questions in, in these areas is like really sharing data and using some survey methods that are, um, how do you say, standardized between uh, people looking for cetaceans. And this is what like the three Interact projects really set out to do, so see monitor but also MARPAM and COMPASS, our colleagues were doing the same kind of monitoring that we were, which was very useful then to be able to combine the data. So our main objective in C-Monitor was to deliver spatial models for the occurrence of cetaceans in that particular area of the Malin Shelf. So we need data to build models, so how do you look for them? When it comes to cetaceans, there are two main ways. 
you can either look for them visually. This is very useful, gives you a lot of very detailed information. You can identify the species, you can count them. When you encounter a group, you can see who's there. Is it males, females, juveniles? You can count them and look at the behavior. The drawbacks of this approach is that First, it's restricted to the time where animals are at the surface, and for some cetacean species, it's really little. Then you need good visibility condition. Uh, I guess a lot of you have been at sea in Ireland or Scotland. It's not every day that you have flat seas, certainly not in winter. And it's only during the day that you can collect data. It requires to have trained staff. You can do it from the coast and use citizen science data, but then you're gonna be limited to coastal species. If you go on a boat, it's very time consuming. And because it's time at sea with trained staff, it also comes with a cost, it's quite expensive. So the other main way to look for cetaceans is actually not looking for them, but listening for them. They are very vocal species. They, the sound is their main sense they use to like send their environment by echolocation, foraging this way as well, communicating. So basically the way you would do it, like you put a, micro, a hydrophone in the water and you just wait and see if you hear anything. There are two big ways of doing this. So uh, yeah, before I talk about this, the main advantages of it is that you're not relying on good visibility condition. So you have information at night or when the weather is bad. Uh, and you're not relying on the animals being at the surface, which is a much bigger proportion of their actual lives. So you can do this using mobile approach. Um, so you would tow a hydrophone behind a vessel, typically. It's great because it gives you a very large spatial coverage. Uh, but then you never really know if the vessel noise is not interfering with what you're detecting or influencing the animal's behavior. And it also tends to be more expensive to spend the time at sea. The other way is static approaches, and we use this a lot in Team Monitor. Uh, we use a little bit of mobile as well. I will touch to that at the end of the presentation. But the biggest part of it was really static uh, acoustic monitoring. It's very cost efficient. You deploy something, you leave it there for months, so you get very long time series of cetacean occurrence at the sites. You really have minimal disturbance because your mooring is here, but it's not making noise, it's not moving too much. The drawback of it is that like, it's spatially more limited, but if you deploy them in arrays, you can still compare across sites and get some spatial information. Then the way we treat acoustic data, because it's not like visual, you can identify the species. You would look at the call, uh, and some species have very stereotyped call, so if you look at the time frequency patterns, you could like differentiate between species. Um, in the sea monitor area, we probably have the little porpoises, so very high frequency clicks, very easy to discriminate from any other. Dolphins is harder to tell the species, but you still get, uh, with the frequency range, you would know it's a dolphin. Uh, same with the whales. Uh, and so you need to process this data using special software, but then they will tell you this species was present, this species was absent, and this is what then you use for the models. This takes a lot of time though, and we're very happy we have very powerful computers. Um, to give you an idea, for a C monitor, the total amount of data we got back was 34 terabytes of acoustic data. So, if I jump a bit more at what we want to do with it. Uh, the f I'm gonna present three models today. The first one, is a multi-scale model of the porpoise occurrence across the North Channel. And this is gonna give me the opportunity to explain to you a bit what we did in terms of field work and data collection. So, we have an array of like five listening stations deployed in the North Channel. This is part of the main sea monitor array, the salmon tracking array. Uh, I labeled the station one to five here, but maybe during the talk I might refer to them with other numbers because I'm used to their place in the sea monitor array. We use two types of uh, static acoustic devices. We have sound traps. They will record a very wide frequency range. They will enable you to detect low frequency noise, low frequency baleen whales up to very high frequency harbor porpoises. So with this, you actually get an audio file out of it. The other type of equipment we use are CPOTs. These ones are automated click loggers. So there's already some kind of processing algorithm. You don't get the raw data out of it but the, the device is actively listening for clicks and, and recording clicks. So on this, you wouldn't get whales, but you would get porpoises and dolphins. They were on different duty cycle. Uh, the CPOD is able to record continuously. The sound traps, to make the most of the battery and the memory storage, we had them on 20 minutes an hour. So 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off. And the way they were deployed, 
was we attached them onto the stations that are used for the salmon tracking. So we put our seapod or sand traps or both. We have one station with both. I'm going to come back to this. It's a very important station uh, on the on the main like line of the salmon receiver uh, mooring, and then we just deploy, come back after a few months to to pick them up. I say we just come back, but it was not as easy. And for this, I have to say big thank you to Diego because he never came. I uh, never gave up on getting our equipment out of the water, and deployment after deployment really managed to see which was the best way to get them out. And it all worked out very well. We were able to get almost two years of constant monitoring at every station. So these are the five stations, orange sun trap, uh, blue sea pods. We see there are little gaps. There are some glitches here and there. Sometimes the sea pod, the memory will fill up, or sometimes the batteries dies earlier than expected. So we have gaps, but overall, very good coverage. Um, at the end, it's not that we don't have information, it's just that I got the receivers back only last month, so the computer is still going through it. But we got almost everything back. Just lost one on the last deployment. We're still hoping it's going to turn out in Scotland somewhere. So now how do you get from this to a model? So you process the data in the acoustic software I was telling you about. And then to give you an example, I don't have the f mo like final models because they're still running. But I can give you an example of one station, and I picked station 76. I know in science we're not supposed to pick favorites, but that's my favorite station. So. <laughs> it's the one that has both the seapod and a sand trap, so I think it's, that's why it's also more interesting, because it allows us to do more things. So this is two years of data in this station. The y-axis, there are two, actually. It depends, because this station with two receivers. We have in orange the sand traps, in blue the seapods. This would be a number of corpus positive hour per day. So basically for every hour, did I have a detection or not? So it goes from zero to 24, and that's two years of data. For the CPOD, on average, we had 7.7 .7 hours per day where we had at least one corpus detection. So that's quite a lot. Uh, for the sun traps, it was three corpus positive hours per day, but we have to remember that the sun traps are only on 20 minutes an hour. So that's also why it gives lower detections. The first thing we see, I think we pro you probably noticed straight away, there's a clear seasonal patterns in detections. Like in winter, it starts in autumn, and in winter we have a lot of porpoises. Sometimes I'm two, I think, 23 hours a day almost sometimes. So this is the kind of things we'll try we want to model, the temporal occurrence at different sites. So here straight away we see there is a seasonal pattern, but we also want to see if there is something else. So when you look at temporal occurrence of animals, you can look over a scale of month. So that's, for example, the time of the year that will give you the seasonal pattern. You can also look a bit finer scale and see if there is anything related to spring or nip tide. Then you can also go finer scale, look at the day, and see is there a pattern between night and day? Or is there if it's high tide, low tide? So the idea is to put all of this together in a model and see how they interact to to see can we predict when animals will use this site or this site. We put all of this in a model, corrected by effort, and comparing between sites. Um, so I don't have the results yet, but I'm hoping <laughs> they will have to come in the next month anyway. Uh, one more thing, if you remember, when I was telling you, we have different type of equipment. So this is also why this station is so important, because before I can decide to put all the data together in the same model, I need to see if I can actually compare these data, are they comparable? So we see straight away that there is less detection on the sun traps. That's because of the duty cycle. It can be corrected straight away in the model. But then, if they were on all the time together, would they still give me the same thing? So that's also part of what we did. We compared how they performed on the same location. So that's station 76. If one was telling me present, was the other one also telling me present? Same for absences, or were they sometimes disagreeing? So I tested that on the presence, absence, like on the binary metrics, but then also on the continuous, like uh, count data. So for example, a number of minutes per hour or a number of hours per day, will they give me similar results. And the idea behind this is that then I select the best algorithm to extract the sound trap data so that they would compare best with CPOTS. It's not necessarily the most efficient algorithm, but at least the one that yields the better agreement between methods. So that's in the process. Another model I'm going to talk about now, because once we will have described these seasonal patterns, these tidal patterns and everything, 
we kind of want to understand what are the drivers of this, because I very much doubt that the purpose is goes around with a little calendar, being like, it's 15th of February, I need to be at site 76. So there has to be something. With predators, most often it's related to prey movement. It's very hard to get data on prey, so we usually try to see if we can find proxies in the oceanography data that could start to help us explain these kind of patterns. So close to the sea monitor area, there's a very interesting zone that is the Isle of France. Uh, France, usually they attract predators, prey. It's like they are very productive areas in the ocean, and we wanted to see if the if the seasonal development of that front had an impact on the detection we got. Um, to do this, we collaborated with Compass. So our sister project, uh, from the very beginning of the project, we had really good like working collaboration with their team, and they gave us data from four of their sites that are not too far from our array, but fall also on the other side of the island front so that we could compare. There is actually one year, one full year of data where both projects were overlapping, so all the equipment was in the water at the same time, and it was CPOT data, so only porpoises and, and dolphins continuous. And the thing we're, so this is the data. Uh, again, the colors are showing the number of porpoise positive hours per day, so from zero to 24. We see that winter peak again, station 55, 76, in scaries as well. Some stations look way more blue. It's not that there are no porpoises, just the magnitude of their occurrence is lower than that others. But usually, like, sea monitor, we have quite a lot. And this, the same way than it was for the other, uh, other model, is going to go together with some environmental variables. But this time we're looking at potential driver effects. So I think I'm gonna try, we're going to try temperature, salinity, a lot of variables related to the frontal uh, activity, the mixing of a water column, and we hope to see if there is anything here that correlates and that could explain. And this could also be very well different from one site to another. A driver at one site might not be the most important at another or something like this. I expect temperature to jump out in the model just because of the clear seasonal pattern. That doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a driver, but I think it's gonna be correlated anyway. So yeah, same type of model. And then before I move on to something else, one last model. Uh, <laughs> there were a lot of models in that, pro in that PhD, but uh, that's great. Uh, the thing, so we got a very large thermal coverage with our static array. We wanted to complement that with visual data that would give us a much larger spatial coverage. I told you at the beginning of the presentation that there were not many surveys going in the area. It's not entirely true, there is one. <laughs> Took me a little time to find out, but it's a fishery survey by the Marine Institute, it's called the West Pass, so they're looking for fish. Uh, but it's multidisciplinary. They go over the entire marine shelf every summer. There is always an MMO on board, Marine Mammal Observer. So, so far they surveyed more than 7,000 kilometers. That's very good effort. So they got, we got the data from them and we built, that allowed us to build two more models for two more species. So not porpoises anymore, but two other species. I will pass over the methods, because it's a bit complicated, and I will jump straight away to the results, because this one I have them. So the first species for which we did was the minke whale. The variables that were the most important in explaining minke whale's distribution was oceanography, really. And that frontal indices, like, were really important, and we had the biggest hotspots around the island front uh, and its northern expansion. Second species was common dolphins. Uh, again, quite shelf-dominated uh, uh, shelf distribution. Apparently the substrate was quite important. Um, I wasn't really expecting this, but they like muddy sands, apparently. Probably something to eat there. So if we come back to our question, which was, is there any important habitat on the Malin shelf that we would have overlooked so far because we're not looking? Well, it seemed that the elephant could be important for some species, and also like the, the the sand banks at the bottom, that's Stanton Banks, it's actually quite an important fishing ground for dinosaur species, and it seems like it's also important for dolphins. So that's it for models, really. Now I'm gonna jump to something else. Uh, yeah, we, this one actually got submitted, so we hope you're gonna be able to hear more about the results soon. The other aspect of Sea Monitor uh, was to try to see if we could conduct passive acoustic monitoring from a glider. So why would we do this? If you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I gave you examples of what was good with both approaches and what were the, the problems. So 
a glider would give you a larger spatial coverage than what you can use with static acoustic, a bit like what a uh, vessel bass would do, but with much less noise, They're almost as silent as a static. It's autonomous, remotely operated in staff, uh, so it makes it more cost efficient. Has no fuel in the glider, so I hope it's making it more, more sustainable, I think, than always going at sea. I might have less uh, intrusion or impact on the animals. I'm putting a question mark here. I'm going to come back to it later. Uh, and what is very, like, would be amazing for us when we're doing habitat models is that instead of relying on modeling data for oceanography, you actually have the actual measurements from the glider exactly at the same time as you would have it for your animals' detections. Now, the few challenges so far, because it's not new, it's been done before using gliders for PAM. It, it works well. It's just sometimes you have to have access to gliders that are already equipped with a hydrophone, which is not all of them, or you need to buy something else. Then, if they are equipped with something, in the glider there is a limited space for sensors, so you would need to make trade-offs in terms of power supply uh, and data storage, because you have to basically compromise with the other sensor of the glider. So our idea for a monitor was to try to put a sand trap, which is a completely autonomous receiver. It's this one, actually, the exact one that went out, uh, to see if we could put it outside of the glider. And like this, it would just sit there recording without using the power of the glider, without using any like uh, data storage capacity. So we wanted to send it. So we use a sand trap again. It's a smaller version of the one we use uh, for the static acoustics, so much lighter, but it does the same thing. Very wide frequency range. You would get any species on it. Uh, there was also a VMT in it, but I'm sure someone will talk about that more this afternoon. Uh, we wanted to send it around the Isle of France because this is an area we had delighted as potentially important. It kind of went there. It didn't move exactly the same way, but it was, it was still good, and it worked very well. So we were able to detect exactly the species we were looking for. For example, this is a harbor porpoise, very narrow band, little clicks. Um, and we had 57 encounters of harbor porpoise over a nine week mission. Then dolphins. I put a common dolphin here, but it's acoustic, so I'm not entirely sure it was that species. It's the species I saw, the only species I saw when I was at sea at the same time, but it could as well have been bottlenose. We had 116 encounters with dolphins. Uh, the way I define encounters for this was that if there was more than 10 minutes without the dolphin sound, I would split them. Uh, so that's a lot of dolphin encounters, and one of them was 16 hour long. So it means that for 16 hour, there was no more than 10 minutes without the dolphin sound. And this is where I'm a bit curious about to see when I said there is no impact of the glider. I'm actually wondering if some dolphins wouldn't be a little bit curious about it, because I don't think I've ever seen so many dolphins detection on my static recorders as on the glider, but it, it did work very well. Then there are also other type of noise we were looking for. I didn't mention it a lot, but in our acoustic recording in C monitor, we are also looking for potential, potential threat. So we are monitoring noise and looking at human impact. So there was this very, very loud, uh, high frequency pulses in the glider recordings a lot. I'm not sure what they are. I think some kind of sonar or echo sounder. Then there was some vessel noise. Uh, given the timestamp of this one, I think it's actually the Voyager on the day we came back to get the glider. But this is typically what a vessel propeller noise would look like in the environment. It's quite loud. It would easily mask a whistle, so that's why sometimes if it's too noisy, they cannot communicate anymore. Then there are some noises that are part of the glider mission. We cannot avoid them, but they are very easy to recognize, so we could filter them out. This low frequency noise here is the surface water. It's just the waves clapping on the glider. It really sounds like um, And then this one at the bottom, uh, I think it's when the engines from the glider or the, the pumps goes on. Uh, this is very, very signature. It's always the same frequency, so you could train an algorithm to recognize this and just ignore these portions of the data. So that will be easy enough. And the last thing, uh, we didn't detect fish on that particular mission, but we also pick up the, the sound from the VMT on the sound trap. So you could also, also potentially detect tags using passive acoustics. Decoding them is another story, but 
you, <laughs> you would hear them, I think. So to sum up on the glider, I think even though the missions were imperfect, it really showed that it's possible to use equipment that you already own, put it on the glider, and collect a lot of data. Sound traps, they are very reliable units. They have been calibrated, so when you do noise measurements from a sound trap, you can correct for the sensitivity of the hydrophone, and you would get calibrated measurements, which is very important when you're reporting on noise levels in the environment. Uh, I think it's a good step towards integrated like ecosystem monitoring because gliders often go out to monitor oceanography, but if you put PAM systematically on it, you can also get information on predators. If you put the VMT unit, you get also <coughs> potential information about the fish. And so for us, it's a huge, like there's huge potential because we could get opportunistic PAM data virtually every time a glider is going out uh, and it, if it wouldn't be impacting the glider mission, we could always put the sun trap on it and get data for free, which is very hard to get in cetacean <laughs> acoustics. The only, only limit for this, I have to say, is that the sun trap cannot go below 500 meters. So if the glider is gonna go deeper, we'll have to use another type of hydrophone. Before I wrap up, there is just one more thing, one more survey I want to talk about. Uh, it's also an output of C monitor. It's something we did a bit on the side, but I think it's a good example of what these projects will bring as well in the future. Uh, we, in our collaboration with our colleagues from AFB and SAMS in Scotland, we, des we designed two cetacean surveys that would be specifically looking at these areas. So there have been one already in 2021. Uh, we were like smaller crew and everything because of COVID, but we were still able to survey uh, Malin Shelf and get some information uh, on cetaceans occurrence. There is another one coming up this summer. Uh, we're trying to make it even more multidisciplinary, so there will also be like eDNA sampling, plankton, uh, seabirds. So really trying to f keep going with addressing the knowledge gaps in this area. So in the end, the sea monitor outputs really Tell, told us more about what was happening on the Malian shelf. We were missing data here. We're still missing data, but a bit less. Uh, we have a lot more understanding of what's happening there than what we had before. So I think it's just opening up to like continue monitoring, get longer term data set, look at the threats. Now we know what's here, what's gonna be here in the future is gonna be important to look at as well. The model outputs, they can be used now for co in conservation or to inform like future marine spatial planning. I hope that the, the little case studies that we did on the glider will ensure like we op optimize data collection in the future. Like if we can really try to collect PAM every time it's possible, uh, that would be like huge, huge data set. Uh, and it really worked well with the collaborations with other institutes. So I think it's gonna keep going as well in this direction. So for cross-border area, I think it's always important to keep working well with the colleagues from other countries. Uh, in terms of outreach, we went to a few conferences. There was the ICES conference, International Statistic Ecology Conference, and the European and World Marine Mammal Conference. We have a few papers that are in preparation, and we plan to do one as well with the COMPASS and MARPAM teams. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank everyone, the supervisors, the staff and colleagues in ATU, all the team from C-Monitor, really a huge help. Also, Suzanne, Denise, and Ewan, the, the marine mammal people from Compass and Marfam, they helped us a lot from the, from the beginning on. Uh, the crews from the, the vessel that kept looking for equipment, even if it seemed like a lost cause. The, the glider team that helped me set up everything. Baptiste, um, Baptiste was an intern with us in ATU, and he manually validated the whistles from the glider deployment. That took a while, but it was worth it. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the WESPES team and the people from the oceanography team that helped me understanding the oceanography models. Thank you. Well done, Morgan. Thank you very much. Again, fascinating stuff. Um, I'm sure people have lots of questions, and we're throwing a lot of information at you, and we're aware of that. Um, some of it might be quite heavy for people, some of it maybe not heavy enough, I don't know, but 
We would like you to um, make use of Slido and log questions to get the panel discussion going. What we'd like to do now is take a quick break, just a comfort break to stretch uh, before we go into the last of the sort of formal presentations with Queen's University on the Lazenbrinks. Um, I'm going to hold you to five minutes as best we can, so if this isn't a go and leave the building type of thing. I would encourage you to maybe introduce yourself if you haven't to the people at your table, maybe get a conversation going with your new friends. Um, we're using Slido well, that's good. Salmon, not a surprise being the favorite so far. We'll see how that changes maybe through the course of the morning or the day. This could get ugly. Um, so we'll take a short break and then we'll, we'll jump back into the science. So thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, if I can get people to come back to their seats. I did say it was a short comfort break. All good in the hood? Basking sharks. Doctor, I'll stop a laser. That's, it's not right not for here against the I don't think they actually need it. Yeah, it. just it, it, let them do it by manual. Yeah, uh, good stuff. We will get you tea and coffee at the next break. Don't worry. All good, Derma? Yeah, two minutes. Oh, we might have to corral them in with a like, cheap. It's a eBay good shepherd, We'll, Russ, we'll eh? just go to the end of the hall and just walk like this. <laughs> we will do all because we're trying to keep it as tight as we can. I know so. we're out, we are on time, so it's I, good. I were 32. I think one of those presentations was slightly shorter than we expected. Yeah, it was good. No, that's yeah. fine. We'll it's take almost, it. It's almost, is this all your robber here? No. I don't know who's that. Is. Maybe move them. Yeah. Give water to it. I don't think it was okay. Okay, if I can call everyone back to their seats, please. Everyone come back to their seats, please. That's, that means you in the hall down there. Right, Patrick, go get him. <laughs> also, uh, I've been told by one of the staff here that if anybody's parked outside, the warden is giving parking tickets. So, you might want to tend to that. It's enough from you in the back, Rolly. <laughs> Okay, welcome back everybody.
Okay, we're going to kick off um, the last uh, couple sessions before, last presentations before the uh, discussion panel. I did say to collaborate, didn't I? So I only have myself to blame. Okay, we've heard about seals and cetaceans. Not to diminish the work of those scientists, but they were relatively easy to sort of capture compared to the, some of the species that we're <laughs> talking about. Uh, next, a um, bit challenging, I would say. So Queen's University, Belfast, were great partners to have on board, and they brought in uh, a realm of expertise and experience uh, with our next uh, two species. I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Jonathan Houghton to talk about um, a charismatic megafauna, as I've been told they are, basking sharks. So John, without further ado. Thank you very much. Well, great venue. Um, I think the best thing about projects like this is the scale and the ambition, and the difficult thing about projects like this is the scale and the ambition. So when I was sitting there the last week, it was a really nice exercise to just sit down and take stock of what we've actually done over the last three or four years, because you're always trying to just solve the problem that's immediately in front of you. And I think, for want of a strange metaphor, I found myself a bit Bilbo Baggins-esque, sitting there writing up the journals, thinking of how this great, as caught in an adventure, actually came together. And like Bilbo, looking back on myself, I think I'm shocked at my naivety of the adventure with the number of, I don't know, medical, logistical, political, scientific trolls and dragons that were waiting for us. But like any great adventure, I didn't do it on my own. A lot of the gang from Queens are going to be speaking next, talking through the skate. So I've got a lot of thanks there. But he's going to love this, he's going to kill me. But I'm going to set up my friend and my colleague, Emmett Johnson, as um, Gandalf in this story because if you take it back years ago, we've known about Baskin Sharks for a long time, but we weren't really doing an awful lot of work on them. And I'm gonna give him credit for this because it started back in 2009. Emmett pulled together the weird and the wonderful from across the island of Ireland to actually have the kind of first real Baskin Shark meeting to sit down and think about what we knew, where we wanted to go, what was gonna happen. And it was really from that point that started Emmett on the side from his day job, came to Queen's, did a PhD, and a lot of what we did, I'm gonna give him credit for that, comes from that single effort of chiseling that out from the cliff face from where we really had nothing to start with. And we came along 10 years later, the funding, the opportunity, the expertise, the collaboration, the, everything we've got in Sea Monitor was, was, was wonderful, and I viewed it as a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, we came up with a range of deliverables, and I'm not going to just dryly go through these explaining what we did here, but you can kind of summarize what we were trying to do about bashing shots was to get an idea of where they go, what they do, are there certain areas that are more important than other areas, and how do they interact with humans? And as you know, it's been, I saw in the Slido, the designated status of bashing shots across the board, and now it's been there for a while in the north. How do you manage a species that moves so widely? So, like I say, we, we didn't start from zero. We've got a long connection with Baskin Sharks, and we've known about what we would term these hotspots, sort of summer locations where animals appear in significant numbers, and we've got a long-standing relationship with them. What I hate is when people show slides like this, of like, and back in the day we used to hunt them, and wasn't that dark. It's not that. This is fishermen catching fish through centuries in very remote parts of the country, and I have no problem with that. I'm glad we're not doing it now. But from that, we, did, we didn't have a blank canvas. We knew about these very important sites, and we knew this was a species which hadn't just turned up in our waters. And the kind of, I think when we started, there was, there's always this perception of like, we, there's always bias in science. You view a species almost from your own perspective, of course you do. And so we knew about these big hotspots around Malinhead, around Ackle, around Loophead down south, up in Scotland. And, and, and we, we knew the hotspots were important, but the kind of rationale was Bastion Sharks come into these incredibly important hotspots, which are the most important place for them, 
and they do really important things in these places near my house and then they disappear and they overwinter for a while and get by until they can come back to my house which is the really important bit. It's not really quite as simple as that. Bashing sharks are in these hot spots but for a few months and that overwintering period could be nine or ten months of the year. So it's a much, if you would ask me how I think about them, I think of basking sharks as a pelagic, as an oceanic shark species that comes inshore routinely at certain times of the year to breed, and that would make sense like that. And one of the things in there as well was the idea that basking sharks followed this classic migratory paradigm, the idea that they're up here when it's warm and it's lovely, and then when it gets a bit nippy in the air and it's a bit rubbish, they disappear down south. And that's what everyone had done for a long time, looked at them moving south. One of the questions we wanted to know was, is that actually what's going on? And we were lucky when we tracked a few of these animals using satellite tags that some remained in sort of Irish Scottish waters over the winter, others disappeared off the warmer climes as far away as Africa. And when you look at it, it's, it's very surprising that the sharks that went to Africa, for example, during the winter experienced far colder temperatures than sharks that overwinter in Scotland, which is quite an unusual kind of finding. So we're going, okay, so it's not all about the hotspots. They move quite broadly, and it's not driven by seasonality. If you ask me where I want to go next in my dream, what would your next project be, is to look at what we call this mesopelagic. So that's sort of between four and 800 meters out off the coast of Scotland, the north, and across the border. And what we found is that when basking sharks leave these hotspots, they're not just going, grand, we're done, we're just going to swim away to somewhere. They don't. They feed or forage constantly. So those tracks there, this doesn't point very well, the laser pointer, but if you see the green line at the top there, they're daily depth profiles for Bastion shots. So they're routinely, continually going down to 500 metres, 600 metres, around the clock in these areas. So it's not really just all about the coastal seas. We've got to, when we think of basking sharks in the Scottish Shore, that's some showing the Irish coast all the way down to Perth. You've got a really important area off the west coast that is critical habitat for them. But the story I don't necessarily want to tell is that it's just poo-poo to hotspots. It's not all about that. They're obviously very important. And in areas where humans are going to come into contact with them, they are the sort of the main ground zero in that context. So what this slide shows is how we did some work using data loggers to actually record their behavior. The way that works is you can bring a boat alongside. We use clamps, which just clamp onto the fin clip like this. That you weld into it a little tiny bit of magnesium that dissolves. So after a day, a week, whatever you want, the device pops up, comes up to the surface, we can record the device and take all the data off it. So one of the things, that our original goals in Monitor was to do this thing called a predictive surface model. Could we figure out when basking sharks were at the surface, where they might come into contact with boat users? Could we work out when they were deeper? There's a drop behind me as well, deeper in the water column, um, when they might come into contact with fisheries activities, where they might interact with subsurface marine renewables. And what we could do, was take those dive data from the basking sharks and we could start to look at them in terms of like daily cycles. So that graph here, I'm very wary now, standing back, we've got sort of daytime in the light blue, the dark blue would be shown nighttime. So there's a general simplistic kind of idea of they go deeper at night, grand. But what we were able to do using data from Met Aaron, from the Met Office in the UK, is to kind of look at that behaviour and say, how does it, is it affected by wind speed, by sea state, by sunlight, by day, by cloud cover? All of these things. And with great certainty, we are now able to actually predict when basking sharks in our coastal seas will be up at the top, down at the bottom, which gives us some potential for management down the line. This slide here, what I'll show, I'll give credit to another person, Paul Mensink, who was part of the Queen's team at the beginning of Sea Monitor, subsequently gone back home to Canada. And we're talking about how we can use this as a predictive tool. And one of the discussions I'd like to have with people over cups of tea here is how we can, how, what does basking shark conservation management, what does it actually look like? 
what we can provide, and our goal from C Monitor was to provide a tool, something to give us information power. So what we can do here, and I'll let Paul explain it, is predict where Baskin Sharp encounters are very likely. So hopefully this runs. Hi, everyone. Now that John has explained to you how that two-state model works, identifying when sharks are at the surface and when they are in a less vulnerable state below the surface, and how we determine the probability that of the sharks being on the surface, I'm going to talk to you about how we can use that information to provide an advisory tool for boat users to try and avoid ship strike. So that two-state model includes environmental variables, including the amount of cloud and sunlight, in combination with location data of basking sharks. We can combine those things in real time, so we can actually pull down weather information from met.ie for stations around the coast. We combine that with location data, and we get a threshold probability of how much time sharks are going to be spending on the surface under those specific conditions. We can then forecast what the environmental conditions are going to be going forward and provide that to boat users as part of an advisory and collision avoidance tool system. Here I've got a prototype of what a web portal version of that system might look like. It's got a bit of a description of what the tool is. It's got links to some of the funders, and then it has a code of conduct linked as well. So this can not only be a space for people to look for advisories, but actually also learn more about safe conduct around basking sharks. So boat users can then choose their date of travel, and the web portal will update with advisories that coincide with the marine warning zones around Ireland and will actually allow us to inform boat users that there is potentially high risk for boat strike in these areas. Please be on the lookout for basking sharks in your area. Now, this proposal is just one way that we can send information to boat users, but there's lots of different ways that we can do this, and John's going to be talking about that next. Great. So, what I don't, it's often when I kind of explain this to people, they're going, well, you're going to do an app that's going to tell people where basket sharks are. It's not that at all. It's, it's to discuss with people with better suits than me, with more important jobs than me at a management government level, how we can use this information. But we will know where sharks are and we will know what they're doing. What we wanted to do was to do classic stakeholder engagement, but what I wanted to avoid was being like some kind of rubbish contestant on The Apprentice, where I've come up with an idea and I'll do a tour around the country going up to people going, I've got this amazing app, do you want to use it? And they'll be like, no. We, thanks to Paul Mayo at DARA, what we're doing is we're kind of rolling this idea exploring this idea is a better way to say it, in, in the north by, um, we've done a big stakeholder survey. So it's asking lots of things, where do you operate, where do you normally get your routine data from, do you see basking sharks, does this tool sound like a ridiculous idea, would you rather have it via the radio messages, etc. So at least we will know, we're not developing it any further until we know what water users in all their sort of wonderful variety want from this. And that's something that just don't worry about scanning it now. Tomorrow when we've got stands and things up, I've just put a QR code up and you can actually, that just links you straight through to the survey, which is about four minutes. So particularly from the North Coast, any just thoughts would be extremely valuable. Spinning that on a little bit, we also, there's a lot of talk these days very much about marine renewables and that's, that, that's a good thing. But we need to consider what, I'm not going to use the word impacts because that sounds negative. How do basking sharks overlap? What's the kind of interaction potentially with that? So we wanted to look a little bit at uh, energetics of basking sharks and how they feed in high energy environments. I don't need to go into like, all the, the technicals, but you'd be used to something like a Fitbit or something like that, which actually measures gravitational acceleration. So you can measure all the movements of a shark, up, down, left, right, whatever they want to do turn that into some kind of proxy of energy expenditure, but have ideas of tail beats and the rest of it. With loggers that we put on the animals as well, we could also see when they were feeding, when they weren't feeding, from just looking behind, when the gill slits are closed, they're just swimming, looking very much like very big white sharks. When they're feeding, 
you just get the gill slits opening and you can detect that. So the first thing we found out from that is that when there are these coastal hotspots, it's, it's unusual. Plankton are normally deeper in the daytime. Around the places, let's say Akel, around Malin, this day is specifically for Malin, the animals feed predominantly at the surface, which are the green bits. But what's interesting is they feed, and when they stop feeding, they don't just stay at the surface, which is rougher, it's harder work, you're getting buffeted around, that they'll dive in between this. And it's also very discreet foraging. They're far more whale-like than we thought. You know, when you think about bastion sharks, everyone just thinks they're doing the hoover thing constantly, just all the time swimming around. The average length of a bastion shark feeding event around Ireland is about 30 seconds. So they're selective in what they're doing. Where that knocks on, which is probably something which is quite interesting, so this is some drone footage from around Tory, And what it shows is actually the bastion sharks swimming quite hard. They're not going anywhere. So they use the environment to their advantage. What they'll do, if you've got a nice tidal race coming towards you, face into it, let the tide do the job for you. And when we looked at their diving behavior in terms of how hard they're working, swimming down, swimming up, their powering is hard down as they are back up again, which is unusual. And the only way that would really work is if they're actually swimming headlong in to actual currents. So certainly not flagging it up as a problem. Am I flagging it up as something we need to think about? Yeah, I would be doing that. Moving it back towards a sort of more classic kind of acoustic telemetry, again, a huge number of people to thank. OTN for receivers, UC Davis for the same, Emmett, Simon Barrow, Lois Well and Dolphin, but most importantly down the bottom there, the Marine Institute. None of the acoustic tagging of Baskin Sharks would have happened without them. So a pint is coming your way for that. So what we did was this, was we didn't know when we started out, people were like, you're going to acoustically tag basket shots. That's super daft. They go as far as Canada and down south and everything. We were going, no, we want to know in our coastal waters how well an acoustic array could use it. So it was an enormous pilot study to try and figure out what a future basket shark array could look like. And from the broad sea monitor array, which is marked in, sort of in green, through to a whole host of other receivers, mainly from things such as the Atlantic Salmon Trust, we managed to tag 31 Baskin shots, which is great. So that's the first time we've ever really been able to do that in this part of the world, of which 27 were redetected. And so far over two years, we've picked over 2,500 different detections, which is great. James from Queen's hit up these lovely little plots, which are based on the acoustic data, giving us some ideas of residency time of basking sharks in these kind of known coastal hotspots. So it isn't animals coming in and staying there for four months. They're coming in, staying for a few weeks, and moving. And we know that basking sharks can move between Cork and Donegal in about two days. Okay, so you're dealing with a very, very mobile target. We also managed to just, just a few little snapshots of things that we managed to find out. So the whole ethos of, of, of Sea Monitor is, is thinking of interconnectivity between regions. How do we manage things that move around, ignore borders, etc.? Baskin Shark's a classic example. Just one individual just shown here, very simplified form. Tagged in Akel on the 15th of May, 21. Picked up in the Hebrides a month later. Back down to Malin Head. The next year, almost to the same week, the animal rediscovered in Akil and again followed the same route up to the Hebrides. It's just snapshot. It's just coffee table biology at the minute before we really look into it. But there's a lot in that. So what does the future Bastion Shark Array look like? Should we ever go that way? Never is there any rationale really for putting a huge array out entirely just for basking shots. We go mad in a kind of Klondike, an array for every different species. But there's huge value we can add it from piggybacking other things, particularly salmon. There's huge salmon arrays everywhere. But what we have identified from sea monitors where you could supplement that, you could, from a monitoring perspective, Akil, Loophead, Cork, Isle of Man, there's a few curtain arrays in that. You could capture an awful lot of information in there. And why do we need to do that? Because these are a complex species. So this is kind of a meta-analysis that we're working on of all the satellite tracking data from the Scots, from the Isle of Man, from the Irish, from ourselves, from everybody, bringing it together. And that figure on the left kind of just shows the issues that you've got and what most people in the room know about trying to manage a species that moves so far like this. 
that you've got Republic of Ireland waters, you've got shared territorial waters, you're into the north, you're over into Scotland. And those tracks there, there's just a few illustrations there, whether they're tracked from the Isle of Man or Scotland, they can move through four different jurisdictions in a week. So we do need to really join our thinking up. How do we do that? I don't know. But I'm going to nick, probably, I hope it's not bad taste, a phrase that I've heard on the radio a lot, dynamic alignment. Um, what we're going to try and do, what I think could work, is if we all do the same thing, right? If we actually make sure we haven't got a hodgepodge of different management measures, but if we all do the same thing, you can have an emergent regional conservation strategy for this species. And this is my last slide. This is how I think that could all come together, and this is my kind of dream. Acoustic tagging basking sharks works. Um, in terms of long-term monitoring, if you've got 10-year tags on, it can move us towards not just recording movements of sharks, monitoring sharks, which is something we've never been able to do before. We got 30 on, and the Marine Institute are good, you know, so we were getting 10 on in a day. You can easily get some good sample sizes over the years with minimum effort. If we ever get towards a place that we've got acoustic arrays, and I know it's distantly in the pipeline, that can give us real-time data, you could bring a lot of this stuff together. So this is an idea that I've put forward just from the perspective of Northern Ireland. If you have an array that's running off, say, somewhere like Malin or the foil, you would know when a basking shark has crossed into that. Government then have an idea, animals are here, we can do X, Y, and Z. Do you enact notifications through that thing that we did? Do you alert people to the app, to, to the code of conduct? Those decisions aren't for me, but the tools to do that are now in place, which is great. And that's me. Thanks ever so much. Thank you, John. And Bang on time, too, for a charismatic megafauna as yourself. That is good. Um, right, we're moving steadily along, but before we go to the uh, next species, I need to just um, like to sort of take a moment to thank some people. Um, I'm calling people out, and they're going to be embarrassed, but I don't care because they're worth it, um, and they need to be recognized individually. Um, the finance part of this project has been uh, difficult, like all these sort of multi-jurisdictional, multi-partner projects. 4.7 million euro is not easy to manage. And so these people can stand up if they want, but I think they deserve a round of applause because they've kept the lights on, they've kept procurement going, they've kept us paid, which is quite important. Um, Anne McPherson, who was our head finance person, and Doreen Simpson, administrator from the LOX agency. Karen McLean from AFPI, Martha Bracken and Rory Cusack from MI, Angela Mulgannon from Atlantic Technical University, Annette Mathis from Cork, Katie Wright and Diana, Diana Mardare uh, from Glasgow, Tara Hughes-Fagan from Queens, and Eunice McLaughlin from SUPV, as well as our project officer, Andrew King. I'm not sure if he's here today as well, but um, I think they deserve a round of applause and a big thanks. And payday is tomorrow, right? That's, that's all sorted, Dan? Yeah? Okay. Good. So we'll move swiftly on then to um, the last of our species this morning, and then we're going to take another short, and I emphasize short, comfort break to get the stage set up for panel discussion. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to three deadly trio here coming up at you to talk about skate. So we've got Carolyn Bradley, Amy Garbutt, and James Thorburn. I think it's James first, am I right? There's James. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be here at the end of it all to talk about the work that's gone on over the last few years uh, on the skate. Um, as John mentioned uh, with the basking sharks and as Ross just alluded to, I'm here talking about a small part of the skate uh, as part of a wider team effort at Queen's and many other partners that have made this work possible today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the tracking element where we, we attach the tags to the animals and, and saw where they go, but the, the other presenters will talk about different elements. 
Um, but the, the star of the show is, is the skate. Um, we're talking about Europe's largest skate species. Two and a half meters long, over 100 kilos in weight. Um, and the reason that we're talking about it today is its history of depletion. It was the first marine fish to be declared locally extinct in areas of its former range, really driving forward a need for conservation action uh, moving on from about the middle of the 20th century. As I said, it's a triple, triple threat today, so I'm going to have 10 minutes talking about the tracking. Um, we're going to have a talk on the genetics from Caroline, and Amy's going to bring all that together and talk about all the other aspects we've done on various bits of skate conservation, management, and biology. If you're not familiar with acoustic telemetry, you certainly will be by the end of the next two days. Um, this technology is fantastic. It's a two-part system with a transmitter or a tag attached to an animal and a series of receivers in the water that communicate with the tags to detect presence. Um, as various members of, of the audience will be aware, this can be a very logistically challenging area with hundreds of receivers going in in the Sea Monitor project and a wide range of people to thank. The reason that we wanted to use this technology to investigate skate is we wanted to focus on two key areas in Ireland and Northern Ireland that I'll talk about in a little bit. The behavior that we were really interested in investigating is residential behavior, which is known in the species. A lot of that comes from one site, though, and we wanted to see if this residential behavior was, was a more common feature in skate throughout its distribution. Um, and most of that previous work has occurred from the Loch Suna to the Sound of Germany protected area, which again I'll talk about in more detail. But we wanted to provide a wider context to that, and the way of doing that is long-term tracking. So the acoustic tags we used actually have the ability to monitor movements over 10 years. Quick snapshot of the actual project itself. While the skate were tagged um, over the last four to five years, there was a huge array of receivers out from various projects over the west coast of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland. The skate specifically, we had 74 individuals tagged um, throughout the region. 73 of these were detected, which you know, was quite a promising return rate, really. And because of that residential behavior, we had over 450,000 detections over a four-year period. The data came from 83 different stations, and the max tag record we have so far is four years, but we hope this will grow as those fish continue to swim around with the 10-year tags. The specific sites that we were looking at, the, the one in Northern Ireland was the Maidens, the special area of conservation. Now, this isn't designated for the protection of skate. It's more to do the reef systems and the sandbanks in the area. But that complicated bathymetry in that area suggests it's highly uh, suitable for the flapper skate. And due to angling records, there was a suggestion that this area was indeed important for the skate. So we used acoustic telemetry to investigate that a little further. We deployed a specific array where the blue dots are um, in the site, focusing on the, the softer sand sediments, which skate are known to, to habituate. Um, it was a challenge, to say the least. The logistical challenges of Sea Monitor um, meant we got three skate tagged, but we actually had four detected there. Another skate from, a, from another area came into the, into the station. Overall, uh, for the last year, we had over 1,000 detections of skate, and there was no real evidence that that residential behavior that we were looking to investigate occurred at the Maidens. This is the kind of acoustic data we get back on the... Left-hand side, we have a detection, just a, a simple array design with a number of detections, and we estimate residency at each station. As you can see, Skate did not spend a lot of time there, maybe a third of a day um, in total. They were moving into the area and quickly moving away from specific re uh, receivers. If we bring all that information together, we get a residential index um, on a monthly basis. Now, what that means, it's a proportion of the number of days within a month it's detected. So a residency index of about 0.3 is about 10 days of a month of detections. Um, we can see the, the detection, uh, the, the tagging times in the green points, and the individual that's highlighted by red, number 3161, was actually tagged off southwest Scotland and moved across into the Maidens. So that's the kind of information we're looking to get from acoustic uh, arrays and acoustic detections. We can see that one skate did actually spend about 10 days of, uh, of a month in the Maidens SAC, but that was the highest residency that they displayed in the area. 
the second site, and here, big thanks to the Marine Institute, who, while we may have provided the equipment, they did most of the grunt work regarding the, the array deployment and the tagging itself. Historically, Clue Bay in Ireland has a history of skate fishing um, from an angling perspective. Um, prize fish were caught there, females up to 200 pound or 100 kilos in weight. And some of those tagging records do actually go back about 40 or 50 years. So there's a history of skate presence in the area. So it's a kind of natural area to investigate flapper skate presence with acoustic telemetry. The, the Marine Institute managed to tag four skate, uh, which, was, which was fantastic. And all four of those skate were actually detected on a relatively small number of, of acoustic receivers in the region. Looking at a similar kind of diagnostic plot to the one for the maidens, all the receivers picked up skate, but we can see much higher residency periods. Skate present for up to 25 days at a time, detected over multiple months, and in some cases, one skate was present in consecutive months for over half the time on a relatively small number of receivers. This was really as a kind of pilot project because the receivers were in place for various other studies, and it was, let's tag some skate and, and see what they do, but it's really suggestive that Clue Bay might indeed have a kind of residential component to the skate, and uh, as a pilot study to suggest that further research there would really give us insight into the wider use of clue bay by the species. Um, if we bring that into context with what we, a, a sort of long-term study site for the skate, which is the marine protected area in Scotland, this, this MPA was designated in 2014 based on high and known residency in the area by previous work. There is a fisheries ban on mobile gear in the site, so it's heavily protected for the species. So this is a good opportunity to see what the skate do when there's that level of protection. Now, the, the, in this project, uh, Sea Monitor collaborated with another ongoing project at uh, the MEFS project to get some additional data. And we had about 65 skate in the area over four years and 36 receiver stations. In comparison to the other sites we're looking at, we, we just learned a little bit more about the residency that we already knew, but we had some skates resident for over 717 days. And as I said, that's ongoing as the data continues to collect. It's really just promoting that this site is highly suitable, the protection already in place is suitable, and, and it's confirming that. But these are the really interesting plots, and while you might think I'm focusing on the colored background where the residence index of over one, we knew that, that residency was known. The really interesting parts of this plot are the small red dots, which is movements outside of that protected area. This is where that wider context to sea monitor, the multiple partners, the wide acoustics really came into its own with the skate. We knew the residency, that was really nothing new, but it was nice to confirm that. But in terms of regional connectivity for the species, this was not known before. There was a little bit of hints from previous uh, angler data. But in terms of confirming that, we managed to place that protection in a much wider context linking Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland together. We, a few snapshots of movements, we had return movements of over 690 kilometers. Annual migrations were proven of approximately 150. It was all painting a picture of a much more mobile animal than we previously thought. What that looks like at a kind of individual level, each of these plots is from an individual skate and it's all off acoustic data. Regular movements outside of the marine protected area and back in again, so site fidelity. Huge movements from south to the north of Scotland and back again, something we never thought that the skate undertook movements of such magnitude. Linking multiple regions, Southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland in the Maidens, and then the protected area up in, on the west coast of Scotland. And seasonal migrations between the marine protected area and a specific site off the north coast of Ireland over multiple years. That regional connectivity was something new and it was something exciting. Not saying the residency isn't important and it doesn't exist, but this adds a new layer to what we understand about skate movements. Just to give you an idea, that acoustic data has been collected over four years, but that spatial pattern of movement is very similar to over 40 years worth of angling, mark and recapture records. Model movements based on depth data and geolocational modeling. And then there's the acoustic data, confirmed movement. So those three data sources all show a very similar pattern of movement, but that acoustic data has really accelerated what we know about skate and managed to collect a lot of data in a relatively short time period. The other thing 
that the skate did, as well as all the other species, is it really highlighted the benefits of that wide-scale collaboration, multiple acoustic arrays going in, and it really promotes the need for this kind of multi-species array infrastructure moving forward with wide partnership between projects so that data flows between all the partners. Um, you can see here on this detection plot, all the different colors are from different projects, highlighting that all those different projects have contributed to what we know about the skate movement. The conclusions from this, and I, I do appreciate that was a very rushed through example of acoustic telemetry. It's quite hard to condense four years of research down into that 10 minutes when I quite happily talk to you about it for longer, but Clue Bay does seem to be an area of importance. Um, further research there would be fantastic to understand the, what the skate are doing there and, and the residency in the area. There isn't any evidence of residency in the Maidens, but it's a low number of skate, but it does seem that skate are regularly using the area, maybe as part of a migratory route. So I, understanding what they're doing there would be of benefit. A single marine protected area can have much wider regional connectivity, um, and when you're looking at developing networks of MPAs, we can really place that in a central feature of, uh, of the flapper skate. It's essential to have a wide network of receivers to pick up those wider movements, and of course, the collaboration to get the data flowing between partners. Long-term acoustics with such a long-lived animal, this is a species that matures at approximately 20 years of age and can live well past 50. We need that long-term acoustic infrastructure to track these animals over long time periods. Um, and what that network and that connectivity suggests that if we are going to look for acoustic infrastructure moving forward, it's important to identify sites where that acoustics would be best placed for this species. So getting a good grip of baseline survey data to help target those acoustic arrays in future would be of real benefit. Um, that's an incredibly brief snapshot of the acoustic work, and I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Caroline, to, to talk to you about the genetics now, but thank you. Thank you, James. Um, so while James has discussed tracking to learn about the population structure and other demographic parameters, um, we use genetic methodologies. And we're particularly interested in using genetics to characterize the population structure within the flapper scale. So here you can see your sampling area, which we now know is shared between two species, the flapper skate, uh, Dipterus intermedius, and the blue skate, Dipterus badus, um, with at least some degree of overlapping. And it can be difficult to tell them apart, so it's important for us at first to make sure we know which species we're dealing with. So the size of the pie uh, is relative to the number of samples uh, caught at each site. And where we didn't have location data, uh, samples were grouped together by their landing port. And we processed over 450 samples from 137 individual sites, ranging from the south coast of Ireland uh, up to Norway. And species identification was initially based on morphological characteristics during the sampling process. However, a small number of samples uh, remained unidentified. So mitochondrial DNA is a useful tool for um, establishing correct species ID, uh, particularly when mor morphological classification may be problematic. And to this end, we designed species-specific primers for the highly conserved COX-1 region of the mitochondrial genome. And this is a commonly used uh, molecular marker for species identification. Analysis of the COX-1 COX region uh, sequences produced an alignment of approximately 500 base pairs, with 450 of our samples being used for further analysis. So here is a subset of multi-sequence alignment uh, for several individuals. I'm not sure the pointer. So the numbered rows um, show the partial sequence of a single individual. And at the top of the image, you can see the multicolored consensus sequence, which shows the most common choice of base at that location. Um, where there is a base difference, it is highlighted in a particular color. Um, and you can clearly see that there are many informative um, and species-specific site variants. I'm going to have to come up again now. Um, so you can see. Um, so most of our samples were, as expected, blue and flabber skate, uh, but a sp small number uh, were found to be different species altogether. So if you see at the top here, 
Uh, we have three individuals that were identified as the bottlenose skate, Rostra Raja Alba, and the next three were Norwegian skate, Dipterus Nadar, I'm going to stutter over this, Nadarius Sciensius, it's wrong, but. Um, so the bottlenose had been misidentified as flapper skate, while the Norwegian had been recorded as long nose. So we confirmed from our data set we had 290 flapper skate and 156 blue. So we had roughly twice as many flappers as blue. So not all samples in the database had been visually, visually ID'd, but for those that were, 78% were correctly identified, highlighting the usefulness of DNA barcoding approaches uh, for species identification. So while we've been doing this through sequencing this far, we now have developed a faster, cheaper, non-sequence based method for determining ID for a large number of samples. So here we have the geographic distribution of both species based on the species specific variation found in COX-1. So after assignment to their species, we can clearly see and confirm the overlapping range of the blue and the flapper skate. The flapper skate shown here in orange has a more, more northerly distribution compared to the blue skate, which is more common in the southern areas. And this distribution pattern isn't new information, but from our study, where our study differs to other previous work, is that we have greater coverage, uh, particularly within the westerly range. So now we can also look at within species variation, uh, again using the data from the COX-1 analysis. Um, for flappers, we observed two mitochondrial haplotypes or variants, haplotype 1 and haplotype 2. And you can see haplotype 1 in orange. It's widespread throughout the range. And haplotype 2 in the navy seems to be more geographically restricted to the westerly sites and absent in the north. And it's interesting that there seems to be some geographic bias. And for comparison, we carried out the same analysis for the, for the blue skate and found that despite the smaller sample size of the blue skate, which is roughly that half of that of the flappers, there appears to be a greater level of uh, diversity. There were six genetic variants uh, identified with haplotype one in the blue being the most common throughout the sampling area. And again, the remaining variants appear to be restricted to a more westerly location and absent from the north. Um, there's also some partitioning between the remaining variants with, for example, most of the green variants, HAP2, 5, and 6, being found in the south, uh, with a few exceptions. And the haplotype 3 in the red seems to be more common in the west. So in addition to the mitochondrial sequencing, we also examined our samples using nuclear microsatellite DNA profiling. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with microsatellites. So here you can see three um, individuals, the standard profiles that you get with microsatellites, and you can see the high quality of the data that was being produced. We used published uh, microsatellite markers that had previously been um, characterized for skate species, and not surprisingly, um, provided that we're dealing with two different species, uh, some of these markers helped to confirm our species ID um, that was made through the mitochondrial sequencing analysis. Uh, many markers had species-specific alleles, uh, while two markers that amplified in flapper failed to amplify in the blue skate. And we used this microsatellite data to examine population structure. And classically, structure analysis is used to distinguish between different populations. However, in this case, as these samples are from an open area of water, we have no option to use the population location as a prior. Effectively, we have either individuals of a single population spread over a large area, or a mixture of individuals uh, from different populations. And if you, uh, many of you may be familiar with structure analysis, um, where the algorithm, algorithms cluster the individuals according to their genetic similarities. So our first step was to analyze all the data collected to answer the question, how many populations explain this genetic data? So this is the first result of the analysis. Unambiguously and not surprisingly, we can tell the blue apart from flapper. So to clarify, each column um, represents the genetic profile of a single individual and the different colors their membership to a group. And as previously been demonstrated, structural analysis clearly shows the genetic differences between the flapper and the blue with no evidence of mixing or genetic integration. So to put this into a geographical context, you can see here that the nuclear DNA profiling on the right um, completely supports our findings from the mitochondrial DNA analysis 
with the geographic distribution being identical. Uh, but this isn't what we're really interested in. For the purposes of the project, we wanted to determine if flapper skate comprise a single widespread population or if there are a number of isolated populations across the area of study. And if we focus solely on the flapper skate and rerun the structure analysis on the flapper skate alone, the individuals are clearly partitioned into two putative populations in green and pink here. So in this bar plot, they're just in the order that they were in the database, they're just in sequential order. But in the bottom bar plot, uh, um, uh, the samples are ordered by membership or population grouping with two popu putative populations clearly obvious. So if we, use, if we plot the structure results on the map, there's no apparent geographical um, pattern to the individuals. So this has left us a little bit confused. Um, our current working hypothesis is that genetic divergence between the populations is perhaps maintained by homing behavior uh, to mating and or spawning sites, although we're unsure at this stage and this hypothesis needs to be further investigated. We need more confidence in our structure analysis, so we'll soon be adding um, additional microsatellite loci to your data and we're also currently uh, sequencing the full mitochondrial DNA genome of a large number of specimens uh, with emphasis on the flapper skate. So we hope then to merge uh, the results with the other components of the project and to further understand the population dynamics of the flapper skate. So now I'll pass you over to Amy. Um, hi, I'm Amy Garbett. Um, so as James and Caroline have mentioned, um, the, they've summarized the key telemetry and genetic components of the C-Monitor project. Um, one of the main things that's demonstrated is the connectivity between the different areas, um, and it highlights the capability of Flapperskate to move between jurisdictions, especially within the Interreg region. Um, so, oh, sorry. What I'm going to uh, briefly talk about is some of the supporting work and some of the um, research that CMonter has generated and facilitated throughout the last three and a half years. Um, so our team at Queen's sorry, has um, expanded beyond the core CMonter team. Um, we now have an international network of collaborators. We have PhD students, industry research partnerships, um, MSI students, master's students, and undergraduate students all working on a variety of different aspects of flapperscape research. So throughout the last couple of years, we've been working on lots of different areas. We've been looking at distribution. We've, been, we've established the regional flapperscape working group. Um, we've looked at candidate essential fish habitats, um, looked at ecosystem services, bycatch reduction, and a number of different physiology um, areas of flapper skate, all in an effort to help conserve and provide more information on um, flapper skate for management purposes. So one of the main things through the Seaman project was we established the regional flapper skate working group, and this is a consortium of people. It's researchers, policymakers, NGOs, representatives from the fishing community, and it all brought us into a room together. Um, to look at uh, sharing knowledge was one of the main things, prioritizing work um, and looking at future work for flapper skate conservation. The first workshop was held in Belfast um, and this was a consensus agree agreement and we had recommendations from this workshop that were published in Marine Policy and this was prioritizing future work and recommendation for flapper skate. Um, so some of the key outputs of this were developing a standardized approach for data collection across the regions, um, increasing coordination and data sharing, which is a big part of what CMUNTER is about, um, raising the profile of the species, not everyone thinks flapper skate are cute, um, and increasing public ownership of the species, um, the use of accurate, accurate taxonomic identification, especially for conservation purposes, as Caroline mentioned, the um, ID of the species is quite challenging. Um, identifying habitats that may be critical for different life stages. Um, the need to focus research into bycatch reduction techniques, which is one of their main pressures. 
and the need to develop a coherent network um, to enable species recovery across the region. So identifying habitats that were critical for different life stages was one of the key recommendations. Um, and in collaboration with the Orkney Skate Trust and WWF Netherlands, um, we used citizen science data from around Orkney Island to try and identify essential fish habitats for egg laying sites. Um, the habitats of potential egg laying sites were summarized as being more than 20 meters in depth, um, having boulders or exposed bedrock, um, moderate current flow with low sedimentation. So we've now used this information and we're looking at using other non-destructive techniques like brubs and uh, toad camera work to look at other candidate sites across the region. Um, and we're also using this to facilitate non-invasive mark and recapture through photo identification of Leprosgate. Um, PhD candidate Sophie, who's somewhere in here today, there she is in blue. Um, she's been her PhD has been focusing on Flapperskate and summarized here is one of her chapters, which she can talk to you in more detail. Um, but this is looking at ecosystem services, which here is demonstrated as the, correct me if I'm wrong, Sophie, <laughs> of the benefit of a potential flapper skate MPA or spatial protection, how that, what benefits that would have on human well-being or what contributions that would have. Um, so the experts were identified from the regional flapper skate working group um, and it was a consensus agreement here and it summarized that these are the key benefits that a flapper skate MPA would have um, and the key one was biodiversity, um, followed by biogenic habitats, uh, followed by biological control, clean water, and uh, safeguarding the genetic um, diversity of Flapperskate. Um, so Flapperskate have a complicated taxonomic history with being a species complex with blue skate and Flapperskate and skate in general are highly conserved morphologically. To most people, they all look the same. They're big and flat, and that's a skate. Um, so they have, that's caused issues with mislabeling, misidentification across most data sources um, and across records historically. So this can lead to challenges in estimating population size, um, in distribution range, and for, it can have an impact on fisheries management. Um, so in order to get a confirmed distribution at the moment of where flapper skate are, we used a holistic approach using molecular data to confirm species ID, um, as well as a combination of different survey data from anglers, from uh, fisheries, as well as expert witnesses, which we all verified to be flapper skate, to try and redefine the current confirmed distribution of flapper skate. So this is in press, I think, at the moment, um, but our results are indicated here in red, and we found that flapper skate had a more constrained distribution compared to, particularly compared to the common skate, which is shown in blue, um, but also compared to the more recent estimates from the IUCN of uh, flapper skate, which is in blue, I think. Um, so overall, the revised distribution of flapper skate appears to be more constrained, and it also implies there is possible fragmented distribution. Um, so we've also, the, these taxonomic challenges that are across the species, um, across flapper skate, they also have an impact on our understanding of life history of the species. Um, so information on maturity size, the time of reproduction, um, especially for females, is crucial for species specific management. On the left, um, you can see it's skates, uh, a skate vertebra centrum. Um, and this was used for, an, for aging species, much like banding patterns on a tree. Um, and we used a whole vertebrae centrum aging approach as a pilot study aimed at refining the growth estimates focusing on age at sexual maturity. So the age of maturity has implications for management, particularly uh, for flapper skate, because um, they're such large animals, they're vulnerable almost immediately from hatching um, to fisheries. And we, this pilot study estimated, um, which is a conservative estimate, that 
the females sexually mature between 12 and 15 years, and for males, it's between about 9 and 13 years. It's a significant amount of time for these individuals to have to, to survive before being able to add to the gene pool. As well as this, um, James, who was speaking earlier, he developed a non-lethal method for investigating maturity and reproductive cy cycle in flatbrushgate. Um, this work was done in the Loch Sunit to the Sound of Jura MPA in Scotland. And this used ultrasound imaging and hormone analysis. Um, the ultrasound imagery was successfully used in field or on boat, on live animals, which is something that's quite unique. Um, and it was success successfully able to identify in utero egg cases um, as well as do hormone analysis. The overall results of this suggest that flapperskate lay pairs of eggs throughout the winter. Um, so this type of information is important for developing species-specific management measures and strategies across the region. Um, so we're still working on developing some of the knowledge gaps that were identified. Um, and we have some planned research ideas and some ongoing stuff. We're hoping to look at more into fisheries mitigation, um, and we're looking at a risk assessment for flapper skate and other elasmobranchs. Uh, we're looking into bycatch survivability, um, using visual acuity as an insight into e ecological environments, um, and we're using 3D photogrammetry tools and also developing a framework for data collection um, on flapper skate and other skate in general. Um, so all the research here that, and that Seamunter has generated has helped our understanding of flapper skate in the region and it's added to the baseline and evidence base that we need for effective policy implementation. The Seamunter project has highlighted the importance of genetic and movement data for understanding flapper skate and the connectivity particularly between regions and the ability of skate to move between jurisdictions has huge implications for management. It also emphasizes the limitations of some of our data sources, particularly in terms of taxonomic resolution and species identification. Um, flapper skate are still listed as critically endangered, and they're still relatively low data species, so we need to be able to use the best of our resources available. As part of this, we have developed a toolbox um, for data collection, and part of this, it's a linear process to follow um, to be able to use the best use of time, resources, um, money, and equipment, which is a lot of lessons learned from some of the challenges that we've had to encounter. Um, and this is a conceptual framework for collecting ecological data on skate for management and conservation. Um, and last but last, not least, the Regional Flapper Skate Working Group um, is next week. The next one is next week in Galway. So I think some of you here are attending. Um, and if anyone else wants to attend, just let me know. Um, and this has been a huge collaborative project and all the project partners and institutes, all the other projects and lots of individuals that we need to thank um, to make all this research happen. And of course, the, the funding for SUPB and uh, Interreg project. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much to all three of our presenters there. Again, fascinating stuff on a, a species that is less known and still more to learn, um, but they've made good headway with that. So this is amazing. We, we are sort of keeping the time here, which is great. Um, pleasantly surprised. We are going to set up now and take a very short comfort break, and I do mean short, uh, because we're going to have the first of our panel discussions. So people are lodging questions on Slido, which is good. Continue to do that. But I am going to keep you to five minutes just for us to set up a stage, and then we'll introduce our panel, if that's OK. Happy enough? Thank you very much.
Yeah. I'm not even. Hello, hello. Say something again. Hello. Hello, hello. Yep. Yeah, got us. Yeah. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Blah, 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 blah. Testing, testing, all good. Hello, 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 hello. Test, 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 test. 
Thank you. It's worrying, isn't it? Thanks. I never even got to see you before. Are we? Am I filling the airwaves there? As I'm I think I'm talking. I can hear myself, can I? Check in, check in. Yes. Working okay? Test, test. Yep. So we're going to have the panel session start yeah. now. If I can get the yeah. panelists Perfect. up to the front, please. Testing. And if everyone Testing. could take their seats. Testing. Yes. OK. Really? Thank you very much. Wherever you'd like to sit. Who gets the comfy seats? It's up. You, you're first. You guys could have the comfy seats if you want. Sold. <laughs> Not as good as the big red sofa, but you know. Okay, please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We'll keep things moving as best we can. You know, I can see that. <laughs> I think that's our panelists ready. Okay, so this is our first chance to ask questions of our expert panel. Um, you've been given a lot of information this morning across um, seals, cetaceans, skate, basking shark. We have a bunch of questions, big and small, loaded up. Um, so for the next oh, 20 minutes or so, taking us up to lunch, uh, it's your chance to interact with the scientists and the experts. So I think we've got everybody up here now. It's a good crowd. We've got um, the speakers which you heard from already. I won't reintroduce them. But we also have some new faces. So we've got Liz Pathonicat from DIRA, which is the Department, Northern Irish Department of Environment, Agriculture, and Rural Affairs. Dr. Oliver Okala from the Irish Department of Housing, Local Government, and Heritage. And we've got from Queen's University, Dr. Paolo, uh, pa Paolo? Prodo? Prodo, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Really bad pronunciation of that, I'm sorry. Um, so if we have questions are coming up. Um, Patrick. Oh, and Patrick, I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> Gosh, fungled that one. And Patrick Collins, Dr. Patrick, Patrick Collins from the University uh, of Queens, Belfast. So, first question up, we'll go through these um, as quick or as slowly as we, we want to, and people can either ask through Slido or we have a roving mic if you'd like to do it the old-fashioned way, all right? So, uh, first question on the list, were interactions between seals and migratory salmonids considered? Uh, yeah, very good question. It was. Um, at the start of the project, we were intending on deploying some of the VR2 receivers on seals with the, the other tags as well, so that they could send the data on fish detections to the GPS tag, which would then transmit those back to us remotely. Um, unfortunately, that combination of tags was just too big to put on a juvenile seal, so it went the other way. Okay. That said as well, though, I think there was, I don't know if they're in the audience, um, someone doing some of the salmonid tagging. Um, some of those tags had a temperature um, sensor in them, and they managed to detect sort of um, elevated temperatures of, of salmonids that were well outside the range that they should be, um, indicating that it had probably been eaten by a seal, and the seal had gone past one of the detectors. And we'll be hearing a bit more from that this afternoon, I think. That's right. Okay. Um, why do you think, this is from Anonymous, why do you think the release seals seemingly act uh, differently the first four days post-release? Yeah, another good one. Um, I think it's because when those juvenile seals are released, they're probably a little bit chubby and overweight. So the, the rehab centers try to give them a good bit of blubber before releasing them so that they've got that couple of days where they can learn um, to, to feed for themselves without starving to death. But I think that extra blubber might have added a little bit of extra buoyancy to the seals, and they probably find it a little harder to dive down against that buoyancy. So we're working with them at the moment to maybe think about an accelerated program where they release them not quite as chubby um, and see if that actually changes the, the dive profiles at the start. Okay, another one for you, Mark, will stay on the seals. Uh, have similar studies been carried out for gray seals, given the increase in GS and the decline in HS? Interesting to compare survival post-rehabilitation. Yeah, so not on the pups. I think there's been some early work done many years ago that looked at gray seal pups using a, a slightly different technology. Um, we didn't really get any indication of the post-release survival from that study, but they were certainly showing that those animals were doing similar exploratory movements before they went down. And I guess they were finding some similar levels of post-release survival, but it's something that we'd like to do going forward in the future to see if the, the population discrepancies of the trajectories might be explained by things like juvenile survival and recruitment. But it's impossible. It's it's probably important to do that more on the, the wild populations because there's probably more of those recruiting to the populations and we want to get a better idea on what the natural level of um, survival within the first one to two years would be. Okay, there was a question we could start with um, going down the panel maybe about uh, if time and resources allowed, other species that you would have liked to study or other aspects of your species that you studied that you would have looked at differently or elaborated on. Maybe we could go down the, the row with uh, each scientist starting with John on that one. Um, differently, well, that's a bit. I'm going to start with other things that I'd, um, I think from a, from a shark perspective, two candidates would be four beagles, which, I mean, there's Nick Payne there down at Trinity, and he's, Mathis, the tracks that he's shown there have gone way up to Norway around, and they can circumnavigate the island of Ireland in a week or so, and the West Coast, another weird and wonderful one, less known, would be something called six gill sharks. Normally found in very, very deep water, but for some reason off the West Coast of Ireland, very, very shallow, and that's really going into the, there'd be monsters here, unknown territory mm -hmm. of, of marine science. Um, so I suppose from the whale and dolphin side of things, as you saw from the work that Morgan presented, there was a lot of data on dolphin species, so I think some more work to try and differentiate between those species would be very useful. Um, but obviously the baleen whales, where we could look at um, specifically minke whales, uh, fin whales and humpbacks would be really a nice uh, area to, to target um, if we'd had more time and resources as well. Mark? Um, yeah, I think touched on that, I'd really like to address that whole seal salmonid interaction and predation. So if we can get the, the tags miniaturized enough to do those co-deployments of a VR2 receiver linked up to a, a GPS tag, we could then use the, the seals as almost like a mobile receiver station for the, the array as well, which would be quite interesting to do. 
Paolo or Patrick? Well, I more or less agree with, uh, with John there. Okay. Evil and so. Same, Patrick? <laughs> That's not me. Not me either. <laughs> I am the juvenile ecology. We know, is there a lot of feedback there? There's a little bit. I There's a lot. The juvenile ecology of the species. Um, the bottleneck for the flappers get is certainly offshore. Uh, we know next to nothing about the first 20 years of their life. Um, and this is sort of pressure on the species as well in terms of their interaction with fisheries. So I, I think if we had more time, more money, more effort, certainly I think we could really support the conservation of the species by focusing more effort on the juvenile stage. Beyond the flapper scape, there's a ton of these species in Irish waters that are very rare, um, that are heavily impacted by fisheries, and that also require the same sort of effort like the white scape, the, the blue scape as well as Paolo alluded to. On top of those, as John said, the six gill. Six gills are stunning. They're in County Clare in daylight in relatively shallow water, and I think they might have a rather munchy munchy association with the flapper scape, which I think certainly deserves a bit more attention because we've got a Jurassic Park on our coast with giant sharks eating giant scape. Stunning. So just no munchy munchy situation for the next application that'll be <laughs> built into. Um, if we turn to the policy side of stuff, Liz and Oliver, um, looking at basking sharks, there was a question about you know, noting that the recent protection status given through the Wildlife Act. So in, if you want to kick us off in that sense, like what future research might assist in implementing and protection uh, in the waters for basking sharks for that species? And then maybe we could turn to skate or other species after that. I, go first. I don't know what the scientists <laughs> and others think. But. So I suppose for Northern Ireland, they have been protected under the wildlife order since um, I think it was 1985. But the difficulty is really, you know, we look a lot of spatial protections. We look at finding those areas that are hot spots that are important for feeding, for reproducing, etc. And it's gathering that information and then trying to see, you know, is that enough? Is but you know, when we put those designations in place, it's then the management of those. And I think what John had spoken about earlier in terms of having a potential app to make people aware of whenever basking shark are in the area, that's part of it. You know, it's working with stakeholders, it's working with everyone to try and bring in ownership and bring in that conservation. Um, you know, there's no point just having a designation without the management that goes alongside with it. Mm -hmm. And Oliver, for you as a, as a species recently uh, protected or given that status, what are the challenges and opportunities from your point of view? Um, I think it was really, really good to hear the, the results of the research this morning. I think, and I, I brought my notes because there were a few questions that came into my head in terms of policy and management. One of them would be, really, do we understand the threats um, that basking shark faces um, within the 12 nautical mile limit, for example, which is where the Wildlife Act has jurisdiction in, in the Republic? Um, and I would say we need to we need to delve into that further. We need to really understand what, are the, what is the myriad of threats and, and, and prioritize addressing those threats. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, about management action and managing the species, but really management is very much more about managing people and the human activities. And if we can get the threats assessment right, um, then we can direct measures, say, f under, the, under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive or under national uh, policy to, uh, to tackle the, the pressures and threats that they face. And I think this, this also is applicable to the scape situation. We were just talking there before coming up on stage um, about, about the juvenile stages of scape, for example, that Patrick was referring to, and um, putting time and effort into um, understanding them better, where they, where they occur, um, and how they should be protected. Because if you don't protect the juvenile stages, obviously you don't have a, an adult population to, uh, to sustain the, the, the stocks into the future. So to me, uh, I think that's a, a big thing that we need, to, we need to drill into further. And I think um, the technology like we, we heard about for Basking Shark around um, prediction of ship strike risk um, for mm -hmm. boat users, I think we need to maybe think about concepts like that for other threats, you know, that, um, so that if ship strike isn't an issue in a particular area, but there is another one, then we, we need to be able to develop tools that are user friendly and that integrate with people and communities in a way that we can we can all uh, do do better for protection. Mm. 
They might want to come in off the back of that. Yeah, just coming off the back. I mean, that, that, it's, it's good to know both from Liz and Oliver that that wasn't off target, which is great. And just following on from what Oliver just said there as well, yeah, I think it is about human management and, and, and protecting things that move so widely is so difficult. You know, and you can go down a marine protected area route, but where the sharks are can change. You know, Malin used to be the place less so but two years time it might be again so it, it is a difficult thing so what we focus on is interactions with humans and i presented that in a kind of collision risk model idea for when that vulnerable state when they're near surface waters because you can flip the logic on that and we can say we can actually predict when they're down near the seabed we know they actually swim along the seabed at night when they're sort of mid water columns so in terms of fisheries interaction you can actually predict particular types of netting or so and so. And it's, it's not about a carte blanche, you can't be doing that now, there, ever again. You could actually be more targeted in terms of, okay, we know the animals are here, we know they're operating like this, let's ease back on that for a little while. And then I think that's a bit more stakeholder friendly and a bit more adaptive or dynamic than just kind of four points on a map where it's like you can't be doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, um, there's a few more questions that we'd like to get through. Um, I think one before that was, well, let's take this one just for the skate scientist since we're, we were talking about skate earlier too. Um, how do you target or know where to find what is a rare and critically endangered species? The rarest of the ones studied in this project, definitely. Uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, they tell us. Okay. So it's, it's designated by an international body. And it, it struck me in the presentations that it is much lower level of knowledge that's, that's being accumulated for that species because they're so critically endangered and rare. So we're starting from a different baseline when it comes to other species. What are the next steps then in terms of what, you know, building on CMON or what you've established? Where would you see us going from here in terms of the research and the protection? Because there seems to be still some knowledge gaps there. Huge, yeah. huge. We need to know uh, where the species exists. We don't really have a good coverage there. Um, it'd be excellent to know what they're doing uh, and when they exist in these spaces. We just don't have that information. Um, we're really only, like you have to remember, this was only recognized as a species in its own right in 2011. So a lot of the information we have prior to that doesn't, it, it isn't accurate, it, it's not precise enough. We know nothing about where the juveniles, what they do for the first 20 years of their life. We don't know how long they live. Um, we're beginning to understand movement and fidelity. But again, we're at a very early stage, and most of our information comes from one site in Scotland that might not necessarily be representative of the species as a whole. We know nothing about the activity of the animals in Norway, in the Azores, in the south of Spain. We don't know where they are. Um, we're, we're really just scratching the surface here. Yeah. Where do they meet? Where do they go? So we have this. Uh, hints of structure that we cannot explain. Mm. So uh, this is all lacking, so we, we here trying to uh, implement protection, yet we, we lack that basic information. So we're just starting to scratch in terms of knowledge uh, for this. And as, as uh, Patrick pointed out, I mean, say until five, 10 years ago, uh, we are dealing with a single species from Norway to the Mediterranean now, now we have this clear cutting too, and again, to this even hints that there might be further uh, levels uh, of taxonomic uncertainty within each one of those types, so this needs to be further explored. Mm -hmm. In terms of fisheries management, the common skate, which is how, how it's managed, can refer to three different genera, four, five, six, seven species, depending on where you are. They were calling things common skate in, in the Mediterranean. They're not. They're not even in the genus Dipturus. They were calling things common skate in, in Norway and Russia. Completely different genus. Even in the Irish fisheries records and the UK fisheries records, the common skate, as we found ourselves with our scientific work, uh, is three, four different species. Like, we found two different genera that we were all just lumping in as common skate. That they all look the same. That's the problem. As babies, they're all more or less identical. Um, which makes it very, because most of the data you're going to have is on the juveniles because there's more of them, which makes them a very difficult species to work with. The other thing I have to add is that there's bottlenecks in terms of the species' life history. 
for instance, where they lay their eggs. We, we tend to believe that they are, the evidence we have is that they use these egg-laying sites. We know around the Red Rocks in Scotland, we've got a site there that's of interest, that's been managed. Around Orkney, it seems to be ground zero for skate. There's vast numbers of eggs washing up on the beach there. There's a few sites in Ireland, like around Tory, uh, around Spanish Point in County Clare. But we know nothing other than that we're seeing these aggregations of egg cases washing up on the beach. We know nothing about where they are, how to manage them, how to protect them, what are the threats to them. So there's huge bottlenecks in our understanding here, which are critical to conserving the species in the longer term. So very early days. And I was struck, too, in the presentations about the life cycle and the, the age they get to for reproduction plays a factor in the yeah. critical importance of the habitat, making sure you know, they can get to that stage in their life cycle to reproduce. 20 their, years as a juvenile, yeah. up to 20 years Compared as a juvenile. Compared to other animals yeah. in the ocean, yeah. yeah. Um, there's one question we could probably knock off quick. Uh, Rowley's asked, does the glider re remain stationary when, where did that one go? It's disappeared. <laughs> Rowley, do you want to ask it or shout it? Does it remain buoyant when it's not moving? Spot the skipper in the audience. There it is. Does the glider remain stationary with neural, uh, neutral buoyancy, or is it always moving? I don't know if anyone on the panel might know the question of that. You probably need a roving mic. Fred, no. So it moves constantly, basically. Um, OK, the last question might take up what time we have left. Um, and it's to do with the conservation measures needed and the biggest threats facing the species. So we could probably take that into one if we want to try and tackle that. The threats facing seals, cetaceans, and elasmobranchs. And what are the most important conservation measures needed for those species? So. Part of this project, and we'll hear about this later today and tomorrow, is translating it into management plans for some of the species. Um, I don't know if we can start down the line, maybe, and just talk. Well, start with Joanne. We haven't heard from you uh, in a bit there, just on the cetacean side of stuff. Um, biggest so, threats and, and important measures for conservation. I suppose if we just look at some of the results that Morgan presented this morning, um, we look at the overlap with fisheries. We could see that from the West Pass survey. Um, so obviously there is potential threats there, um, but I think one of the biggest ones going forward with us, for us in the cetacean or marine mammal world is probably the development of renewable energy. Um, if we look at the potential sites that are you know, highlighted for potential development into the future, they span all around the entire coast. And as we know, our animals are mobile, they're going around the entire coast. Um, so definitely for cetaceans, the issue that they use sound for a lot of their, um, you know, their, for basically their entire lives, their, their ears or their eyes, um, you know, if we look at what we do with their eyes, their, their sound does that for them, so it's hugely important finding food, you know, mating, maintaining um, their calves with them, uh, it's so significant, so once we put another sound source into the water, uh, I think that's going to have huge impacts. It's going to remove habitat, mainly, mainly not for permanent um, periods, but even if we do have disturbance, do we know that they're going to come back? How important is that habitat to them? Is it a really important feeding site? So there's huge knowledge gaps there that we need to fill before we're able to manage properly uh, how these developments are going to affect them into the future and to have conservation objectives. I think that's that's one of the biggest ones I would see uh, going forward. I've heard talk of marine protected, marine mammal protected areas um, being developed for this part of the world and others. Is what's your thoughts on that in terms of I developing them and the efficacy of them? And so, for marine protected areas, some of the the ones that we have um, are they're very big sites, uh, especially designations going forward. And Oliver, I think this is one of your areas. Um, some of the sites are extremely big, um, which will be more beneficial for you know, these wider ranging animals. But at the same time, um, do we stop certain things within these big sites? It's, it, it throws out even more complications for management. Uh, 
it's a very complex issue. Uh, we could be here for several weeks, months, just discussing these alone. So, um, but definitely, uh, you know, there are there are definite I concerns. Suppose, I suppose in asking, I'm wondering, is there is there a dynamic uh, element the way John brought in with the basking sharks in terms of how they're managed for for another mobile highly mobile species or family group like cetaceans? Yeah, I suppose. For, for cetaceans, they are going to be moving. Um, I'll just give you one example from another piece of work that I'm working on at the moment. Um, we have been working with the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, on a number of uh, abundance estimate surveys on harbour porpoises, specifically at designated sites already, so special areas of conservation. Um, we have done abundance estimate surveys for many years now at some of the sites, and so we had a good grasp of kind of abundances at those areas, but over the recent while within these designated areas we've seen population estimates plummeting. Um, Blasket Islands, which was one of the most important and one of the, the first sites that has been designated, we did an abundance estimate last year and it was tiny. The, the, you know, we've gone down to a few animals, that's what the abundance is coming up at, from hundreds to a few animals. So. Um, we don't know what that means. Does that mean it's just that site that's been impacted? Are they moving outside just the boundaries of what, you know, the, the four dots in the map that we're surveying within? Are they just outside of that? Or are we having uh, impacts at, uh, you know, is there a population level nationally that's changing? We don't know. So, you know, I guess to come back to your, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really important that we look at these protected sites across a range of different species, but also down to the prey. Um, and I think that's one of the things that if we do look at designated sites already um, under SACs, you know, there are still activities that can take place within them. One, for example, is, I use the example all the time, is the Shannon Estuary. It's one where we have a resin group of bottlenose dolphins, 140-ish individuals, but yet you can still see pear trawling coming into the estuary. Um, so they're the kind of things that we have to, to target. It's not saying, no, you can't do this mm. at all, but maybe there's specific times of the year that we don't do it when it's more sensitive, or yeah, maybe there has to be these areas as well where we don't have these types of practices. Because if you're impacting fisheries like Sprat, for example, that's a food chain, um, and we're going to have impacts the whole way up that food chain. So it's really, really important that we start to look at um, the entire ecosystem within mm -hmm. those areas, and I think that's probably really important. And we do know where it's not working, um, and I think to take those lessons forward into these bigger uh, designated areas is going to be a, a key thing. Looking at the whole ecosystem, definitely not just the species. Um, Mark, do you want to come in just on that question of threats facing seals and conservation measures from your point of view? Well, I, I guess from some of the results we were getting in ours, we know or suspected something like you know parasite lungworm infection was having quite a high mortality rate on on the seals. I think we need to do some more research into what's driving that, where they're picking them up you know, how it's developing in the populations. Um, I don't know there's an awful lot we can do. You can't catch wild seals and dose them to get rid of worms, but mm. um, I think if you can understand the sort of where the source populations are that are sort of getting and transmitting it, that might help to, to go into some sort of conservation measures. And the other thing with respect to seals would really be the fisheries interactions. Um, we do know that juvenile seals in particular are much more likely to be by caught in <laughs> fisheries. And there's some emerging evidence that one of the contributing factors to this might even just be water turbidity. So, you know, when the water's very turbid, the animals can't see the net and they're much more likely to get caught in it. So that means that we can, instead of stopping fishing and stopping the sort of unsustainable bycatch levels, you know, we could do something to maybe improve the visibility of nets, lights, or uh, um, you know, deterrent devices on those nets to change the fishing practice rather than get rid of it entirely um, to, to reduce things like bycatch, which might also have the reciprocal benefit of, of reducing the amount of depredation of, of nets. So this is when seals essentially steal fish from the nets um, and you know, either cause damage to the catch or the nets themselves. Um, and there's quite a, a large economic hit to the industry on that. So if you can get rid of the, the bycatch because depredation seems to be somewhat intertwined with that, you might actually have a, a benefit to the fishery that way as well. Okay, just a quick one there. Seal pups treated for worm burden on arrival at the rehab, would this have impacted on their ability to build a natural tolerance? Quick question. Yeah, good question. 
we don't really know um, if it's suspected that the animals are you know, suffering from something like a lung limb infection, they are dosed at the, at the center. Um, they are dosed before they're released back into the wild. So you know, this is essentially like you would deworm your dog or your cat. You know, it it kind of kills what's there at the moment, but doesn't stop you getting reinfected later on. So you know, we know that at the time of release, they're probably free of the parasites and they're picking it up probably very soon after they've been released. So I'm you know, trying to understand that. I don't know how you go about it yet. So I think we need to chat to a few vets. Okay, need more data. Um, skate and basking shark, who wants to jump in? Do you want to go first, John? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think it's quite an exciting time. I think we've been trying to bash a square peg into it into a round hole for a long time that, you know, we can go, there's a rainforest, that's a coral reef, that's a so-and-so, and apply the same logic to something that has transoceanic movements and, and the word marine protected area is a good word but it, it can also mean many many different things so i think it's 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 good to take our time it's good to grow up a little bit and to try and think about how we can make it a bit more adaptive a bit more real time a little bit less static because we're about to protect a huge wave of the ocean and we have to make it meaningful i think a simple step we could do quickly during that process is to have codes of conduct for activity around basking sharks sort of consolidated and also lined up Scotland and North and the Republic. So, so we're all doing, you know, it's not like, oh, you can do that, but you can't there. Mm. That would be a nice sensible step and then some proper stakeholder engagement because I think we could make it a real poster girl, poster boy species of how you can manage human activities and animals. They don't face huge risks in the areas. They, they, if, if, if they were around the port of Belfast or the port of Dublin, it'd be a different story, but they tend to inhabit the wild places. So it's more a case of keeping a good thing good mm. um, would be my take on it. Patrick? The skate, I, I guess, it's a critically endangered species, so that there's not a lot of them left, but the drivers that led to the species being critically endangered overfishing, uh, the fact that it's vulnerable to fisheries at all life stages, from the egg, which is about that size, to the hatchlings, which are that size, to the adults, which are 100 kgs. These are also features that make them very amenable to conservation. They have egg-laying sites. We can preserve them. We know from the work that's happened in Scotland and in Clue Bay that they do have some residency, so there's areas where we can protect. Because of the very large size of these animals, I guess the biggest point of conflict is how they interact with fisheries. But also, even with the interaction of fisheries, if we can understand that, we can begin to manage it. We can, we can, we can either modify some fishing gear, which is easier, you know, it's probably not as easy said than done, but we can begin to understand where these conflicts occur, uh, either if it's affecting the juveniles or the adults. So, you know, moving forward, I think it's very positive. We now know massively more about this species than we knew four years ago. Um, and, you know, our, our, our ability to conserve the animal is being greatly strengthened by the information we got from this project. So, yeah. Final thought from Oliver and Liz on the policy government side. Um, politics being politics and somewhat out, out of our control. Um, we're talking about highly mobile species crossing man-made borders and jurisdictions. Um, what are your thoughts on the state of play in terms of how they're managed in that context? Are you optimistic? Do you see more challenges and opportunities or vice versa? Very open-ended question, but given the nature of this project and the challenges it faced because of those things, you know, the species don't know the borders when they cross them and how they're protected. So what do you see the trajectory going forward? I, I might, I might <laughs> don't jump at taking that one. But. I'll, I'll get you off the hook, Liz. Well, I'm happy to answer as well. To so, um, <clears throat> so I think, I think um, what Patrick said there at the end, I think, is the starting point for me. Um, <clears throat> we are, we do know a lot more thanks mm -hmm. to the Sea Monitor project and the other two um, Interreg 5A projects as well than we did four to six years ago. And I think we've got to build on, um, build on those through Peace Plus, for example, um, and other, other other funding streams like Horizon. Um, we've got to start to fill more of the gaps. There are lots and lots of gaps, obviously, and there's lots of variability. It is the marine environment, after all. I think the way forward, I think from, from where we are, at least in relation to um, policy, marine environmental policy, at least, um, I think 
we don't make enough use out of, out of OSPAR. Um, I say that now because I'm maybe a little bit biased. I'm, I'm the head of delegation for Ireland at OSPAR, but OSPAR is a mechanism by which we can really work very well with the UK, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, and, and we are talking about that sort of a regional approach here. Um, that's, been, that's been part of all of this work. So I think OSPAR could be used as a mechanism um, to, deliver, to, to deliver good science and deliver good policy decisions and good conservation measures for some of the species we're talking about. Um, and there is an OSPAR list, of course, as well. So there are mechanisms and ways of, of getting action to happen on a transboundary basis through OSPAR. Second thing I would say is that um, marine protected areas can, can really deliver quite a lot for us. And, I, and when I say us, I mean not just the scientific community or the policy community um, or the species or habitats, but also for people. Mm. Um, so what we're trying to do, um, at least south of the borders, is, is deliver um, a sort of an array of different types of marine protected areas once, once we get the law in place. And we see people, and that includes fishers, um, as being very much at the centre of the delivery of, of that array of marine protected areas. So I think um, if we're thinking about conservation measures around fishing, for example, I think we need to put fishers at the centre of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any, at least any fisherman I've ever met um, you know, is, is delighted about by catching things that he doesn't want in, in his net or her net. Um, and I think we need to move, move the conversation and the narrative away from, you know, all fishing is bad, all fishermen or fisherwomen are, are bad and they're destroying the environment. I think we need to move them into the space where how can we work together with, with the industry to come up with better solutions, um, to have much more effective monitoring of, of bycatch and, and not feel that it's an us and them scenario. So um, I think they're the two key points I would, I would make around this. And I think, I think if we do design integration and collaboration into the, into the uh, action as we take it forward, mm. then we're, we're much more likely to deliver a success at the end of the day, you know. Liz? So um, I think it's key that we build on the legacy of the Sea Monitor project. You know, there are going to be a lot of challenges ahead. The elephant in the room is climate change. You know, the impacts from that alone, Joanne's talked about offshore renewables, we have targets we have to meet. You know, we have to put some sort of turbines in the water. Those are going to have impacts on marine mammals, but also fishing, because we're going to see squeeze. Uh, industry is going to be, you know, moved out of those areas. So there's going to be ongoing competition with uh, the main predators in the sea. But then also with climate change, we're going to see movement of prey species. So there's a lot of different things that are a play. And then in terms of seals, you know, we mentioned that um, harbour seals are sort of they're in decline. So in particular for us, uh, Strangford Lock, it's a designated site for them, but they're in unfavourable condition. We don't know why. Is that to do with disturbance? Mm. That's something that we have to look at. So th there's so many different things that they all knit together that we don't have the answers for, but we have the opportunity to explore further. And then what Oliver was saying in terms of really building up the knowledge and awareness of our marine protected areas, it's very easy for the people in the room to you know, be advocates of this because we work with it, we see the video footage, we know what's there, but for the general public, it's below the water, it means nothing to them. So we really have a job to raise that profile so that people can start to say, this is what we want to protect, you know, and these are the reasons for it. So it's really exciting, you know, as Oliver mentioned, Peace Plus, you know, there's opportunities there. There's the key themes that we have to look at and explore, and that's really something that we need to, you know, move forward further with. Okay. Lots of food for thought there. Thank you very much to the panelists. And speaking of food, we are um, running a bit late for lunch, so unless uh, we have to break now, I can't take any more questions because we're all starving. So uh, before our food gets any colder, uh, we'll break now, and we're going to need to try and be back as close to two as possible. So um, lunch is being served out in the hall, is that correct? Yes? Outside? So enjoy a bit of lunch, and thanks to the panelists. And we'll see you back here for salmon.
Natasha and welcome to QB Conservation, your lockdown lowdown on new ecology research. In this series, we challenged biologists at Queen's to tell us about exciting new research in just a few minutes. So my name's John Houghton and I am a senior lecturer, that's associate professor for those outside the kind of UK in marine biology at Queen's University Belfast. What is the Sea Monitor Basking Shark project? Sea Monitor Basking Shark project is tr trying to find a way where we can yeah. think collectively about basking shark conservation in our little corner of the world, which contains Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and because the animals are so fast moving and they move so freely between these different territorial waters, we want to kind of join up our thinking and come up with a really good collective response, how we can manage and conserve them. If you're going to bring it into the context of sort of protected areas or conservation measures, you need to be able to know what the animals are doing over a longer period of time, which is where the monitoring comes on. So if we designate a particular area or we consider a particular area important, how do we substantiate important and how do we know it stays kind of a hotspot for that species? Why are basking sharks particularly important in this area? Conservation of basking sharks in this region is, is really important, I guess, because there's good numbers of basking sharks around our region. Um, but we're going back a century. They were viewed more pragmatically as a resource, almost as a fisheries catch. Um, and yeah, their numbers did drop. So the efforts now are to really make sure that they are on their way back and to make sure we can remove any obstacles to that recovery. Do you have hope for the future of basking shark conservation? I think it's really quite hopeful. I mean, we're in a fantastic technological age. Technology doesn't make you smart, but it does enable you to actually ask and try and draw in some of the information on some previously impossible questions. I think there's a lot of good people in this game. A lot of people are talking to each other. There's a real kind of momentum for everyone working together towards a common goal. So yeah, I say I'm hopeful. My name is Ross O'Neill, I'm with the Marine Institute. Uh, my role is to look after the autonomous underwater vehicle, otherwise known as the glider. Um, my name is Catherine Waters, um, I'm a scientific and technol technical officer in the Marine Institute based in Newport. Um, predominantly I've been involved with the acoustic tagging of um, Atlantic salmon. And we've also supported Queen's University Belfast with the tagging of basking shark and flappiscate. Uh, so the glider is essentially an underwater robotic torpedo that can be programmed to travel to various locations within the ocean uh, and while travelling it records uh, environmental data such as water temperature and salinity but also has the capability to listen out for any uh, dolphins or whales in the area and also any fish animals or other animals that might be tagged with acoustic tags and it uh, detects them and then we can tell essentially where these fish uh, or animals are at a given time. And so the Sea Monitor project that we've both been working on has really fitted into to our institute really well. Um, it's been a really innovative project. Um, my role uh, acoustically tagging, tagging Atlantic salmon, um, releasing them from our uh, Burr Shul facility um, out in Newport um, and basically tracking uh, the Atlantic salmon through uh, uh, the inshore waters through Clue Bay, uh, uh, Clare Island and Ackle um, and basically monitoring their migration pathways, uh, the timings and the speed that it takes them to get out into the marine environment. So in, in this project we've been able to track um, our salmon further than we ever have before in the marine environment and uh, Ross uh, has been operating the glider can go into that a bit more. Yeah so typically with acoustic tagging uh, you're limited to uh, areas close to where your acoustic receivers are which are usually in coastal waters just for ease of access. So once these fish move beyond these uh, ranges where they can be picked up uh, they kind of go out into the unknown, into the open ocean uh, and this is a, a huge problem for uh, understanding salmon migration. So using the robotic glider we were able to deploy it up along the shelf edge which is a, a kind of area of water where the depth goes from about 200 metres down to over a kilometre quite quickly. Um, as a result there, there's a current that flows very fast um, coming up from the Bay of Biscay all the way up to Norway where we believe the salmon use this current as a kind of a motorway to, to get up to feeding grounds there. 
Uh, the glider was deployed three times uh, on a, uh, a mission uh, up in that neck of the woods, uh, kind of uh, northwest of Scotland, northwest of the Hebrides. And what we were able to identify was the detection of uh, four separate salmon smolts. Um, um, and as Kat mentioned, um, the furthest in Europe from their spawning rivers uh, at over 600 kilometres, um, which was one that we ta Catherine tagged on the west coast of Ireland and was picked all the way up off the north of Scotland. The really great thing about the Sea Monitor project is it's such a collaborative project. There are multiple partners from Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and we've all been working together now for a few years, so we've got some really strong collaborative bonds. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been working with Queen's University Belfast um, on the basking shark and the flapper skate. Um, and we've been actually been tagging those individuals for them. And e e very little is known about those animals. They're really sensitive species. Um, so anything that we can do, um, any information we can give is new and is novel. Um, so it's been really great to work with all different partners in the different jurisdictions because as you know like the animals we've been working on they don't know any borders um, or jurisdictions so um, yeah it's been really great to be able to track them further than we ever have before up the west coast of Ireland and Scotland. Um, as we, I suppose as we go into the future the work that has been undertaken by the Sea Monitor project uh, lays the foundation for a better understanding of how climate change is impacting uh, the ocean, not only uh, physical oceanography, but also on the animals that live there. Um, the animals, you know, that, that move and migrate and feed and l completely live in the ocean, they're the best indicators of change in the ocean. So by understanding how their natural behaviour is changing, we can understand what's actually going on in the ocean. And yep, and hopefully we can build on sea monitor now and into the future. Exactly. A unique marine research project was launched in April 2019. Sea Monitor is aiming to help address some of the issues facing our ocean life and our regional waters. To introduce this, so I guess at the core of it, the, kind of the original thinking of it, there's a strong sort of salmon heart to the project, which is the reason for looking at that offshore movement of salmon and looking at that kind of survivorship out in the open water areas. That's the original idea expanded very rapidly so to include basking sharks, to include skate, to include porpoise, to include the seals. Delivered on an unprecedented scale, this is Europe's largest marine life tracking project. A variety of species are tagged with transmitters, sending out a range of information, including location and depth, with the data recorded as they pass a line of underwater receivers, called an array. The information will help us better understand and protect some of the most vulnerable species in our seas. In March 2020, the Marine Institute's research vessel, Celtic Voyager, was commissioned to deploy the line of underwater receivers which make up the array. Using the latest in GPS and acoustic telemetry technology, these receivers will stretch from Mallon Head in Ireland to Isla in Scotland. With the data collected, tracks and models will be generated to better understand species and the pressures they face. Ox Agency and an international consortium of partners. Together, we will produce marine spatial models for each species. Working collaboratively with a variety of stakeholders and our sister projects. For the first time, marine management plans will be developed for Atlantic salmon in the Foyle and Clyde River systems. To learn more, please visit our website, follow us on Twitter, 
and subscribe to our joint easy. Research on cetaceans is important for many reasons. First off, or to protect them as species, but also to protect the whole marine environment. The main objective um, of GMIT's involvement in sea monitor is to carry out the acoustic monitoring. So we are looking at cetacean occurrence. It also allows us to identify threats that could, you know, in the long term, have huge issues for these animals. So by doing this research, then we're able to look at best practices for the conservation of the species. And we're using acoustics because it can allow us to monitor for a very long period of time. And also cetaceans are kind, kind of hard to see. Like first, we only see them when they come to the surface. And then you need very calm sea condition, which doesn't happen every day. So the acoustic is really interesting for us. We can leave the hydrophone in the water for months at a time. And then when we get them back, we get detections. Uh, it works pretty well with cetaceans because they are very vocal species. They, they use sound for navigation, foraging, communication. How can we tell which species it is when we are recording uh, with the hydrophone? Some cetaceans have a signature um, and then the patterns in their call can help us determine the species. The main cetacean species that we um, think that we're going to get is harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, wristles dolphins if they were in the area. We can target baleen whales as well. We set up a collaboration with two other projects, MARPAM and Compass. So we conducted land-based surveys and then based on this we can compute where the animal was and the idea is getting a detection range for the hydrophones. I think what's interesting with this project is also that it shows that conservation efforts needs to be um, needs to be carried out like in collaboration. Like for example, cetacean, they are very mobile creatures and they don't know our borders. So I think this project really shows that we need to work together uh, if we want to make things happen.
Hello, I'm Tasha and welcome to QB Conservation, your lockdown lowdown on new ecology research. In this series, we challenged biologists at Queen's to tell us about exciting new research in just a few minutes. So my name's John Houghton and I'm a senior lecturer, that's associate professor, for those outside the kind of UK in marine biology at Queen's University of Belfast. What is the Sea Monitor Basking Shark project? Sea Monitor the Basking Shark Project is trying to find a way where we can think collectively about basking shark conservation in our little corner of the world, which contains Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and because the animals are so fast moving and they move so freely between these different territorial waters, we want to kind of join up our thinking and come up with a really good collective response, how we can manage and conserve them. If you're going to bring it into the context of sort of protected areas or conservation measures, you need to be able to know what the animals are doing over longer period of time, which is where the monitoring comes on. So if we designate a particular area or we consider a particular area important, how do we substantiate important and how do we know it stays kind of a hot spot for that species? Why are basking sharks particularly important in this area? Conservation of basking sharks in this region is, is really important, I guess, because there's good numbers of basking sharks around our region, um, but we're going back a century. They were viewed more pragmatically as a resource, almost as a fisheries catch, um, and yeah, their numbers did drop. So the efforts now are to really make sure that they are on their way back and to make sure we can remove any obstacles to that recovery. Do you have hope for the future of basking shark conservation? I think it's really quite hopeful. I mean, we're in a fantastic technological age. Technology doesn't make you smart, but it does enable you to actually ask and try and join some of the information on some previously impossible questions. I think there's a lot of good people in this game. A lot of people are talking to each other. There's a real kind of momentum for everyone working together towards a common goal. So yeah, I say I'm hopeful. My name is Ross O'Neill. I'm with the Marine Institute. Uh, my role is to look after the autonomous underwater vehicle, otherwise known as the glider. Um, my name is Catherine Waters. Um, I'm a scientific and techn technical officer in the Marine Institute based in Newport. Um, predominantly I've been involved with the acoustic tagging of um, Atlantic salmon. We've also supported Queen's University Belfast with the tagging of basking shark and flapperscape. Uh, so the glider is essentially an underwater robotic torpedo that can be programmed to travel to various locations within the ocean uh, and while travelling it records uh, environmental data such as water temperature and salinity but also has the capability to listen out for any uh, dolphins or whales in the area and also any fish animals or other animals that might be tagged with acoustic tags and it uh, detects them and then we can tell essentially where these fish uh, or animals are at a given time. And so the Sea Monitor project that we've both been working on has really fitted into to our institute really well. Um, it's been a really innovative project. Um, my role uh, acoustically tangy, tagging Atlantic salmon, um, releasing them from our uh, Borough Shul facility um, out in Newport, um, and basically tracking uh, the Atlantic salmon through uh, uh, the inshore waters through Clue Bay, uh, uh, Clare Island and Ackle. Um, and basically monitoring their migration pathways, uh, the timings and the speed that it takes them to get out into the marine environment. So in, in this project we've been able to track um, our salmon further than we ever have before in the marine environment and uh, Ross uh, has been operating the glider, can go into that a bit more. Yeah, so typically with acoustic tagging uh, you're limited to uh, areas close to where your acoustic receivers are which are usually in coastal waters just for ease of access so once these fish move beyond these uh, ranges where they can be picked up uh, they kind of go out into the unknown into the open ocean uh, and this is a, a huge problem for uh, understanding salmon migration so using the robotic glider we were able to deploy it up along the shelf edge which is a kind of area of water where the depth goes from about 200 metres down to over a kilometre quite quickly. Um, as a result, there, there's a current that flows very fast um, coming up from the Bay of Biscay all the way up to Norway, where we believe the salmon use this current as a kind of a motorway to, to get up to feeding grounds there. 
the glider was deployed three times uh, on a, uh, a mission uh, up in that neck of the woods, uh, kind of uh, northwest of Scotland, northwest of the Hebrides. And what we were able to identify was the detection of uh, four separate salmon smolts. Um, um, and as Kat mentioned, um, the furthest in Europe from their spawning rivers uh, at over 600 kilometres, um, which was one that we ta Catherine tagged on the west coast of Ireland and was picked all the way up off the north of Scotland. The really great thing about the Sea Monitor project is it's such a collaborative project. There are multiple partners from Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and we've all been working together now for a few years, so we've got some really strong collaborative bonds. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been working with Queen's University Belfast um, on the basking shark and the flapper skate. Um, and we've been actually been tagging those individuals for them. And e e very little is known about those animals. They're really sensitive species. Um, so anything that we can do, um, any information we give is new and is novel. Um, so it's been really great to work with all different partners in the different jurisdictions because as you know like the animals we've been working on they don't know any borders um, or jurisdictions so um, yeah it's been really great to be able to track them further than we ever had before up the west coast of Ireland and Scotland. Um, as we, I suppose as we go into the future the work that has been undertaken by the Sea Monitor project uh, lays the foundation for a better understanding of how climate change is impacting uh, the ocean, not only uh, physical oceanography, but also on the animals that live there. Um, the animals, you know, that, that move and migrate and feed and l completely live in the ocean, they are the best indicators of change in the ocean. So by understanding how their natural behaviour is changing, we can understand what's actually going on in the ocean. And yet, and hopefully we can build on sea monitor now and into the future. Exactly. A unique marine research project was launched in April 2019. Sea Monitor is aiming to help address some of the issues facing our ocean life and our regional waters. To introduce this, so I guess at the core of it, kind of the original thinking of it, there's a strong sort of salmon heart to the project, which is the reason for looking at that offshore movement of salmon and looking at that kind of survivorship out in the open water areas. That's the original idea expanded very rapidly. So to include basking sharks, to include skate, to include porpoise, to include the seals. Delivered on an unprecedented scale, okay, this is Europe's largest marine life tracking project. For the afternoon session. A variety of species are tagged with transmitters, sending out a range of information, including location and depth, with the data recorded as they pass a line of underwater receivers called an array. The information will help us better understand and protect some of the most vulnerable species in our seas. In March 2020, the Marine Institute's research vessel, Celtic Voyager, was commissioned to deploy the line of underwater receivers which make up the array. Using the latest in GPS and acoustic telemetry technology, these receivers will stretch from Mallon Head in Ireland to Isla in Scotland. With the data collected, tracks and models will be generated to better understand species and the pressures they face. Agency and an international consortium of partners. Together we will produce marine spatial models for each species. Working collaboratively with a variety of stakeholders and our sister projects. For the first time marine management plans will be developed for Atlantic salmon in the Foyle and Clyde River systems. To learn more please visit our website, follow us on Twitter, 
and subscribe to our joint easy. Research on cetaceans is important for many reasons. First off, or to protect them as species, but also to protect the whole marine environment. The main objective um, of GMIT's involvement in Sea Monitor is to carry out the acoustic monitoring. So we are looking at cetacean occurrence. It also allows us to identify threats that could, you know, in the long term, have huge issues for these animals. So by doing this research, then we're able to look at best practices for the conservation of the species. And we're using acoustics because it can allow us to monitor for a very long period of time. And also cetaceans are kind, kind of hard to see. Like first, we only see them when they come to the surface. And then you need very calm sea condition, which doesn't happen every day. So the acoustic is really interesting for us. We can leave the hydrophone in the water for months at a time. And then when we get them back, we get detections. Uh, it works pretty well with cetaceans because they are very vocal species. They, they use sound for navigation, foraging, communication. How can we tell which species it is when we are recording uh, with the hydrophone? Some cetaceans have a signature um, and then the patterns in their call can help us determine the species. The main cetacean species that we um, think that we're going to get is harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, bristles dolphins if they were in the area. We can target baleen whales as well. We set up a collaboration with two other projects, MARPAM and Compass. So we conducted land-based surveys and then based on this we can compute where the animal was and the idea is getting a detection range for the hydrophones. I think what's interesting okay, with can everybody is also make their way to the seats, please. that conservation we'll kick efforts off. needs to be um, needs to be carried out like in collaboration. You, like for example, cetacean, they are very mobile creatures and they don't know our borders. So I think this project really shows that we need to work together uh, if we want to make things happen. Once you get salmon scientists talking, it's hard to get them to stop. So this is going to be this is going to be fun. Um, I hope you had a good lunch. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Colin Adams. Um, I was told when Seamonter was being developed, at its heart, it was a salmon project that evolved into much, much more. But salmon obviously has been still at the the center, front and center of what um, the studies have been about, and. I can't speak highly enough about Dr. Adams' work and the other salmon scientists' work in this pack these packages. 
Um, Glasgow was at the forefront of the modeling exercises, as well as our data. They took in data from Atlantic Salmon Trust and other projects, um, and have done really stellar work um, across the four years. So I am going to hand it over to you now, and um, Colin will be your guide through this uh, salmon migration journey and all the data that we've, we've garnered. So I'll hand it over now to Dr. Adams. Thanks. Thank you, Ross. I hope the next session lives up to the, uh, the hype that you've just given us. Um, salmon are still polling at the top of your favorite marine species, and long may it stay that way. Um, it may change after the next four speakers, hopefully not. <laughs> so we have, we have four speakers the, the, in this uh, salmon session. Um, there was the suggestion that you all came out here and sat at the front, and everybody stared at you for an hour and a half. I'm going to take the executive decision and let you sit in the audience until I, until I shout you up, um, if that's okay. Um, I wanted to just introduce the, the salmon work very briefly, if I could. Um, yeah, so it's an iconic species. Uh, most of us in this room know how iconic it is. It's also a very high value species across um, the Interreg 5A program area. Um, you all know the basic life cycle of the Atlantic salmon, spends a bit of time in freshwater from one to seven years, depending on what part of the range it's in, and then it migrates to sea. Um, what you may be less familiar with is just how catastrophically populations have been changing over time. And this is happening not just in our part of the world, but globally. Um, the species has been declining. There's very few populations where they have maintained uh, the population size over a long period of time. The graph that you can see on the right-hand side of that slide there is uh, data from ICES, the International, uh, oh, ICES again, International Commission for the Exploration of the Sea. Thank you. And uh, these are data which don't come from catches, but from, from measurements of, of, of population sizes um, that are pre-fisheries abundance. So these are measurements of real population sizes as opposed to, to catches. And these are data for populations in the southern part of Europe, which includes is this part of the world. And these data arguably show a, a decline of around 80% over about 45 years. The species is in, is in trouble, is the, is the message I'm trying to get across here. And why is the species in trouble? Well, it's, uh, there are a whole bunch of, of potential pressures on this species. Some have been around for a long time. So predation, for example, has been around since salmon have been around. Some of those pressures, however, are relatively newer. Fisheries has been around a long time, but fisheries has changed over the decades. Aquaculture is a relatively new pressure that's only been around for 40 years, thereabouts, in, in this part of the world. And of course, the, there's the elephant in the room, as someone mentioned earlier on, climate change. We're only just starting to get to grips with how climate change might be impacting on, on salmon populations. And there's been several mentions in several talks already on our, our collective commitment across Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and elsewhere uh, across Europe uh, 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 in terms of reducing our carbon footprint by using marine renewables. And that opens up a whole panoply of potential pressures on Atlantic salmon, most of which we, we don't really understand yet, but we do need to get to grips with that soon. So we have big knowledge gaps uh, in terms of our understanding of Atlantic salmon uh, and, uh, and particularly our interaction as humans with uh, Atlantic salmon. Um, our understanding of Atlantic salmon is, is much better in freshwater systems than it is in, in marine waters for all sorts of obvious logistical reasons. It's much more difficult to work in marine systems. It's much easier to get handles on all sorts of things that relate to the ecology of Atlantic salmon when they're living in streams and rivers, because we can get into those rivers and we can, we can pick up the fish and we can track the fish and we can tag them easily and we can do all sorts of things that is much, much more difficult to do at sea. And yet, from what we know about the decline in our populations, 
All the evidence is pointing to changes that are happening at sea that are having the biggest impact on our populations. And that's, of course, where Sea Monitor comes in. So Sea Monitor, of course, it's been mentioned several times, uh, a, a project which runs over three jurisdictions, each of which has uh, a chunk of shared sea. So we have shared seas, we have shared resources, um, and that means, uh, and particularly in this case for Atlantic salmon, we have shared problems, and we hope that Sea Monitor is starting to lead us towards shared answers to those shared problems. So in relation to Atlantic salmon, uh, what kinds of questions have we been trying to address in Sea Monitor? Well, we want to know where, where our salmon go. Are they passing through all, all three jurisdictions as they migrate out to sea? We know they're going uh, out to sea and up to either West Greenland or uh, the Norwegian Sea to feed when they're at sea, so they must through the, pass through our coastal zones. Um, and if they do, what is their migration success as they're passing through these coastal zones? And ultimately, that this then leads us to a position where we may be able to disentangle the, the human effects, what we're doing in our coastal zones, uh, uh, disentangle those effects on Atlantic salmon populations from the, the natural um, loss rates during migration of Atlantic salmon. So how do we do that? Well, we've been uh, doing some telemetry, we've been tracking, tracking salmon at, at sea. James gave a, a really nice description of, of acoustic telemetry, and we're using exactly the same kinds of technologies. But I should say, there's an enormous difference in the tag sizes that we can use. James was talking about tag size, tags which are large, large batteries that will run for 10 years. We would love to be able to do that kind of thing with small Atlantic salmon as they migrate to sea, but we can't because the tag size would be far too large. So we, uh, we attach small transmitters, small acoustic transmitters that are about, usually about 11 or 12 millimeters long. And of course, they are detected by acoustic detectors as the fish pass those acoustic detectors. We have to capture fish, and, and, and mostly in the Sea Monitor project, we've been catching smolts, that's the life stage that's um, migrating to sea for the very first time. We use a number of trap types and sometimes using, using active, active capture through nets as well. Uh, we tag the fish and mostly the tags have been uh, uh, attached to the fish by intra-abdominal um, placement of the tag. And Sea Monitor, as we've already mentioned several times, an exceedingly ambitious program of work across a whole bunch of species, and that is also true of the Atlantic salmon. Uh, we aimed to uh, tag Atlantic salmon as they're migrating to sea in four study areas, in fact, in, in six rivers initially. Um, so in the bush catchment, the Burrishul catchment, the foil catchment, and, and the Clyde catchment. And in, in foil and, and uh, Clyde, uh, we tagged in, in two separate rivers running into those catchments. And uh, as we've already seen, um, we put out receivers at various points at which we can audit the passage of fish, which tells us something about the direction they're taking and something about their success of migration. Um, so we had coastal receivers in Clue Bay, already mentioned, round Loch Foyle, Run Kerry Bay, and, and throughout the Firth of Clyde. Um, but also important are the offshore um, receivers. The biggest receiver line running from Malin Head to Isla was, uh, was the Jewel in the Crown, of course. Um, but we also, through the Marine Institute, ran an AUV, a uh, submersible vehicle, which allowed us to detect right on the edge of the continental shelf. We're going to hear more about that from my colleagues in, in a minute. So that was the general pattern of what we set out to do with Sea Monitor. I'm really pleased to say that we've actually been able to do so much more than that, and we've been able to do that by an enormous amount of collaboration which has built over the last four years. So there's been a whole bunch of other projects that either independently of Sea Monitor, or in some cases, uh, at least four of the projects have been inspired by Sea Monitor to get involved in, in uh, tagging Atlantic salmon in their particular catchments, and, to, uh, and we've been able to track those, those, those fish uh, out to sea using 
uh, using sea monitor facilities. Um, so in the audience, we have um, um, people from the Atlantic Salmon Trust who were involved in setting up a, a, a big project of tagging and detection of fish at sea up and down the west coast. So I'm not going to explain all of this to you, but every single one of these stars represents a site where we've, uh, one of the projects that's been associated with Sea Monitor has tagged fish, um, and the red dots are uh, receivers um, for the Atlantic Salmon Trust project, the blue ones are for Sea Monitor, um, our partner, Interreg 5A partner Compass project uh, had marine receivers out, uh, at least the, at the beginning of Sea Monitor, uh, and those are in orange. And the consequence of all that is that in 2021, when we had the, the biggest year of collaboration, we tagged in excess of 2,000 uh, salmonids across all of these projects, so not all Sea Monitor fish, of course, in 23 rivers. And we had uh, almost 400 receivers deployed in, in marine waters. That gives us enormous amount of power collectively, not just across Sea Monitor, but across all the other projects as well. We had enormous collective power to be able to start pulling apart um, pathways and, and mortality rates and migration success and a whole b bunch of other metrics which are important ultimately for, for us being able to determine much more about what is happening to Atlantic salmon as they pass through our coastal waters and beyond. So that's all I wanted to give you by way of, of, of just an introduction to um, the project in general, at least the bit of the project that was associated with salmon. Um, I'm going to now hand over to uh, Richard. Yep, Richard Kennedy from, from AFB. Richard. Thank you, Colin, and uh, it's nice to nice to be here uh, with with you all. I'm just uh, figuring out the slides here. Yep, that's great. Okay, um, I'm Richard Kennedy. I work for AFBI, Agri Food Biosciences Institute uh, in um, Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm based at the Riverbush Salmon Station, <clears throat> and I want to give you a wee bit of. Um, a wee bit of a, a talk about some of the tagging that we've been doing at Bush Mills and how we think it's given us some further insights into the, the plight of, of marine salmon on, on the high seas. So just by way of, of background, the, the salmon station um, where, where I'm based has been ongoing for, for quite some number of years now. We were established back in 1973, so we're 50 years old this year. And uh, we'll invite you all to a birthday party maybe later on in the, in, in, in the summer. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, full census data at the station. We have traps that intercept all the smolts heading out. We also have traps that intercept all the adults coming back again. So we are in the enviable position of having really good data on the population dynamics of our stock. Um, that 50-year data set gives us a very, very good insight, and along with, with partner and sister um, uh, monitoring stations such as the Burishul, and I see my Marine Institute colleagues here, um, it's one of a network of, of stations that gives us good insight into uh, Atlantic salmon over the, 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 the North Atlantic Basin. Now, the Sea Monitor project gave us tremendous ability to add value and extend the research that we do uh, on Atlantic salmon and to delve into some of these uh, thorny issues. I want to give you a couple of graphs from our long-term monitoring project just to kind of reinforce the situation that Colin outlined, the plight that uh, Atlantic salmon actually have. So the first data here we have is our smolt run. This is the, uh, the number of smolts, uh, total run uh, from the river bush to sea over the last just, just shy of 50 years. And if you look at those data and look particularly at the dashed line, which is a rolling average through the data set, you can see that the smolt count was pretty high back in the 70s. It declined into the 1990s. And in recent times, our, our, our smolt numbers have actually picked up again towards historical levels. 
And if that was the only data you had from our river, you might, you might like to think, oh, well, that stock's doing not too bad. It was through the doldrums in the, in the 1990s, but, you know, not looking too bad now. But remember that this is a species with two distinct um, portions in the life history. It's got a freshwater component and it's got a marine component. This is the freshwater kind of production from the stock. But then look at this. These data show the return uh, of, of smolts uh, to the river bush as adults. It's marine survival. And you can see how that has plummeted from the, uh, from the 1980s, when this particular data set was, was, was commenced, through to now. And you'll see that presently, for every 100 smolts that we, we send out through our traps, we're lucky to see five back. Remember that, because uh, I'll come back to it a little bit later. So we count the smolts at our trap. Our trap's about three kilometers away from the tide. We know that we're losing fish. We're losing fish in large numbers. Uh, and those fish could be lost potentially anywhere from where we release them at our trap to where we collect them again as adults on their way home. And telemetry has given us a little bit of extra ability to start partitioning out where some of this mortality might actually be happening. And I know a lot of my salmon colleagues around, around the room here are very interested and concerned in trying to understand marine survival more fully uh, and, and, and trying to partition um, where mortality might be happening in the marine life cycle. So before Sea Monitor came along, we did some um, preliminary work using acoustic telemetry and also using little radio tags. You'll see a radio tag there with the antenna sticking out. And we found that after we released fish from, from our smoke trap, they, they, they experienced a couple of um, bottlenecks to survival even before they got into the sea properly. We noticed, for example, that at the estuary where the, where the, where the river meets the sea, that uh, fish that migrated at night tended to survive much better than those that uh, migrated through this portion of river in the daytime. And that was suggestive that there may well be a bit of, uh, a bit of predation pressure on the fish as they enter the sea. So this was kind of um, made us look a little bit more carefully at the hydromorphology of the river. We know our particular river changes from year to year, particularly in the, in, 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 in the lower end of the river. And thanks to my colleague Robert for this nice compendium of, of, uh, of photographs over the years. And really it just shows you that some years the river is nice and uh, deep and, and flows in a single channel to sea. Some years it splits, it bifurcates, and, and we get a very shallow delta which the fish have to cross on their way into, into the marine environment. And if you look really carefully, I'll try not to fall off the stage. You might just see what looks like little white dots, and you'll have to take my word for it, those are seagulls. And all those seagulls, a couple of hundred of them, are all standing in the river, pointing upstream. Those birds, we actually have observed predating salmon smolts. They mob them, they eat them, um, and it just shows you that there, there are a host of, 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 of things that um, will consume salmon. Now, Sea Monitor came along, and Sea Monitor has been a fantastic project, a fantastic project to collaborate in, and a fantastic project to, um, to, to really enhance what we've been doing at Bush Mills. We got um, an array uh, that Colin has outlined between Scotland and Ireland. So at a stroke, we were able then to look at our smolts and look at their migration from the river to the coast to the offshore environment. We were able to look at all sorts of biological um, uh, issues, uh, phenology, survival, and so forth, out to this new line. Under Sea Monitor, we also tried some new um, types of, of, of tags, well, maybe not new types of tags, but we, we, we tried different programming uh, on, on, on the tags we use to try and get into this idea of partitioning marine mortality a bit more fulsomely. So Sea Monitor, um, over the course of the, the, uh, the work program, we have tagged nearly 300 smolts on the bush. Um, those fish have uh, moved down through the river into the, into the sea and then, and then offshore. And 
added to the data that we've collected before C-Monitor, we're now starting to get into the um, nice position of developing a bit of a time series for our tag smolts. And you can see here um, different colors on the maps. So we've got a yellow line which shows the migration that fish have to take from our trap to the estuary. Uh, a dashed line showing from the estuary to the uh, inshore arrays. And then, crucially, we've got this new offshore array that takes our fish 50 kilometers off offshore to the coast. And when we look at this from year to year, we're now starting to develop um, a, a, a data, a longer term data set on survival of tag smolts in these different portions of their outward uh, journey to see uh, and beyond. And you can see within the data, the yellow is in uh, survival in the river, it corresponds to the map. A bit of variation, some years we lose considerable numbers of fish before they even get to the sea. Uh, transition from the estuary to the coast can also be a bit tricky. And for the first time now, we've got some estimates of, of, of survival out to the offshore array, thanks to the fantastic work that the, the Sea Monitor team has done, and particularly Diego. I'm just going to big Diego up an awful lot of work, very, very good work over the last few years to get us this data. It looks small, looks like a couple of points on a, a graph, but it's a lot of effort to get these. So what we ultimately want to do is be able to to look at the variability within this data and compare it to the adult return rates that we see back to the trap again. Um, there are lots of drivers for um, smolt success, for smolt survival, lots of things that influence how your smolts are going to do. We know that predator numbers may have uh, uh, may, may be influential. We know river discharge, higher flows might get the smolts out more readily. And now that we've got some, uh, some, some, some time series together and we've got some variability in the data, we can start to investigate some of these things. Interestingly, one of the things that kind of shakes out and it's given us a bit of a hint of a relationship is that the, the size of the overall smolt run, so the numbers of, of wild smolts that we have running down the river, which we measure through our, our, our trap, seems to have a positive effect on survival. There seems to be a hint of something there. And it may be no surprise that a shoaling fish like a, a, a salmon smolt might find safety in numbers. Maybe shoaling behavior, lots of fish, might, might just help survival. We've looked at a few other things. We've looked at predator numbers. We've also looked at river flow and less shaken out there. The, the flow surprised me because I was sure we would see increased survival with increased flow. But when we look back at the data, the years that we tagged fish, uh, we're all characterized by relatively low river flow, a phenomenon I, I think we're going to have to get more used to because of climate change going forward. Thanks to Jesse Lilly, uh, benefit of a collaboration is you've got lots of heads looking at different things, and Jesse at the uh, University of Glasgow sent me this nice heat map to show the directionality of our smolts as a head out to sea. I put this in to show the sort of westward trajectory of our fish uh, on their way out, they seem to pick up more towards um, the uh, Malin uh, and, and the island of Ireland rather than, rather than the Scottish mainland. So one of the other really um, interesting things that we've been doing at, at the bush, we've used acoustic tags in our smolts, but we've tried something a little bit different here. Mostly whenever you tag smolts, you'll put the little tag in, and as Colin says, a tag is limited in terms of its size, but it means it's also limited in terms of its battery life. So a standard smolt tag, you might set 30 seconds delay, 60 seconds delay, you'll get a few months duration. The tag will then die after that. You've got your smolt offshore, you've collected your data, but, but that's it. What we thought we would do would be to program the tags that we used in our smolts, to program them with a, a configuration, a preset configuration, to see if we could actually get some of those smolts back as adults the following year. That was, that was the idea. So you can see the, 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 the program that we used. We had, upon activation, 40 days of, of, of pinging. Then um, you look at the little model, you can see what it looks like in, 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 in practice. So we, we tagged fish in 2020. Uh, peak of the smolt run was on the 28th of April. So our tags were active from late April to early June, enough time to get those fish offshore. The tag then went inactive, turned off for a year. 
before reactivating again for the remainder of its, of its battery life from early June to late to, to, to mid-September. And the idea here was that if any of our fish survived, we'd get them back, pick them up, and this might give us a little bit more of an insight into survival of our fish at sea. And we don't have a huge number of results back from this, but I want to take you through uh, a bit of a model from our TAG cohort in, two, in 2020, because I think this could be a really useful uh, technique uh, go, going forward. So, keeps the statistics nice and easy. We tagged 100 fish in 2020. We got 66 of those salmon out to the estuary. So you can see the mortality rate there in, in, in yellow. 40, just under half of them at the coast, positive detections. Um, we reckon there were 26 out to the main array. I, I will say we didn't have the main array out in 2020, so I'm borrowing data from 21 and 22 to put a back estimate onto this. The great thing about the 2020 cohort is that we got some of our, uh, of our fish originally tagged as smolts back to the coast in 2021. So we got five fish that were picked up between the shore and the main array. Given the efficiency, we may have been up to nine fish potentially picked up on that main array. And from that, we, we ended up with three fish back to the river. Now, if you look at this, and just look at the number tagged and the number back to the river, and then you think back to the marine survival graph I showed you at the start, the figures are in and around, you know, the same ballpark, 3%. And the other interesting thing about this that uh, I, I want to, to show, we lost 97 tags from this cohort of 100 fish. So 97 of our fish perished. Of that, potentially 80 of these fish were lost either in the lower river or the first 50 kilometers out to sea, or the last 50 kilometers back into the river mouth. So potentially, we only lost 20 fish on the high seas proper. And th this is where I think this sort of idea can help us to differentiate potentially what's happening to our stocks out on the sea and why I think Sea Monitor has been such a, a, a tremendous boon for us. We lost some of our adult salmon on their way back to the river between the main array and, 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 the, uh, and the river bush. Interestingly, most of the salmon that we had coming back uh, turned up towards the Scottish coastline, so they seem to be coming back the opposite direction to the smolts. Some of those fish did what we thought they would do, and they turned up in the river quite uh, shortly after their detection on the main array. One of the fish uh, did something slightly different. Uh, it was picked up in the main array on the 6th of July. It then strayed, or so we thought, into the foil uh, on the 7th of, of, of July, and then later on that day was picked up on the opposite side of the main array before it disappeared. And we think that there was a, a chat earlier on about, about interaction between um, different species, and, and this may well be an interaction between different species, and we've tried to, tried to outline that um, in, 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 in a paper that was just, just recently out. Very quickly, um, just to, to, to say a couple, couple of slides worth, um, we also did some work on sea trout, and Diego will follow me up on this, hopefully, in his presentation. With all these coastal receivers out, um, uh, <laughs> it seemed to make sense to, to, to look at some coastal species as well and get some benefits, some added science from, the, uh, from resources that had already been put out. And in 2020, we collaborated with uh, LOX agency within Sea Monitor, and we tagged lots of sea trout. Uh, Diego tag, tagged some in the, in the foil. I tagged some over in the glens of Antrim. And we wanted to look at all sorts of the, the biological um, issues, distribution, return rates, migration, um, finnick behavior, and whatnot. And this was a fantastic supplementary project that I think added great value. And uh, as I say, we tagged in the Ballycastle River. We got a fantastic distribution of our fish 
picked up on receivers along the uh, entire coastline around, um, around the area. Um, and thanks to Queen's for, 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 for detections from their skate array out at the Maidens. You can see a couple of our fish turned up there. So some really useful supplementary data from, uh, from, from, from some of these projects. And we're able to sort of dig into this and get really ni quite nice uh, data on individual fish, where they've turned up, where they've been. And uh, this is an example of a sea trout that was tagged in the Glen Arm River and returned as a finnick. So it's just, just really to mention that uh, Sea Monitor, uh, in terms of the salmonid work, has included salmon, but we've also done a little bit on sea trout as well. Um, that's my time up. Um, I have far too many people to thank. Um, it's been a real pleasure and a joy working on this project with lots of different people. I have appreciated the, um, the, uh, the um, collaboration and uh, hopefully the start of many more things to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Richard. Uh, you're probably buzzing with uh, potential questions. Um, if you are, now's the time to get online and um, put the questions in online, because there will be a session after the uh, break for coffee uh, where you'll get a chance to ask questions of all the speakers for this session. So we'll just move straight on to uh, the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Diego Del Villar. Diego. Uh, is going to be speaking on um, the part of the salmon work that has been done by the Lox Agency in Loch Foyle. Diego. Thank you, Colin, and hi, everyone. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about Atlantic salmon and sea trout. They are called, they are diadromous species species, and this is a fancy term to, to refer to, to a migration to the sea where they, they, mature, they, they eat and they mature before returning to fresh water. Um, the Logs Agency has a long history uh, protecting and, and preserving um, uh, salmonids in the foil and Carlingford catchments. And the, the, the agency has continuously uh, carried out a um, lot of work in terms of uh, analyzing the population dynamics and at different uh, audit points, like uh, we have a small traps, catch returns, fish counters, red counts, electrofishing, habitat surveys, and so on. As the technology evolves, the Logs Agency is incorporating novel technologies like telemetry to actually have a better grip on what is happening with our stocks of fish. So what, what have we learned? Uh, Colin mentioned it before. He was talking about a global decline of salmonic stocks. And this not only applied to Atlantic salmon, but sea trout stocks are also declining. And this is uh, based on return catches. This is just what anglers could see. Every day they could see less and less fish. We have more audited points, more snapshots that indicate the same decline. And before Sea Monitor, we actually, there was a key question that we didn't know. Where our fish, where, where is the fish, where the fish are gone? Where do the fish go at sea? And before there was, before Sea Monitor, before uh, having a tool before telemetry was difficult to carry out any research at the marine. But now with Sea Monitor has allowed us to, to, to have a technology that can actually answer crucial questions for management. So Sea Monitor for the Logs Agency has been a research program with very important management applications. So we use acoustic telemetry uh, in different parts of, of the foil catchment. We have receivers at the mouth of the River Fahan and the River Row, along the main navigational channel in the, in the foil, at the exit uh, of the foil for the sea, and then we have the, the famous main array. So this kind of configuration allow us to actually know how many fish escape or transit through different environments. And, and just to, 
to, to repeat what other people have said, this, these are very dangerous waters, and we have three different jurisdictions, so it has a lot of uh, research questions, but ma management implications in this work. So in, in this program, we have captured uh, smolts using, using a rotatory screw trap connected to some hydro dams, and we, we tag our fish by the riverbanks, we, we, we used gravity to, to actually supply free flow of fresh water all the time. I mean, we, we use the uh, best techniques possible, possible for house boundary of the fish, so we minimize any possible impacts of the tagging. And we, over the, the course of two years, uh, 2020, uh, the tagging was stopped due to COVID. But in 21 and 22, we, we tag a, a large number of, of, of fish, uh, enough to actually make uh, robust scientific conclusions. So as I was talking before, we are going to compare two similar species in the, uh, because they both need to go to the sea. But actually, the, the results differ from these two species. So, this is the, the results I'm going to present here is the average of two years of tagging. So in these two years of tagging, we had that 40% of the fish that we tagged were detected in the main array, okay? So that has been for us very useful gate to have to actually ask the question where the other 60% went. Where are the losses? So we observed that the lower river and estuary, there was a large proportion of our fish being gone there already. And this continued uh, at the exit of the estuary between McGilligan and Greencastle. We, all, we also uh, lost 14% of, of the fish. 15% of the fish were lost in, in the open uh, oceans as they migrated to, 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 the, to the main array, but never made it to the main array. So it is actually very important information to have now to focus our management actions where most matter, which is in the lower river and estuaries. So overall conclusions is high survival in the marine, low in the lower river and estuaries. So, Sorry, I didn't change the graph. Now we are gonna talk about trout, both salmonids. Are, that, are we gonna get similar results? They're both salmonids. So only 15% of the fish were detected in the main array. Again, where are the losses? 6% were lost at the lower river and estuary. 9% at the exit of the estuary for the open sea and 13% at the marine. So we actually have, well, sorry, the question is, there are still 57 unknown. Where the other fish that we, we cannot account, where did they go? And that's something I, I will answer in, in my last slide. So we have opposite results to what we got with salmon. We have high survival of sea trout in the lower reaches of the river and at the estuary and the exit of the estuary, and similar survival rates at the marine, which really opens many questions. Should we use similar approaches or should we use different approaches for, for management? In relation to the speed of migration, salmon, it's, uh, Atlantic salmon really um, migrate quite fast compared to what sea trout did. Uh, the majority of the fish exited the, the foil estuary within one to three days. And the time for a fish to reach the main array, the average time is, it was about 1.5 day. If you divide that by the body length, it's quite, like, it's quite fast movements uh, for a small fish to, to reach the array at that, at that that time. Um, for trout, we, we observe different behaviors. They stay more in, in the estuary, even though it might have been 
perceived as more risky a strategy, they had better survival by staying more, which is kind of surprising. And then the time for, for a fish to reach the distant array, the main array, it was longer than, than, than for salmon. What about uh, the time of migration? When did Atlantic salmon migrate? We, we see that the, there are different behaviors in the different environments that we study. In the lower river and estuary, uh, migrations could be considered like nocturnal, uh, from eight in the afternoon to, well, maybe it's not that nocturnal, but 10 in the, in the morning. Uh, Richard was saying that the fish that would migrate at nighttime will have better uh, probabilities of survival, but basically any, any time was also possible. I haven't filtered the data. This is just pure raw data there. Uh, the early marine uh, is when the fish exit the foil for the open sea. It seems that there's not, the, still fish will migrate at any time, but there particularly, there, there are two peaks there, maybe related with tides, maybe related with favorable conditions for migration. So, and in the distant marine for, for, for Atlantic salmon, it seems to me that the range of times that they can arrive there uh, varies. It's quite, I, I wouldn't call it like predominantly nocturnal, but yeah, there's more, more variation in the marine. They can arrive at, at that area at any time. In comparison, so just plotting sea trout uh, close to the uh, Atlantic salmon results, we see different, different behaviors there. Yes, nocturnal could be a thing in the early marine, maybe the distant marine when they arrive to there, but it seems, I cannot explain what they were doing, it seems that they have different behaviors and that's what it matters. Maybe that that's also reflecting in their higher survival in the stories. So where salmon detections happen uh, from the fish that we, we tag in the Fahan, yeah, the majority of them uh, cluster near Manly Head, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. So Malin Head is in the south and Isla, Scotland in the north. And they, they, the, the orange part is the bathymetry of the area. The deepest uh, purple is about 112 meters and the more orangey is between 20 to 30 meters, maybe 50 meters uh, in, the, in the deepest area in, in where the, the, the salmon detections happen. If you see the green area there, this is the 12 nautical miles uh, in which the logs agency has a, a remit over salmon, it's a remit for protection. So the, 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 the scale of the movement and, and is, 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 is just, um, it, to cover those areas for, for management is quite difficult for a small organization. What, what, I, what I try to say, if all the fish migrate there, we, we, might, we, we might need more resources than we did previously in fresh water. And having this clear evidence that the fish use highly utilized those areas and the fish have um, the survival at marine is compromised. We we might need to focus some resources in these in these areas for the future to come. Uh, why this uh, could be happening? This is a still uh, a question that I, I'm trying to answer. Uh, a possible explanation would be that the fish did not utilize the deepest part uh, towards Scotland. It is because uh, there are low speed or low uh, moving waters so it might not be beneficial for their migration just to remember people when juveniles migrate from from the rivers they need to start uh, feeding quite soon because they are energetically very depleted uh, an exp a potential explanation is it will make sense if they use the green parts uh, where it's higher speed waters to to migrate and in the future in future collaborations, I will try to combine hydrodynamic models in the areas with fish movements 
and I can probably help to answer this question. In relation to sea trout, where the main detections happen? So actually, they happen in, in the central part of the, of the array. Two different behaviors, though. We have uh, a trout individual that, well, the different colors are the different domains or the different areas, so lower river, estuary, and a main array. So if you look at the yellow dots, it's kind of linear. It goes from one station to the other, but kind of it seems that there is a trajectory towards maybe a feeding ground, while uh, the other example there, it gets more blur. What, what are we observing? A trout that migrated out from the rivers to the foil, exited the estuary, reached the main array, but then after, what happened there? Is that trout behavior could be a potential predator, and unfortunately, uh, that's one of the limitations of the methods that we have. Uh, we are using uh, present absence. Uh, there's new sensors that incorporate temperature, and something like uh, Cather Catherine Waters is, is going to talk in her presentation that is going to help answering some of the po pro potential pred predation events. But there is a lot of validation here uh, still to be, to be made to actually typify behaviors in the marine. Um, a bonus collaboration. Um, the C Monitor has been a, a very like collaborative project, and and that has allowed us to answer questions that we couldn't answer with this single project. And I'm so glad I I, I work uh, with Richard Kennedy in in AFP in this uh, sea trout project because it helps securing tags uh, for a, 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 a parallel experiment where we we tag um, uh, sea trout smolts as they migrated out from the river Fahan. And we learned, that, uh, we, we were able to detect salmon beyond uh, our uh, array. We, we detected uh, salmon in, in, the, in, in the mouth of the river Ban, 12. And that, that, that was something not surprising, but the most surprising part is that six of them entered fresh water. Yes, few days after they were tagged, and five of them even migrate farther in. But in the end, there were like few, the, the, in the end, every fish that entered exited, and they were detected in the scaries in Port Rush. So this is like a, a theoretical uh, track where you have sea trout entering other rivers, Maybe, I don't know what they were doing there, maybe it's a, a question for research, but exiting the, the, the rivers and, and, and going along the coast. So that can potentially answer the question where the 57% of the trout that were not detected gone, maybe they're going to be more coastal orientated. So if this is the case, maybe we need uh, even further strength our collaborations for management um, we, we cannot obvious these movements because we will need to collaborate with AFP in terms of better protection of, of, of sea trout, and that's what we learned with the project. Similarly, in other rivers, the River Row, uh, we tag 26 uh, sea, uh, sea trout smolts, and 10 made it to the river, and then a, again 10 uh, were detected in, in, in the scary, so following a coastal line. Just yes, to say, uh, in the audience today, we have members of, of the Fahan and the Raw Angling Clubs that have contributed to, to purchase tags for the, for, for the project and has been, uh, has been amazing collaboration. And if it wouldn't be because their support, we wouldn't have this knowledge. And that's something that I would like to recognize today, that thanks for that collaboration, we were able to, to get very, very important information for the management of, of sea trout stocks. So just to close my talk today, migratory behavior of Atlantic salmon and sea trout are different, but survival did not differ significantly when they're at sea. And sea trout have better survival in the lower parts of the river and estuary compared to, to sea trout. The timing of movements 
differ from random in these three um, environments, meaning that fees are selective. Fees will migrate at certain times, but not others. And yes, uh, migration at night, we have talked about that before, so that's not a, a, a major funding, but it still proves that this does happen in, in, in the FOIL. <laughs> And there, is a, there definitely exist areas at sea that are highly utilized by migrating smolts. They prefer certain areas over, uh, they, they, they have preference for certain areas over others. And it's important to know where the fish go, but it's also important to, to know where, why they don't go to, to other parts. So the telemetry with a large array actually allows you to to have a great coverage to, to be uh, actually answering those questions. And into the future, uh, yeah, more tagging, uh, more tagging is planned for 23. Collaborations with AVI are going to continue. Collaborations with angling clubs are uh, developing and hopefully to, to continue as well. Uh, tagging other life stages, uh, like returning adults, would be very, very interesting. As Richard mentioned, we are actually, uh, it's a striking result that large proportion of, of adults are dying or getting lost or dying in the last few kilometers of the migration. So that's something to, to, to focus our attention for the years to come. And user, using uh, new sensors, that, that would be good to actually typify uh, the behaviors of, uh, of, of uh, what is uh, uh, the animal versus what it could be the predator. And correlation with the environmental variables, I'm still working on that and, and potentially uh, using uh, particle tracking models or hydrodynamic models combining with uh, the, the fish vectors could, could give us um, the basis of what, the, 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 what, what uh, environmental cues fish use to, to navigate. And genetic analysis would be very interesting uh, particularly for, for sea trout work because we, we will actually, given that the movements, we can start looking at genetics to see do we have different clusters, different populations of, of fish, or is it part of the same sea trout population? And that, that would ma make a, a lot of sense. There is people here who have been working with Salmonis genetics and probably I would like to, to expand this collaboration or to keep going with the it has been done with salmon, but now it's time maybe to do with, with sea trout. And I know my name has been mentioned uh, quite a few times. I'm honored, but it was a privilege for me to be part of this project. But indeed, um, there are some many anonymous people here. Maybe they're not going to be mentioned here. But these people, if you think I'm a starbone, they are more starbone, and they make this project a, a success. Uh, Queen of Ulster, the Kelty Boyer, uh, Chris Harley and his nephew, Matt, uh, guys from uh, Malinhead, fishermen, and super involved with the project. They are living out of fishery and they want a sustainable fishery. The Matthew is a guy who didn't go to the school. His dream was to be a fisherman. And I think you, he's right. He should be able to fish for the years to come. Uh, Ross McGill, you know him. Uh, yes, as a, as a line manager, but he was always ready for the action. He was, you can see him not getting scared about anything, and Rolly and Jason and m m many people, Kahal, uh, Foil Port is, is, is a major port here, um, and they have uh, used their resources to help us, the Logs Agency, to, to do all this work. So great success, and hopefully, Mm, better management actions to come and more research to come. So that was me. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Excellent stuff. Um, we're going to move straight on to our next speaker, <clears throat> who is from the Marine Institute. It's uh, Catherine Waters. Cat, please come up to the podium. Thanks, Colin. 
Hi everyone, good to see you. So I'm here today to represent the Marine Institute and the work that we've been doing on sea monitor for the last three years. Um, I think in a few talks uh, already today, we've touched on the two types of innovative technology that I'd like to talk about and the, uh, we're going to talk about them in the context of tracking uh, salmon smolts. So just to start with, where are we based and where were we based uh, in the three years of the sea monitor study? So we were the most westerly of all of the salmon arrays in the west of Ireland here, um, in the Burrishaw catchment, which runs into Clue Bay, uh, past Clare Island and Ackle and into the Atlantic Ocean. So the, the big lake here in the northern part of the Burrishaw catchment is Loch Fia, which is the freshwater lake. And the southerly lake is Loch Furness, which is a saline lagoon which runs into Clue Bay. So here, this map, um, I'm showing you where we had our receiver locations. So as I mentioned, uh, through the Burrishaw catchment, the estuary, into the inner bay of Clue Bay, the north side of Clare Island, and Ackle. And the black dots here are the Marine Institute receivers, and the red dots are Queens's receivers, which John mentioned with the Baskin shark earlier. So we tagged 217 uh, wild and hatchery reared, so from now on I'm going to call them ranched, salmon smolts over the three years. We released our smolts into Loch Furness, which I mentioned is the saline lagoon. And we deployed 32 receivers, as I showed in the map, uh, through the Burrishaw catchment to Clare Island and Ackle. So I'd like to start by talking about patterns of movement. And the way that I'm going to show you this is in these di detection plots. And these are created in the Actil package in R. And just to explain it so that everyone can follow me, um, on the y-axis here we have our receivers, and on the x-axis we have the date time and this is just one individual and what we're seeing here is in the orange that this individual spends some time in the lake and when it leaves the lake goes through the estuary is detected at the inner bay clue bay and finally at Clare Island and this is what we like to refer to as unidirectional movement it's the type of movement that we would expect to see from a, a successfully migrating salmon smolt However, throughout the study, we started to see this type of uh, detections and, and patterns of movement. So this is another individual. And as the individual leaves the lake and enters the estuary, then decides to come back into the lake and make a reversal movement. Back in the lake, back into the estuary, and in and out of the lake and the estuary. So. This isn't what we expected to see. We expected to see this unidirectional movement. So there was some speculation over what are we seeing here? Is this some sort of unusual salmon smolt behavior? Are they acclimatizing to salt water for the first time? Or could it potentially be predation? So this is the first type of innovative technology that I'd like to talk about. So we introduced uh, the use of predator tags to validate this movement. And this is a picture of a predator, predator tag. So what is it? It's basically an acoustic tag, which is equipped with a special polymer coating, which disintegrates when it comes into contact with stomach acid. The tag can keep track of the time elapsed since its digestion, and that's recorded on your receivers. So we use two different types of these tags. We tag 25 ranch smolts, 10 in 2021, with just the digestive sensor and 15 in 2022, and with this time, as Richard was talking about, and I think Diego mentioned it as well, with the temperature sensor, and I'll explain why we did that in a minute. So going back to our patterns of movement, this plot here is of an individual with a predator tag which has been triggered. So the red star here indicates when that tag was triggered, which happened in, in this case in the lake. Five of the 10 predator tags were triggered in 2021. Seven of 15 were triggered in 2022. And all of our tags were either triggered within the lake or the estuary. If we then compare that to the original detection plot that I showed you with the reversals, we can look at these and say, okay, this is pretty similar movement here. We're seeing these reversals in and out of the lake 
Oh, we're basically, we're talking about predation, aren't we? This guy here on the left-hand side has a predator tag, and I must mention predator tags are a little bit more expensive than the ordinary acoustic tag. So it would be lovely to put predator tags in absolutely all of our fish, but we didn't have the budget to do that. So we're using, in this case, the ordinary uh, acoustic tag. So we knew that we had to look at this a bit more closely and make this a bit more robust. So what I did then was I used what they call machine learning. And I used a supervised and an unsupervised type of machine learning. So in this case, hierarchical cluster analysis and random forest. So what you do is you choose variables to inform this analysis. So what I chose was the total number of detections, the total time it was detected, four different types of velocity, total number of reversals, the time the tag was triggered, time in the lake, and the time in the estuary. And this is the results we got. So on the left-hand side here, you have uh, cluster analysis. And on the right-hand side, you have random forest analysis. And basically, what it's showing us is that it's done what we wanted it to do. In the blue, it's grouped those triggered tags with our ordinary tags that didn't have the extra sensors, but we were noticing these reversal movements. So it's grouped those together. So now we can say with a bit more certainty that it was predation that we were seeing. And in the yellow, then, we have our salmon smolts. So we chose the two different types of analysis, but we actually found no difference. They both showed us exactly the same results. Only one fish, interest, interestingly enough, over the three years displayed the same type of reversals. So the majority of the fish that were displaying this behavior were ranched. And from this analysis, we can then say that 16% of our ranched fish with the ordinary acoustic tag in 2020 and 2022 and 34% in 2021 identified as displaying the same type of behavior as those classified as predated upon by predator tags. Now, what I haven't put in here is that in 2022, we added the temperature uh, sensor. We were fairly certain what type of predator it was, but again, we just uh, we wanted to make sure. So of all of the triggered predator tags in 2022, they were all over 36 degrees Celsius. So we knew it was a mammal. And the only one that makes sense, really, I'm sorry to say, is the other seal mark, sorry, uh, which we know is resident in Cluvae. So interestingly as well, we were seeing these being detected on our array from anything from 10 days to 45 days. So the tag was remaining in the gut of the seal for, for long periods of time, which is interesting. We can also say that approximately 50% of our wild and 50% of our ranch fish were detected on the last array at Clare Island. So although we're seeing a high amount of predation within the lake and estuary on our ranch fish, by the time they make it to Clare Island, which is our, our last gate, we're seeing fairly similar figures here. So then some conclusions from the use of the predator tags. So predator tags are great. They can help with the quality control of detection data by differentiating between your target species and a predator. Machine learning is a proven technique. It's used quite a lot now for discerning between behavior types and successfully grouping smolts into fake categories. Ranch smolts, who are less accustomed to predator avoidance, are more susceptible to predation in the lake or estuary compared to wild smolts, whose mortality is more evident in the early marine environment. And as I think a few people have suggested, the early inshore migration is an important phase to the overall success of salmon smolts reaching the open ocean. OK, so moving on, the second type of technology I want to talk about, um, which Morgan mentioned in her talk, is the uh, Slocum G3 submersible, which is our glider. What are they? They're cutting edge technology providing a new and efficient method of collecting data in the open ocean. It's a nice picture of one here, but tomorrow we actually will have one on display. So if you guys want to come and take a look, close look or talk to us about the details of how it works, we'll be happy to do so tomorrow. But just for today, so as you know, it's an autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, it's communicated with via satellite. So as it surfaces, you can actually retask uh, the glider uh, to different positions if you needed to. Um, but you would input its tracks where you'd like it to go. 
Uh, here we have a science bay which is um, monitoring environmental variables such as temperature and salinity. And as Morgan mentioned earlier, they, she had her sound trap attached. This is actually the VMT, which is listening for acoustic tags. So why do we use them? They can act as a highly mobile platform re for recording oceanic data. As we've mentioned, they can carry external sensors. They're easy to deploy and retrieve. They're highly cost-effective compared to using a research vessel. And you don't actually need a re research vessel to deploy one or retrieve one. You could do this off a rib if, if you wanted to. So there's minimal staffing required. And they have a significant deployment duration, and they can cover large distances. So over the course of the three years of the Sea Monitor project, we deployed the uh, glider three times. And the survey area was chosen based on the findings from a trawling survey from the South Sea Merge project. And the glider was deployed to the continental shelf to detect salmon smolts migrating to their feeding grounds. So here we have an animation of the tracks of those three years. In the blue, you have 2020. In the red, you have 2021. And the yellow is 2022. Over the three years, the glider did a total of 3,200 kilometers. It did a maximum daily distance of 25 kilometers. Uh, it was deployed for a maximum duration of 73 days. And in that time, it collected over a million environmental data points. So a lot of information there. So the burning question is, did we actually detect any of our acoustic salmon that were tagged? And I'm glad to say we did. <laughs> so as my colleague Ross O'Neill would say, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, but we found them. So in 2021, four of our salmon smolts were detected from three jurisdictions, and this map does a good re uh, representation of that, from showing us where they're from and where they were detected. And as you can see, they're all detected in the area of the continental shelf in fairly close proximity to each other. And they were all detected within a relatively close uh, number of days as well. On the right-hand side, we have just some additional information for instance, uh, distance from the last array uh, to the detection on the glider, the average daily distance covered, and the speed that the fish were traveling approximately at that time from each uh, fish. And what's interesting is that the da average daily distance covered and the speed is quite similar for, for each fish there. As I mentioned, we're also collecting environmental data at the same time. And this is the average salinity and average temperature during that uh, glider's deployment. And in the gray shaded area is when our detections were made. So to conclude from the glider, the success of glider missions in identifying the presence of acoustically tagged salmon smolts at the shelf edge shows the importance of the shelf edge as a major driver in salmon migration and highlights the level of interconnectivity of smolts from different rivers and jurisdictions in the open ocean. So the question really is, where to next? Um, I'd just like to make a few thank yous before I step down. Uh, my colleague, Ross O'Neill, who managed the glider, couldn't be here today. Um, but I know he'd like me to thank Kieran Adlam and the PO team, p and team, um, for all of their help over the last three years. I'd like to say a massive thank you to the Marine Institute's technical staff because without their support, we wouldn't have been able to do half of it. So Alan Drum, Nigel Bond, and Joe Cooney, who's sitting up back there. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Kat. Some more exciting science to stimulate your questions for the, the discussion session uh, after coffee break. I'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Han Honkinen. Um, Han has been leading on delivering the Sea Monitor project for the University of Glasgow. Right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Han Honkinen from University of Glasgow. And today, I will be telling you about the salmon tagging in the Clyde region and salmon marine pathways. Um, but before I get started on the science part, I just want to um, introduce you to the full University of Glasgow team. So in addition to myself, um, we've also got Colin Adams. Um, Jesse Lilly um, was the PhD student <coughs> on the project. Um, I've kind of highlighted 
uh, just his name here, um, because basically all the results I'm going to present next um, have been analyzed um, and written up by Jessie, so all the credit to her. Uh, Jessie unfortunately couldn't make it today because she's preparing, to her, uh, preparing for her PhD Viva, which is next week. Um, so hopefully another doctor in the house quite soon. Uh, and then we also got Phoebe Kaiser-Wilkes as well. Um, so Phoebe is in the audience as well. Um, right, so what I'm going to do next um, is going to give you a brief overview on four studies um, that we either led or were part of um, at University of Glasgow. So <clears throat> these ones here. Um, first one um, is a study looking at smoke migration through a lake. Um, this is something that's being highlighted by a few people already. Um, then we had another study looking at estuary survival and behavior of salmon smolts, particularly in the Clyde. Um, so these are studies that we kind of did within the Glasgow team. Um, and then I'm also going to give you an introduction to two studies that were collaboration kind of within the CMO of the partners, but also included some external partners as well. Right, so starting on with um, study one, um, migration through lakes or a lake. Um, to give you a bit of background um, on this topic, we have obviously heard a lot about small migration. You're all quite familiar how it works. Um, but basically, water flow is a really important navigational cue for smolts, particularly in the freshwater. And in rivers, it's obviously, you know, rivers, we have unidirectional, quite strong flows. Um, so it makes it really easy for smolts to migrate. Um, you're kind of quite literally going with the flow. Um, however, when you get to lakes and reservoirs, um, so these areas are standing waters, um, there was, well, in most cases lack directional flows, um, or they might have flows that are kind of mixing or mixed. So potentially they're quite difficult habitats for salmon to migrate through. So um, kind of going on this, uh, there was a couple of questions that we were hoping to answer. Um, one was that what is small survival through this migration through a lake? Uh, what routes do the smolts take? And what makes a successful individual, particularly think of the lake migration? So the study site we chose for this um, was Loch Lomen, which is quite literally on our um, <clears throat> backyard at the University of Glasgow Field Station, um, Scottish Centre for Ecology and Natural Environment. Um, so in 2020, um, we we're lucky enough to get a really quite, um, quite a large scale acoustic telemetry array into Loch Lomond. So on the map there, um, every black dot um, represents one of these acoustic receivers. Um, the blue star there is the tagging site um, on the River Endrick. Um, and I think I've got, yeah, so basically for these fish, fish um, they get tagged on the Endrick, they have to go through River Endrick, then through Loch Lomond, um, into River Leven, and then into Clyde Estuary before they get out to sea. So it's quite a complex, complex migration before they even make it to sea. So we have 125 smolts that we tagged as part of the study. And right, to give you um, some of the kind of key findings um, from the study, um, the kind of one big main take home message is that lakes are really challenging habitats for smolts. Uh, we've heard a lot about you know, rivers being quite dangerous, estuaries being quite dangerous, coastal zones being quite dangerous, um, but lakes are quite challenging and dangerous as well. So it's not easy to be a smolt. Um, and specifically, you know, there was quite a high loss rate. Um, so about almost 60% of the smolts that went into Loch Lomond actually didn't make it out. Um, the migration was quite slow. Um, so the kind of shortest route through the lake um, is about nine kilometers. Um, if you think of the kind of average speed of smolts, it should take them, uh, I think, about nine, 10 hours, but definitely less than a day. Um, the average time was five days, but we had smolts that um, took couple of weeks, one fish took 21 days to migrate through the lock. And what we're seeing, what we saw in this study, and actually some of the previous work that we've done as well, is these counterintuitive movements. So on the map that you can see here, um, every box or map uh, represents um, just examples of six of the fish that we tagged. Um, so every map is the movement pattern of one smolt. So you can see kind of lines going up and down. Um, there's obviously some lines that are quite direct. Um, straight out, which is good. Um, others are a bit more complex and some that go kind of all over the place. So clearly what we're seeing here is that the smolts are not able to just take the direct way out. Um, they are getting confused. They're kind of going all over the place. Some of them are quite going quite far up north um, away from the outflow. And another kind of what I thought was really interesting, um, one, of, one of our findings was that we actually couldn't find any difference in the routes taken by successful and unsuccessful individuals. So I can add these labels here. So actually what we're seeing here is the top row, these are three successful 
smolts, um, and the bottom are three unsuccessful fish. So as you can see, there's no really one, you know, the successful fish are not kind of better at finding the root than unsuccessful successful ones. Um, they're getting kind of equally confused. So I don't know if the buzzer works. Anyway, um, but um, column C, for example, that was a su successful fish. Uh, but I'll give you an example. That fish actually swam about 250 kilometers within Loch Lomond before it made out, but it did make out, made it out eventually. But yeah, okay, so lakes are challenging. Moving on to the second study then that we did. Um, so I'm kind of following in these studies, we're kind of moving further out the whole time. So we've kind of been through the freshwater part. The next um, is the estuary and the Clyde estuary in our um, area. So, you know, we're going to have the inner Clyde estuary, um, outer Clyde estuary before it opens up to the first of Clyde, um, and then obviously Irish Sea. Um, as many people before me, some colleagues have highlighted that estuaries um, are quite dangerous again. There's new predators, um, seals, as we've seen, um, quite pesky. Uh, there's challenges in kind of moving from freshwater to saltwater. And also, um, Colin and a few other people have mentioned as well, there is this potential overlap with anthropogenic issues, so fish farms, um, renewables, and so on. Um, right, so some of the questions that we wanted to answer as part of um, this study. Again, looking at survival. Uh, what's the survival through estuary? Um, does the survival differ between different populations? And thirdly, again, thinking of the drivers of the movement, and we know the importance of water flow. Um, are the movements through the estuary driven by tides? Um, coming, going through some methods here again, um, so kind of so in the map of the study site. Um, this time we had two tagging sites. So we had the River Endrick, that was part of the previous study as well. Um, we also had a second study, um, River Greif, on the other side of the Clyde estuary and river. Um, you can see some black dots. These are acoustic receivers, but for clarity, I've also highlighted some of the main um, receiver lines or arrays in orange. So all of those orange blocks have a receiver array. So whenever a fish moves past it, we can be fairly certain that we'll pick it up. And as part of the study, um, like I said, we tagged fish in two rivers. We had 145 in the river Endrick, 102 in the river Greif. So this allowed us to look at the potential differences between these two populations. Um, and the one key thing, obviously, between these two populations is that for the river Greif fish, um, they've got a fairly easy freshwater migration. They've got, from the point of tagging, where the blue star is on the Greif, They've got about eight kilometers before they enter the sea. Um, there's no barriers, anything, just kind of straight out. But as we've just covered, um, the river Endrick fish have to go through a river, a lake, another river before they even make it to the estuary. So the Endrick fish actually migrate a minimum of 30 kilometers, but like we've seen, most fish spend, I don't know, 50 to even 100 or even 250 kilometers before they make it to the estuary. So potentially the Endrick fish are already maybe more tired, they've used more energy, they've spent more time before they even make it to the estuary. Right, results then, um, and again, kind of key take home message here is that actually estuary survival is higher than expected. So what we found, um, kind of contrary to some of the other results, um, is that in the Clyde estuary, um, the estuary loss rates were about four times lower than in freshwater. This was the same for both populations. Um, and loss rates were higher for smolts with longer freshwater migration. So the river endric fish that have to go through the river, lake, another river, um, they were actually more likely to die in the estuary, potentially because they've already expanded, um, used more energy, but we're not quite sure. But there was this quite clear difference between the two populations. And then looking at the drivers of the movement, um, we were finding that smolts were moving forwards and backwards with the tides. Um, so I've got a graph here. I realized um, this morning that I forgot to add some labels. But basically, um, the clock plot A um, is the forwards movements, and B is for backwards movements. Um, and essentially, the clock plot just shows um, low tide at the top, high tide at the bottom. And what we're seeing basically is that A, um, most of the fish movements, um, so the gray bars uh, were happening when the tide was going out. So it kind of makes sense. The fish are moving forwards as the tide is going forwards and then moving back with the tide again. And what we're finding is that most of the fish did about, I think it was 2.4 kind of backwards forwards movements before they actually exited the estuary. 
Right, moving on straight away. Um, so study three, this is again us moving um, a bit further out to sea again. Um, and this is a study that uh, is not just Glasgow now, this is very much um, collaboration, including um, all the sea monitor partner data um, and some additional project data as well. So um, give a bit of background, although I don't need to go this in detail because everyone has kind of covered it. Um, but yeah, very little is known about salmon um, migration in the early stages of marine migration. So we obviously know where the fish, where the smolts start from. Um, we know roughly where they end up in the kind of near Greenland, Norwegian Sea, Iceland. Um, but we don't actually know how they get there. We don't know where they go, how long it takes them to get there, um, which is really surprising for a species as important um, economically and culturally as salmon. So yeah, lots of question marks there. Um, but when we're thinking of how the smolts um, get to the feeding grounds. Um, the kind of existing work thinks that it's a, some kind of combination between current following. So is it there's some quite strong um, water currents that run, run along the continental shelf. So it makes sense um, in terms of saving energy to follow these currents. Um, but there's also gonna be likely some um, aspect of active swimming as well. Um, and this is likely to vary between populations depending on kind of geographically where you are, where you enter the sea. So some of the questions um, we're hoping to answer, again, looking at survival. Um, what are some of the migration pathways? And most importantly, kind of, could we identify some of these environmental drivers, um, particularly current, again? Right, um, so a bit of methods again. So the study site now, um, we're again stepping a bit further out. Um, so this was um, us focusing on the kind of you know, the coastal Irish Sea area between Scotland, Northern Ireland, particularly, um, with very much a focus on the sea monitor main array, so that would be the line B on the map here. Um, we also included data from the Compass project, um, as we mentioned before, so that's line A there. Um, this study um, combined data from multiple partners, um, so sea monitor partners, Compass partners, um, and Atlantic Salmon Trust was involved in some of this as well, and Environment Agency from Durban. So lots of partners, 14 rivers, um, about 1,000 fish. And right, so found a few different things, but the main point again, current driven movement through the Irish Sea. So importance of currents um, is significant again. Um, some of the other interesting results that came up from here is that um, when looking at swim speeds, for example, um, they were variable but overall fairly fast, although it's slightly subjective. Uh, but essentially what you're finding, oh, yeah, point that doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> in the graph, uh, the y-axis shows you the swim speed, kilometers per day. Um, and then we got all these um, rivers in the study. The color is just marks whether it's um, England, Scotland, um, Northern Ireland. So what we're finding is that the swim speeds vary from about 10 kilometers a day to about 40 kilometers a day. Um, so there's a fair bit of variation. Um, but some of the fish are actually moving quite fast. So I would say that 40 kilometers a day is quite um, fast movement. Um, and also another interesting thing is that, again, the different populations from similar regions um, seem to be doing quite similar things. So the Scottish rivers, um, quite similar, and same for the Northern Irish rivers as well. Um, looking at the survival or loss rates in this case, um, and this is looking at the loss rate kind of percentage per kilometer. Um, to take into account, obviously, different um, populations are migrating different distances. So to make it comparable um, between these, all these different uh, populations across the system, um, probably the points are a bit small, but hopefully you can see them. Um, again, I would say I'm calling it fairly low. Um, this is, again, a bit subjective, but they're definitely low when compared to most um, freshwater uh, loss rates, for example. And an interesting thing here, again, is that we're seeing um, the similar pattern between um, nearby populations. So the two blue dots there on the left side, um, those are the um, kind of our fish, um, Endrick and Greif. Um, they're very similar. Um, and again, most of the Northern Ireland rivers are kind of clustering at the top as well. And then um, moving on to, I suppose, the key point of this <coughs> bit of analysis was looking at what's actually causing, or what are some of the drivers um, for small migration moving out of the Irish Sea? So looking at the conditions when the smolts pass the main array, um, there's a few other things that Jesse did. I'm simplifying it a lot um, because of time. Um, but one of the analyses Jesse did is that she looked at the 
Every time a fish, a smolt, was detected in a main array, she looked at the conditions there. So what direction was the flow going? And essentially, that what we, that's what um, we were seeing. So whenever, well, not always, but most of the time when a smolt was detected on the main array, um, that was the direction of the current, which kind of makes sense. It's kind of the westerly, northwesterly, um, <clears throat> western direction um, that would push the smolts kind of towards the continental shelf. Um, so it was very kind of, the timing of the small exit was um, dependent on the current direc direction, which was interesting. Um, some of you might ask that, well, is that not the, kind of, that's the kind of the current that's there all the time, but actually um, there was a range of currents, kind of conditions um, detected um, on, along the main array line. Um, so there was kind of variation, if you will, um, but the smolts passing the line did seem to be in this quite um, narrow band of flow conditions, which is very interesting. Right, okay, and then moving on to the kind of proper marine migration pathways, again, taking another step back, looking at kind of really big picture stuff. Um, yeah, just to kind of highlight what has been said before, um, the knowledge of the pathways, areas used <clears throat> during the early marine migration is really, really important. Um, we've seen from all well, the work, for example, what Richard uh, presented that, you know, these mortality rates could be incredibly high um, just in the kind of freshwater and a couple of dozen kilometers <coughs> um, near the coastal zones. So there's a lot of potential here for um, management, I suppose, um, intervention. But at the same time, these kind of coastal zones are the areas where we have, you know, fish farms, for example, um, offshore renewables. So unless we know where the fish are going, what, the hab what habitats are they using, um, how long are they spending in these areas. Um, we just can't really plan any meaningful management um, outcomes. So um, the main questions or aims for this part of the work um, was, well, the main thing was, this, what are the pathways taken by smolts? Um, this is the kind of big, big question for the whole um, salmon work um, in Sea Monitor, I would argue. Um, and again, do they vary between populations? Um, we know we're lucky enough to have a really incredible sample size with lots of different populations from lots of different countries and regions. Um, are they doing similar things or not? So yeah, I'm gonna give you um, some methods, info. Um, Collins highlighted this map already at the very beginning, but um, basically this was a huge, huge collaborative project um, with loads of different partners. Um, so in the end, um, this analysis that um, was led by, I should actually say, so this analysis has been led by, was it Jesse Lilly, who's one of our PhD students, um, and then Jessica Ro Roger from the Atlantic Salmon Trust. So there were 23 rivers included in the study um, and about 1,800 smolts, which is quite incredible, about 400 receivers, one glider, as we've just seen from Cat's talk. Um, it's a massive, massive study. Um, loads of um, project involved. Um, Simon, obviously one main one, obviously the yellow should go all the way to the Boris Hall, apologies for inclu not including that. Um, and the other big partner was the West Coast Tracking Project, which is an Atlantic Salmon project, um, you know, funded by Atlantic Salmon Trust, um, Marine Scotland, Fisheries Management Scotland. Um, the Samos Project, um, NIS Small Tracking Project, um, Durban Tracking Project, and Torridon Tracking Project for Marine Scotland as well. So we get loads of different partners um, across these regions <coughs> all working together, which is quite incredible. Um, so what we got from here um, was this. And you might look at it as, oh, you've got some lines on a map, but actually this is pretty phenomenal um, and it's super significant. Um, so some of the key points here is that obviously overall we see in this northern directory. Um, this is maybe not surprising. We know that smolts are heading north, so that's the pattern that we're seeing here. That's all fair. Um, we're not really seeing evidence of this small superhighway. Um, so this is a term that some people use. <clears throat> um, the assumption here is that this may be this one pathway that all smolts from, say, Scotland use. Um, that's not really what we're seeing. Um, we're seeing the smolts spread out a fair bit. Um, there's obviously some areas where there's a bit more clustering, but overall, there's not kind of one way where fish are going. Um, yeah, the other kind of key point I would like to highlight, particularly from the kind of Scottish point of view, um, <clears throat> one of the ex expectations for a lot of us was that there would be a lot more fish using um, the minch, 
which is the kind of channel between the Hebrides and Sky on mainland Scotland. Um, but actually, that was not the case at all. Um, you can see from the purple lines, um, there was only, I think, four fish detected on that line, um, which is very surprising. We were expecting to see a lot more fish there. That was not the case at all. Um, and another kind of key point that I like to highlight, obviously, you can see um, along the Seamon is a main array. Um, we're seeing a really widespread of these um, smolts pathways. So essentially, there's smolts using um, the channel basically all over, all across, um, which is really interesting. Um, but I'll touch upon a paper. You can see the different colors slightly clustering. And what we're also seeing, you know, the fish are not moving through the minch, so that would be point J on the map. Um, but instead, most fish seem to be heading towards the kind of points P and Q on the map, towards the continental shelf. Um, so that's where we got some of these glider detections that Kat has just presented. So there seems to be that fish are moving a bit further away from the coast, um, at least kind of once they get further out from the kind of very coastal areas. Um, the one thing I want to highlight, I think, because this was one of our fish, um, Kat was talking about the glider detections, which is amazing that we got four, or Marine Institute got four fish detected. Um, one of those was um, one of the Greif fish, um, and there's actually a picture of that fish in your one of booklets, so page 32, I think it was. Have a look, you can see Sally, that did an amazing job migrating nearly 600 kilometers. Um, and if you're thinking of the phenology um, of the migration, I didn't want to include too many numbers here, um, <clears throat> but for that, Sally. Sally the salmon that migrated from the Greif um, all the way up to where the glider was, so point Q. So that was 580, 60 kilometers. Um, it took 24 days to do that. So it's a fair bit of time it takes, but obviously it's a really long distance. Um, <clears throat> so what's important, to, again, bringing it back to the kind of management implications is that there is this pot potential overlap with agriculture and offshore developments, even though, you know, maybe you didn't see fish spending too much time in the very coastal zones, um, but you know, there is this period of maybe a couple of weeks up to a month, potentially, when they are within this area where there are um, potential issues. So um, it's something to kind of keep in mind that, yeah, the potential risk of um, adverse effect is definitely, definitely there. Okay, and I think, yeah, the last point I just want to highlight is that looking at the, kind of bringing it from the really big picture back into the sea monitor line, because um, <clears throat> that's what we're here for. So if you're looking at the, the detections for the Siemens line specifically. Um, we've seen um, these maps from Diego and Richard already. Um, but even though we got fish all across the Siemens line, which was amazing, there did seem to be this kind of clustering within populations. So um, we get these different uh, regions. So we can see, for example, um, so region one, um, this includes two populations from southern Scotland um, and then one English population. So they seem to be using the middle channel. Moving on to region two, which is our Endric and Greif fish coming from the Clyde estuary of Scotland. Um, they're definitely more towards the Scottish side. And then, you know, both of these contrasting quite a lot with the Irish, uh, Northern Irish fish that are more close to the Malinhead side. So, you know, there's no kind of small super highway in a way, but there's definitely kind of population specific um, clustering, which is quite interesting as well. Okay, I think. That was kind of all of my points. Um, as a kind of final point, I should have had like a proper conclusion slide, um, but I just wanted to say that, you know, the one big thing, <clears throat> well, it was two things. One, I think Salmon Group within Sea Monitor has done some really amazing work. Um, I think some of the results that we've got are pretty incredible, you know, information that we never had before. Obviously, every other um, species in Sea Monitor has done the same, but um, yeah, well done, Salmon people. And something else I want to highlight that actually James touched upon earlier. Um, so the only way, the last two bits of analysis would have worked or did work was because there was such good collaboration and data sharing between different partners. Um, and I just want to say that it's been really fantastic to see kind of how everyone's come together, shared data, and that's definitely something that we need to do in the future. A few people have highlighted how expensive telemetry is. Um, and it's unlikely that one partner organization could do it all, um, all on their own. So yeah, collaboration is the key. And I think that's the kind of one, the chapter of what we call study three, and four here really kind of highlight the benefit of that. So hopefully we can do a few more of those studies in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Han. Uh, a fantastic session, I hope you'll agree. Um,
All of that should have stimulated a lot of questions. If you could just hold on to those questions for 20 minutes. We've got a panel discussion beginning at 4 o'clock, so you've got 22 minutes to go and get some coffee, which is out in the foyer, uh, and come back in at 4 o'clock sharp, please, for the panel discussion. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Tasha and welcome to QB Conservation, your lockdown lowdown on new ecology research. In this series, we challenged biologists at Queen's to tell us about exciting new research in just a few minutes. So my name's John Houghton and I'm a senior lecturer, that's associate professor for those outside the kind of UK in marine biology at Queen's University Belfast. What is the Sea Monitor Basking Shark project? Sea Monitor Basking Shark project is trying to find a way where we can think collectively about basking shark conservation in our little corner of the world, which contains Scotland, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Um, and because the animals are so fast moving, and they move so freely between these different territorial waters, we want to kind of join up our thinking and come up with a really good collective response, how we can manage and conserve them. If you're going to bring it into the context of sort of protected areas or conservation measures, you need to be able to know what the animals are doing over longer period of time, which is where the monitoring comes on. So if we designate a particular area or we consider a particular area important, how do we substantiate important and how do we know it stays kind of a hot spot for that species? Why are basking sharks particularly important in this area? Conservation of basking sharks in this region is, is really important, I guess, because there's good numbers of basking sharks around our region. Um, but we're going back a century. They were viewed more pragmatically as a resource, almost as a fisheries catch. Um, and yeah, their numbers did drop. So the efforts now are to really make sure that they are on their way back and to make sure we can remove any obstacles to that recovery. Do you have hope for the future of basking shark conservation? I think it's really quite hopeful. I mean, we're in a fantastic technological age. Technology doesn't make you smart, but it does enable you to actually ask and try and draw in some of the information on some previously impossible questions. I think there's a lot of good people in this game. A lot of people are talking to each other. There's a real kind of momentum for everyone working together towards a common goal. So yeah, I say I'm hopeful. My name is Ross O'Neill. I'm with the Marine Institute. Uh, my role is to look after the autonomous underwater vehicle, otherwise known as the glider. And my name is Catherine Waters. Um, I'm a scientific and technol technical officer in the Marine Institute based in Newport. Um, predominantly, I've been involved with the acoustic tagging of um, Atlantic salmon. We've also supported Queen's University Belfast with the tagging of basking shark and flappiscate. Uh, so the glider is essentially an underwater robotic torpedo that can be programmed to travel to various locations within the ocean. Uh, and while travelling it records uh, environmental data such as water temperature and salinity, but also has the capability to listen out for any uh, dolphins or whales in the area and also any fish animals or other animals that might be tagged with acoustic tags and it uh, detects them and then we can tell essentially where these fish uh, or animals are at a given time. And so the Sea Monitor project that we've both been working on has really fitted into to our institute really well. Um, it's been a really innovative project. Um, my role uh, acoustically tagging, tagging Atlantic salmon and releasing them from our uh, Burrishul facility um, out in Newport um, and basically tracking uh, the Atlantic salmon through uh, uh, the inshore waters through Clue Bay, uh, uh, Clare Island and Ackill um, and basically monitoring their migration pathways, uh, the timings and the speed that it takes them to get out into the marine environment. So in, in this project we've been able to track um, our salmon further than we ever have before in the marine environment and uh, Ross uh, has been operating the glider can go into that a bit more. Yeah so typically with acoustic tagging uh, you're limited to uh, areas close to where your acoustic receivers are which are usually in coastal waters just for ease of access. So once these fish move beyond these uh, ranges where they can be picked up uh, they kind of go out into the unknown, into the open ocean. Uh, and this is a, a huge problem for uh, understanding salmon migration. So using the robotic glider, we were able to deploy it up along the shelf edge, which is a, a kind of area of water where the depth goes from about 200 meters down to over a kilometer quite quickly. Um, as a result, there, there's a current that flows very fast um, coming up from the Bay of Biscay all the way up to Norway, where we believe the salmon use this current as a kind of a motorway to, to get up to feeding grounds there. 
Uh, the glider was deployed three times uh, on a, uh, a mission uh, up in that neck of the woods, uh, kind of uh, northwest of Scotland, northwest of the Hebrides. And what we were able to identify was the detection of uh, four separate salmon smolts. Um, um, and as Kat mentioned, um, the furthest in Europe from their spawning rivers uh, at over 600 kilometres, um, which was one that we ta Catherine tagged on the west coast of Ireland and was picked all the way up off the north of Scotland. The really great thing about the Sea Monitor project is it's such a collaborative project. There are multiple partners from Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and we've all been working together now for a few years, so we've got some really strong collaborative bonds. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been working with Queen's University Belfast um, on the basking shark and the flapper skate. Um, and we've been actually been tagging those individuals for them. And e e very little is known about those animals. They're really sensitive species. Um, so anything that we can do, um, any information we can give is new and is novel. Um, so it's been really great to work with all different partners in the different jurisdictions because as you know like the animals we've been working on they don't know any borders um, or jurisdictions so um, yeah it's been really great to be able to track them further than we ever have before up the west coast of Ireland and Scotland. Um, as we, I suppose as we go into the future the work that has been undertaken by the Sea Monitor project uh, lays the foundation for a better understanding of how climate change is impacting uh, the ocean, not only uh, physical oceanography, but also on the animals that live there. Um, the animals, you know, that, that move and migrate and feed and l completely live in the ocean, they're the best indicators of change in the ocean. So by understanding how their natural behaviour is changing, we can understand what's actually going on in the ocean. And yep, and hopefully we can build on sea monitor now and into the future. Exactly. A unique marine research project was launched in April 2019. Sea Monitor is aiming to help address some of the issues facing our ocean life and our regional waters. To introduce this, so I guess at the core of it, kind of the original thinking of it, there's a strong sort of salmon heart to the project, which is the reason for looking at that offshore movement of salmon and looking at that kind of survivorship out in the open water areas. That's the original idea expanded very rapidly. So to include basking sharks, to include skate, to include porpoise, to include the seals. Delivered on an unprecedented scale, this is Europe's largest marine life tracking project. A variety of species are tagged with transmitters, sending out a range of information, including location and depth, with the data recorded as they pass a line of underwater receivers called an array. The information will help us better understand and protect some of the most vulnerable species in our seas. In March 2020, the Marine Institute's research vessel, Celtic Voyager, was commissioned to deploy the line of underwater receivers which make up the array. Using the latest in GPS and acoustic telemetry technology, these receivers will stretch from Mallon Head in Ireland to Isla in Scotland. With the data collected, tracks and models will be generated to better understand species and the pressures they face. Ox Agency and an international consortium of partners. Together, we will produce marine spatial models for each species. Working collaboratively with a variety of stakeholders and our sister projects. For the first time, marine management plans will be developed for Atlantic salmon in the Foyle and Clyde River systems. To learn more, please visit our website, follow us on Twitter, 
and subscribe to our joint easy. Research on cetaceans is important for many reasons. First off, or to protect them as species, but also to protect the whole marine environment. The main objective um, of GMIT's involvement in sea monitor is to carry out the acoustic monitoring. So we are looking at cetacean occurrence. It also allows us to identify threats that could, you know, in the long term, have huge issues for these animals. So by doing this research, then we're able to look at best practices for the conservation of the species. And we're using acoustics because it can allow us to monitor for a very long period of time. And also cetaceans are kind of hard to see. Like first, we only see them when they come to the surface. And then you need very calm sea condition, which doesn't happen every day. So the acoustic is really interesting for us. We can leave the hydrophone in the water for months at a time. And then when we get them back, we get detections. Uh, it works pretty well with cetaceans because they are very vocal species. They, they use sound for navigation, foraging, communication. How can we tell which species it is when we are recording uh, with the hydrophone? Some cetaceans have a signature um, and then the patterns in their call can help us determine the species. The main cetacean species that we um, think that we're going to get is harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, wristles dolphins if they were in the area. We can target baleen whales as well. We set up Hello. a collaboration with two other projects, MARPAM and COMPASS. So we conducted land-based surveys and then based on this we can compute where the animal was and the idea is getting a detection range for the hydrophones. I think what's interesting with this project is also that it shows that conservation efforts needs to be um, needs to be carried out like in collaboration. Like for example, cetacean, they are very mobile creatures and they don't know our borders. So I think this project really shows that we need to work together uh, if we want to make things happen.
Yo, yo, one, two, 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 and welcome to QB Conservation, your lockdown lowdown on new ecology research. In this series, we challenged biologists at Queen's to tell us about exciting new research in just a few minutes. So my name's John Houghton and I'm a senior lecturer, that's associate professor, for those outside the kind of UK, in marine biology at Queen's University Belfast. What is the sea monitor basking shark project? Sea monitor basking shark project is trying to find a way where we can think collectively about basking shark conservation in our little corner of the world. Take their seats, please. We'll start the afternoon session here. Um, and because the animals are so fast moving and they move so freely between these different territorial waters, we want to kind of join up our thinking and come up with a really good collective response how we can manage and conserve them. If you're going to bring it into the context of sort of protected areas or conservation measures, you need to be able to know what the animals are doing over longer period of time, which is where
Declan, do you want to put the results of the mammal survey? What the and I have not seen these questions yet, so we're, we're flying blind into this session. OK, salmon are still popular. That's par for the course. I think we boosted the skate popularity after the end of the last session. That was good. OK, so you're very welcome to the last uh, part of today. It's a Q&A panel discussion with um, our experts. So uh, we have some returning from the last session, Oliver okay. Okaila. Um, we have some Good new faces, you. and yeah. we have some of the presenters yeah. from today. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. we have Art Niven oh, yeah. from DERA, Dr. Neil O'Malady from the Marine Institute, Dr. Robert Russell from Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute, Colin Adams again joining us, Dr. De Diego Del Vilar from the agency. Uh, we also have Francis well, O'Donnell and Dennis Maher from Inland Fisheries Ireland. That's better. Well done. So I'm sure we've got a lot of questions lined up. Um, this is going to be fun and interesting. We'll see if we can dive right into it. Um, first question on the list, what was the biggest surprise as the salmon and tracking data came in? So this would be for some of the scientists directly involved in the project maybe. Diego, do you want to start us off? Well, the, the biggest surprise is probably, in, from my point of view, is that we are able to measure things to track fish long distances that we, we were not able to do it before. It didn't come uh, too much from the biological point of the species. We knew they have to go north, but now the biggest surprise is, is that different populations utilize the oceans differently. The potential list of stressors can, could be different. And the biggest surprise for me is that we are forced to collaborate in order to protect the species. Uh, it would be easier if they all behave the same way, but they don't. And ma maybe that implies more resources, resources that at the level that we work in our own institutions might not have. And now move, moving towards the ocean where it seems that the majority or some of, of the the majority of fish are either lost at the very early or even the very end of their life cycles, returning back to fresh water. We, we, we need a, a new set of tools to be able to protect the species at the marine. So the surprise is that um, things are going to be even more difficult than expected. OK. Any other scientists involved in the salmon tracking want to jump in on that? Yes, Neil. I'm around long enough to have been watching the marine survival indices come lower and lower and lower over the last three decades or so. And I think the surprise for me is how much of that mortality is, is closer to home than I thought. As I was going through my career, I always thought, well, this is all happening in the high seas. This is something completely out of control. You can't really do anything about this. But I'm, I'm less inclined to think that now. If you're getting 50%, roughly, of your mortality happening before the fish actually get into the ocean. Well, then I think there's a lot you can possibly look at that we haven't really looked at closer in shore than we did before. So I think the value of having the, the National Index rivers like the Virtu and the Bush and that is that you can see all this over a long period of time. But the advantage of the information we have now, we've brought it right back in now and we're partitioning. And it's that partitioning is giving us much more insight so it's knowing where to look more closely, maybe? Yeah, Which, yeah. yeah. it's the focusing. Yeah. Where is the problem? A bit like the likely suspects. Where are we actually seeing the problem? And we're now beginning to identify where we might need to be looking, and where we have some control mm -hmm. over what we're looking at. Any other PIs or scientists involved want to come in? Yeah, Colin? Yeah, I, I would just like to kind of wind back a bit and, and remind us just how ambitious Sea Monitor has been not just Sea Monitor, but all of the other projects that have been doing uh, telemetry work on, on salmon over the last few years, and in particular the Atlantic Salmon Trust, which has organized a very big program of work. Um, we didn't know this was going to work. Uh, we were not sure this was going to work. We took a bit of a flyer, and we have 
chucked over the side of boats right across Ireland and west coast of Scotland, several million pounds worth of equipment. Not completely sure we were going to get it back, and we did. We got most of it back, not all of it, but we got most of it back, and it yielded some fabulous data that was giving us insights, which we've been talking about today, which six, seven years ago, we were not sure we were going to be able to do that. The technology is, m does work, and we're getting these fabulous insights. It's good science, and it's going to lead us to good management outcomes as well. Thank you. What about yourself, Robert? Yeah, I was just going to say exactly the same thing as Colin, but uh, I would extend Colin's comment <clears throat> to say something that hasn't yet been said in any of the sessions is a massive thanks to Vemco and in Oversea, our project partners. The kit has been superb and the support has been fantastic. And um, as Colin said, we, st we put the numbers on paper and you started adding up. You used to developing projects of tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. We start to roll into millions for a basic program and add all the partners you start multi-millions and now you've got to deliver and as, as a marine biologist one of the things one of my lecturers taught me years ago was never put anything over the side of a ship that you absolutely have to get back and we got the guts of 18 90 percent of everything back that went into sea and even some of the stuff that we lost the first time got given back to us by fishermen and the like so amazing, uh, and a thank you to the tech people who delivered the kit. That's a very important point. And I think when Diego made the point about the help that was given on all the different levels about deployment, it also meant advice on where to put out the kit and where not to put out the kit and stuff like that was critical. So that local knowledge uh, played a big role. Um, IFI were involved in, not directly in Seamonitor, but another salmon tracking and salmonid projects. Any surprises from your end being involved in projects like these recently? No, I don't think there was any There wasn't any surprises as such. I just found it you know, extremely interesting. Um, I think the one thing that jumped out today was this idea that there was sort of a, a super highway for smolts. That's, not, that's possibly not the reality now. So um, if that was the case in terms of their impact, the impact on them by pelagic fisheries, it would be easier to manage in the long term. So I think that that was something today that I wasn't aware of myself. Yeah, um, yeah just to Ken first, just because yeah, the I just, Salmon uh, Trust were also uh, played a big role in, in the research and the collaboration. Uh, thanks very much, Ross. Uh, first of all, um, just say I'm a bit of an interloper here because we weren't actually officially part of Sea Monitor, but uh, it's, we, we can't really separate ourselves out now. We're like conjoins twins because of the projects we did. And just to congratulate you all, I thought today's presentations were absolutely amazing. Um, uh, from uh, the giant uh, marine mammals right through to the salmon. So well done to you all. I, I just want to go back on this point, though, about I was hopping up and down a little bit, I must be honest, about this comment about the, uh, the superhighway. Maybe I'm being a bit too protective about it. Um, in reality, we've really good evidence that there, is a, that there is a highway on the high seas, well off the coast. I think if we said, which is very valid based on what Han was saying, inshore we were very surprised there wasn't much more directional movement of the fish on the inshore, but we shouldn't interpret that, that they're not going into this relatively tight cluster in terms of, as far as we can see, in terms of this movement northwards. So I think we just need to be careful about that because most of my colleagues that would have been working on Salsi and subsequently it, the superhighway as such was maybe a bit of a misnomer, but that was really the offshore movement along that continental shelf, and we have really good evidence that that, that is the case. It's the, uh, if you like, the joining pieces, the pieces moving out to that, that seem to be a lot more dispersed. I think that I, I'd love people to comment on that if that's incorrect, but I, I just think we need to be clear on that, because certainly the John Gilby paper and so on reinforces the fact that the, there is this consolidation in those areas. And that's why, uh, through Neil, he was able to pick that location from Salsi Merge mm -hmm. for the glider. That was based on this idea yeah. that, th that they were clustering at this point. Anybody want to come in on that? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> just to say, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm, I'm the head of the 
uh, Inland Fisheries Division, the Department of uh, Environment, Climate and Communications in, in Dublin. Um, and uh, I, I pick up Ken's point and I, I pick up Neil's point. One of the surprising things to me as a person who has to, I suppose, write legislation and bring the, mm. um, <clears throat> the findings of our, scienti our scientists into being for terms of management and, and legislation uh, is the, the, the near shore, the uh, inshore element of this and most of the mortalities are there because uh, while that thinking has been developing over the last number of years, it's never been certain. Uh, I also head Ireland's delegation to NASCO, um, and thankfully I have the support of some great people here on that delegation and of the LOX agency. So I think, and Ken of course, who's there long, long time as, as both an official, a scientist and uh, an NGO representative, but I think some of the, the results of this study should be outlined to NASCO because that's where international management is discussed and agreed um, and certainly I think uh, I'll join with Ken and I'll join with Neil who's on the delegation and Francis in bringing this to the attention of NASCO. I think it's, it's internationally important. Mm. Um, the last thing I'll say uh, in this particular segment is that uh, myself and, and uh, our colleagues in Derry in Northern Ireland exercise um, corporate governance and we're the sponsor of the programs for the LOX agency and just to note NSNC colleagues there as well, but I'm extremely proud of the LOX agency's leadership of this program and of the way they brought everything together, so I just wanted to mention that as well. But the nearshore element is a surprise to me, and the last and the very last thing I'll say is I think Ken has a very important point uh, in terms of the, the so-called highway. You know, perhaps what's being said here today is not a single lane highway, it might be a 20 or 30 lane highway, mm -hmm. but there is an element of clustering. So maybe it's time to redefine the highway. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. So if we can keep things moving, just in your sort of points that people made and, and, and um, Dennis just made, what would salmon management at sea then look like if we're starting to identify these highways offshore or closer inshore? Well, Who wants to tackle that easy to answer question <laughs> first? What would salmon management at sea look like? We, I don't know how well we do it in, you know, what people's thoughts are about how we do it inland, how well or badly, but what, what would it see look like? Does anybody want to take a punt on that one? I'll start it anyway. Go for um, it. But going back to Richard's presentation in the morning, uh, in the first session, um, the shows quite clearly that we can now partition the mortality. We can look at river to, through lake with, with Hanla's stuff and to see um, estuary transition, estuary transition to open coast and then onto Ken's um, shelf edge movement. And there is more to come on that with clever and targeted predation tags, temperature tags, different sensors will come on stream and we will be able to get at the um, not just where the, the losses are happening, but closer, looking at the, perhaps other predator species as to what is happening, tying that in with changes in fish stocks. We all know that of the 10-year ten, ten decadal increase in some of the pelagic medium-sized elasmobranchs. We need to look at those, among other things. Um, and then we will find that bar perhaps the very open ocean, which could be climate change driven and really difficult, everything we're looking at, the fisheries, the predators, even the protected predators, which are recovering from, from really low levels, having been controlled by commercial salmon fishermen shooting them in the past, the seals, um, the otter populations of our rivers have come back, the cormorant populations were at an all-time low 20, 30 years ago due to persecution by field sportsmen, fishermen and all sorts. We're fixing things bit by bit, but the salmon could be suffering from some of those fixes because it has its own unique set of um, pressures. And we might need to think very carefully about the balance between human protective actions taken to conserve things, and we control 
pretty much all that environment in some direct or indirect way. And there are going to be very difficult choices. The scientists can carry on plugging away new tech, new tags, new tracking, refine the data. But then we hand it over to the likes of Oliver, Dennis, and saying, you guys have to make the really tough decisions. This is the data to base it on. The politicians have to make those tough decisions. In the past, politicians have probably made decisions based on gut reactions, managing things, looking at their interest groups. But now that data is so public, their actions are much more easy to scrutinize. So the chances of getting this right over the next 20 years, to my mind, are actually quite strong. Um, if we continue to gather the information, put it out there, feed the policymakers the right decision, making information, <coughs> and accept, which is very difficult for a fisheries scientist to accept, that we may not be the only lobby in this equation, and that compromises in for energy, for fisheries, for other actions will have to be made. Tough call, and um, it may not look like the perfect salmon world, but it should be a better salmon world in 20 years' time. Yeah, just to clarify that even though we are able to split the areas into different environments, and we are able to focus in particular hot spots for survival or mortality, uh, the fact that some fish goes gone in the marine might not be a result of what is happening in the marine. What I'm trying to say, mortalities happen at the marine maybe because there is something that happens in fresh water that is impacting them. So still collaboration is key here. I'm going to bring a positive, uh, positive news uh, in Denmark. Uh, Kim uh, is one of the representatives here. They have seen an increase of on the number of salmonids, how they achieve that. And they realize that free flowing rivers really work very well for them. If you remove any barriers, uh, if the fish can migrate at the proper times for them to, to do it, and they don't find many obstacles, chances at the marine are higher for them to survive. So we shouldn't just um, make this arbitrary management uh, boxes because it makes sense from the management point of view, from the government, but we should account for the, the links, the cumulative impacts and how everything is affecting. Because, and what I believe is, we've been doing a lot of work in fresh water and it should be continued because it's acting as a buffer to what is actually happening in the marine, which is the new threat to come. So every, everything is more complex than just dividing and, and putting efforts yeah. in, in different areas. So it's not losing that connection between the, the freshwater habitat restoration programs and, <coughs> and, and efforts there. Art, do you want to come in? Yeah, just on to further build on that link, uh, a very interesting aspect of the Sea Monster project is the development of the marine management plans. And I don't want to steal your thunder for tomorrow uh, whenever there'll be further discussions on steal that. Steal away. Uh, but we have to remember Atlantic salmon are designated under the habitat regulations uh, in, in the marine environment. Uh, it's only in fresh water. Uh, so with that in mind, and following on from Liz's comments about marine, marine protected areas this morning, maybe we need to look at affording some formal legislative uh, basis for, for uh, protecting marine environments. Now, that will be more, made more difficult uh, in a cross-border area, but we have to look at it. Uh, and those marine management plans will highlight the, the issues at play and it's only through formally uh, developing those that we can begin to even consider addressing them. And if a legislative or a regulatory or a voluntary code uh, would be best placed uh, to address those issues. So it's very interesting times. And uh, Sea Monitor is leading the way, mm -hmm. both in cross-border areas, uh, on the periphery of European uh, cross-border areas, uh, and indeed with marine management planning as well. So I think there's a lot to come out, and the legacy of those marine management plans should be a tangible one, and mm -hmm. we're going to have to grapple with tricky issues. Robert alluded to predation. Uh, these can become extremely emotive areas. One person's protected species is another man's uh, predator mm -hmm. uh, who's impacting upon their designated species. So. Uh, we're not going to answer all the questions, and I guess an awful lot of good research just leads to further questions, but we have to get to the stage where we're, we're, uh, at the, at, we're applying adaptive management uh, so that we can uh, demonstrate that we are, we are progressing as well. well. It's an interesting point you make, and 
that's fine to make it now even, and we'll make it tomorrow too, that there could be, for a species like salmon, you have different legislative uh, guidelines or rules in place uh, for the same species in different zones, different parts of the, of the habitat they move through. Yes, Ken. Um, I've been, you'll all, all be glad to hear this, I've been very busy over the last few weeks. So there is another program that we should mention, which is the Samarsh program. And Samarsh is looking at uh, the management primarily of sea trout uh, in the channel between France and uh, uh, the bottom part uh, of England, south of England. And I was asked to uh, coordinate a workshop recently looking at the practical management outputs from Samarsh. And it's all about marine management, would you believe? So I've been ploughing my way through British legislation and EU legislation to try and make sense of this, uh, to give some recommendations to our final conference in two or three weeks' time. And one thing, it, it, it builds actually on what Neil was saying earlier, the one thing that has become very clear from discussions we've had in AST and from the document I've been putting together is that the zone within which we can manage has now shifted. And we've come up with this idea that we should be thinking about 100 kilometres. We should be thinking about our management regime to be from the top of the mountain to 100 kilometres out to sea. Because other, otherwise it's very artificial. We suddenly, if we see a bit of salt water at all, that's somebody else's responsibility, it's getting too complicated or whatever. This new technology has suddenly opened it up to a situation where we have active management within that zone. And when we looked at the results of the Samarsh program, and bearing in mind now what Diego was saying earlier, that these are different creatures to, to, to salmon, there's no doubt about it, if you do the zoning that Neil was mentioning, you can spend your money much more effectively by actually starting in the estuaries and moving out from the estuaries in terms of the proportionality of the funding that you're actually going to spend in terms of improving the stocks. Even though we found very clear evidence in the open ocean, if you like, in the channel, of uh, fish that were long distance migrants, um, in terms of the effects that might have in the overall population, it was probably much less than what was happening near shore. And there was one statistic that uh, was revealed during our workshop, and this was five million meters of gill net every week during the high season off the south coast of England. That's fishing for bass and mullet and so on. And yet when we went looking for the statistics, we were told there was no statistics on bycatch. So, I mean, I, these are the <coughs> active areas. These are the areas where you can manage. And now that we know that these are significant in terms of the overall movement of the fish to sea, um, looking at it in that way strategically might be a better way than the traditional way of looking at it in terms of this false divide between the fresh water, the estuary, and the marine. So it's more holistic for you in terms of the view. It's not just one or the other, or doing one first and then the other. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oliver, do you want to come in on that sort of marine management of salmon? Um, I, I might make a couple of comments. <clears throat> One would be really what you're talking about there in terms of holistic, a holistic approach and how, how you might manage the marine component of, of um, these species in their life, life cycle or their life history. I think for us, the, the sort of buzzword is eco, ecosystem-based approach, really. Um, you know, there's always the, uh, the tendency, I think, or there's quite often a tendency to focus on a particular species or a, a particular functional group and do the best science you can to deliver, you know, recommendations and, and outputs for that. But really, when we're talking in the marine space, we're talking about multiple species and habitats. We're talking about a very dynamic environment. We're also talking about um, a growing imprint of people and human activities on that environment. It's not just fishing or aquaculture or ORE, it's shipping and noise associated with all sorts of activities. So they're, they're, we need to try and integrate better um, the various components of the ecosystem to really understand what the best management actions would be. And um, then the second thing was, I had a question really in terms of the prey component for the juvenile salmonids, and, and I, didn't, I put it into the Slido, but I'm gonna use the opportunity to ask the question. What, like, what do we know about the prey of the juvenile salmonids and, and sea trout that go to sea in the, you know, in, in, in the sort of lower river and in the estuary situation and in the coastal situation? And is there, is there a signal of any change in, in prey distribution or prey quality that might also contribute to lower fitness, uh, reduce survivability? Um, that's one point. And this, the second point then is in relation to predation. We talked, we talked about cormorants. <laughs> 
cormorants and seals, um, mm. but you mentioned yourself, I think elasmobranchs, you know, um, medium size pelagic elasmobranchs, and also we have to think about things like bottlenose dolphin, for example, which we know feed on salmon. Um, they're very charismatic, they're also protected, um, but they're a highly intelligent group hunting um, and solitary hunting mammal. So I think when you're talking about pred predators, I would say open the canvas and try and understand all of the predators and what their, what, what their relative roles might be in, in the scenario. And of course, then you have the difficult societal decisions around what's the value of a salmon stock versus the, salmon, uh, versus the value of a population of seals in a particular location, and how do we, how do we get cons favorable conservation status for all of those things at the same time. But those are, those are really ecosystem level mm. discussions, and uh, I, I think... Your questions sort of come up there behind you. What's known about the prey that juvenile salmon and sea trout rely on? Is that is your question in yeah. the lower river estuary coast, yeah. and can the reduced survival be linked to prey? So. I think it's fair for you to raise a question as a panelist as well. Is there anybody um, on the panel that wants it? Neil's hand's gone up first. Go for it. Uh, I'm, I'm only put my hand up because, first of all, to outline the difficulty with, with that, it's, it's, you've already heard the expression needles and haystacks when you actually try to sample juvenile salmon at sea. So to get samples that you could actually you know, do a proper dietary analysis, it's very difficult. Having said that, though, our colleagues in NOAA, Tim Sheehan, has produced a number of recent publications on exactly that, the prey of the juvenile fish going out. And the answer to your question is both the, the quality and quantity, and, and the, di the different species has changed, and the quality, calorific value of those prey items has changed for smolts leaving certainly okay. from North America, okay. in, in some North American areas. So it's a very difficult one mm -hmm. to get the answer Sorry. because of the nature of the animal you're looking for. As I said, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard enough to even get them to tag and then find them in the ocean. Uh, but when you try to plan a dietary study for juveniles, it'd be very, very difficult. Robert, do you want yeah, to come in on uh, that? And, uh, to add to that, um, particularly for the sort of non salmonid audience, one of the things that's been published several times in the last few decades is the um, advancing in spring of the smolt run. On the bush, we're talking about two to three weeks um, in over 20, 30 year period. And the smolts are running earlier due to milder winters, warmer springs. That combining that with what is known by our marine colleagues, there is a correlation with the marine survival graph decline. So it's, it's obviously potentially part of that story. And one can surmise and has been surmised that if the smolts hit are, are probably evolutionary over a very long stable period of time designed to hit the ocean when the feed is there after the spring plankton bloom, if they shift too far and too early before the, the phytoplankton have triggered the zooplankton, which have triggered the smolts growth uh, and, and the, the larger um, invertebrate items, marine invertebrate that they feed on, and perhaps even the fish fry, they could be short of food, not out in the open ocean, but from the word go. Mm. And when we see the rates and distances which these fish are moving, they're burning a lot of energy. So there is already some answer in terms of the, the, the small timing, which suggests that there is a potential risk there. Just Diego, I think you had your hand up first there. Yeah, in, t in terms of protecting a highly mobile species uh, using ecosystem-based approach, I, I find it difficult uh, concept to, to apply to, to salmonids in particular when they migrate over large distances and our ecosystems, they don't work the same way as they used to. So if we were basing our protection in ecosystems, we, it needs to be, every ecosystem needs to be restored to what it used to be. Uh, I think I'm particularly keen on, on starting to listen to concepts like the, the freedom of movement to protect the species. Because for, for this kind of uh, basking sarks, salmonids, it protects mm -hmm. the right of a fish to complete the life cycle. So the life cycle of salmonids is dependent upon the successful completion of that migration. And that causes a lot of problems in the management as we do, do it these days. 
ecosystem approach management makes sense if you have estuary and resident fish that they will definitely benefit directly from, from having a healthy ecosystem. But the fish, or what we learned from this project, the fish migrate quite fast through those areas. And the, the main challenge at sea is now try to locate where the prey items are. And probably um, that, that's causing some, some mortality, but then again, the results, they say, the result, results are closer to home. So there is a, a lot of research to be done, and I would like maybe to do a research to actually measure whether ecosystem-based approach is a good management tool for highly mobile species. That could be a, itself a very interesting project. Mm -hmm. Rather than assuming it will work, I, I think we need to use this evidence to actually see how it could work, yeah. if you know I'm, what I mean. I'm, I'm yeah. conscious of time. I'm I hope people are okay if we go a little bit longer. Yes? Good. This is interesting. I want to keep it going, but we have a lot of questions stacked up behind this one, so we've only gotten through two or three. Um, there's a connection with this one. Next one, though, is there any evidence that the duration of the at-sea phase for Atlantic salmon is changing in line with climate change, or does anybody have any predictions based on their experience and knowledge? Does anybody want to jump in on that one first? Yes, Ken. Um, I'll, I'll cover two, two birds with one stone, if I may just take a step back. It's the same, it's the, answering the same question very quickly. We have two colleagues in the University of Strathclyde that we've been funding through the Lightly Suspects framework, and there's a series of three or four papers just about to come out uh, in terms of Oliver's question initially, um, looking at the first 12 weeks at sea and looking at the currents, looking at the temperature, and most importantly, looking at the plankton. And probably the most startling result is the change in energy that's very obvious from the 1960s until now in terms of what they're facing into at the peak migration period, taking up the, the, the point that Robert made earlier in terms of the timing. So those papers, I think, will be very helpful, not so much in terms of the inner estuarine area, but those early days at sea in terms of understanding what difficulties the fish are facing into. And they, they'll be sent for publication very shortly. Okay. Um. Does anybody want to come in on the evidence of the sea phase duration in line with the changing climate? So is there any evidence that the duration of the at sea phase for salmon is changing in line with climate change? Or does anybody have any predictions? Well, I think that's one where the, the Bush data set doesn't really show any real change. We haven't picked any real change up over time. There's still very much a, a late June, early July arrival for the one sea winter fish. And for those that come, um, March onwards arrival for the two sea winter fish. So it doesn't seem to have changed. The smoke run might be three or four weeks earlier. So that's a three or four week extension, if you like, of their life at sea. Um, and there have been over short and long term and, and numerous publications on the shifts between one sea winter and two sea winter components of the fishery, but no real evidence as to whether fish that um, fail to grow big enough at one sea winter, they don't seem to stay out. They just seem to either die or come back as small grills. So there's no um, like adding a year or no option of staying out another year. Fish are conditioned to do particular things. And certainly the, the exit and exit to sea and re-entry data from the bush would not suggest any major change in the, the duration of time at sea for that stock. Others could be different. <coughs> yes, Neil. I mean, we, do, we also have the indir indirect evidence of, of uh, declining survival from the post-smolt scale analysis. So the post-smolt growth in that early uh, few weeks at sea up to the Christmas time period when they're released uh, has been declining, um, and that has been linked to some of the ocean indicators like the AMO and the NAO. That's, we've known that since the 90s uh, and coming through the 2000s. Um, and we also know that warmer waters tend to tend to not favor salmon post molt growth. So, I mean, the, the basic answer to the question, if you get much warmer, it's not going to be good for post molts at sea. You know, they'll either, distributions will change and they'll die out in the southern uh, regions, or and we'll only find them in the colder countries, or something will give you know, in, in the sense that something will, they, they'll either adapt mm -hmm. in some way and we'll have a slightly different kind of animal than we had maybe, uh, 
whatever, 100 years ago. But that's, we don't know yet, because things are just happening as we speak. But the post-smoke growth indices are quite a strong index of poor survival. Do you or the others think that the risk of climate change is actually more in the freshwater because it's more acutely felt there with freshwater temperatures? Or, you know, or is the sea still a concern? Oh, I think it, it's a concern in both. Um, both, equally um, in both. I, As I said, that the, in terms of the post smolts it's, it's not going to be good in terms of growth and survival for post smolts And then the freshwater, I'm sure it's not going to be. I mean, the big thing in freshwater changes, like it, it, things like flash flooding and things like that, they're a real danger in terms of uh, washing, you know, uh, recently spawned fish out or juveniles out or displacing fish downstream too early. That's a, that's a, big, a big concern for the future. Yeah. Yeah, and also the, the summer conditions that salmon are experiencing. In, um, in recent years, we've had two uh, heat waves in this part of the world, 2018, 2021, with um, salmon and trout streams pushing known lethal temperatures in summer in some places, 21, 22 degrees, and a raft of projects being developed for looking at temperature monitoring, large-scale projects in Scotland and Ireland, looking at temperature um, sensor networks, looking at the possibility of where trees have been cleared, replanting shade on the rivers. There are things we can do about it, but again, salmon don't like um, a dry stream at 22 degrees. It's not good for them. Um, and we've seen that twice in the last five years. There's a question come in that's linked back to Oliver's uh, question a few moments ago. With the excess of flying uh, swimming predators, flying and swimming predators, I assume it means, uh, will control ever become a reality given the general public's opinion <coughs> uh, or the lobbying of RSPB and other campaigning groups, people's opinions? Anybody want to tackle that easy one? <laughs> yes, uh, Francis? Yeah. I, I suppose I think as managers, I mean, I was sort of glad to hear that conversation being opened up today because for a number of years now, if you mentioned, and I'll use the word control, of any predator or any species as such, um, it, was, it was an immediate sort of a fight. Mm -hmm. And like, I suppose maybe on a localized level, like we're looking at some rivers um, in the Republic of Ireland that have large seal populations, large seal colonies, right? And those fisheries are simply not recovering the likes of the Esk, the Guibara, there are many others. And I think what we need to do here is we need to actually really undertake studies on those fisheries. I would like to see, you know, with, with the best will, will in the world permission to look at controlling some of the predators over a period of time, for a set amount of time, to see will these fisheries actually recover. And it's about getting the balance right. I mean, we put a lot of money, a lot of effort into um, fisheries protection, um, the pathways for, 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 for fish coming back. We have had to refocus as an agency. But when we actually see large amounts of fish entering into an estuary, but very, very few fish getting into the system because in some cases, colonies, for example, of seals, are, the, the colony is kind of widely dispersed. But in some other estuaries, all of the salmon pass through a very, very narrow channel. And Surrounding that channel, for example, are, there's, there's a, you know, a, a, rock, a rock system, and that is where all the predators are waiting. And it's, it's, it's at that low water, first flow stage when those fish are coming into the estuary. Uh, so I think I would like to see that conversation being opened up, um, backed up by science. And I do think that um, as managers, we shouldn't be afraid to say it, have the difficult arguments, and, and we are supposed to try and influence policy. That's a good point you make about like allowing the conversation to take place yeah. and considering all points and sides of it. Dennis, yeah. Yeah, I, just to say, um, from my point of view, as a, I suppose a manager, regulator, legislator, there is a knowledge gap here, you know, and it's not on our side of the equation. I mean, thanks to our research and scientists over many, many years, we know now how many salmon are required in every single river to, I suppose, maintain a healthy population. What we don't know on the other side of the equation, and I'm not advocating a cull or anything like that, but what we don't know, where the knowledge gap is, is how many predators are needed? Okay. How many seals, how many cormorants? There's no knowledge out there, and I don't manage those, those species, they're managed by 
the National Park and Wildlife Service in Ireland, and they're separately managed, I think, in Northern Ireland, and separately managed in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Mm. But that's a knowledge gap. So we are ahead of the curve here, in my opinion, in that we can establish how many salmon, the exact number of salmon that are required to maintain a healthy population, but nobody has ever told us how many predators are required to maintain their healthy population. It's a gap. And we we're, we're, are the sector that suffers from it. I'll just make that. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Keep it moving, Colin. I, I, I was just going to add to that, actually. That, that there is, uh, about 10 years ago, Scottish Natural Heritage, at the time now in Nature Scott, uh, changed its view on controlling predators uh, in the sense that it started to look more favorably on applications that were coming from a whole bunch of, of wildlife managers, but fisheries managers in particular, which is the topic of discussion today, uh, on uh, the potential for cro controlling predators of, of, of fish in populations. Now, they, had, they set some, some uh, criteria under which they might issue a license. There had to be other techniques employed before they would uh, uh, allow a license to kill, and, and almost always the license is limited in terms of the number of, of uh, predators that can be killed. Um, but going back to the, the point about exactly how many should be killed, that is, there, there has been no application that I've ever seen or heard of where there has been a very good case put forward for the, this number of predators is, is, is too many. It's usually been uh, this population is declining. So there's all the evidence that's presented in terms of trying to get a license is the population is declining, we've got predators, there is an imbalance there without any real knowledge of whether it's too many or too little in terms of the predator numbers. Yeah. Um, so it is possible. Um, it is very controversial, of course. Yes. Diego? Yeah, I, I think, sorry. I think co controlling the predators, it is quite a very intuitive way to remove some of the pressures that the salmonids experience. However, I don't know how the system will evolve, meaning maybe predators, you can control them for X number of years, they get used to it, then they, they are uh, as prolific as they used to. I think this is a, a question I'm facing every time when I'm speaking with angling clubs. What do you do about the cormorants? What do you do about seals? And now I found the solution, same argument. Uh, I, I put the argument back and they say, what about if we bring a sprat to the to the story? What about the smelt? Why not to give the cormorant even more fish to it? Maybe some more salmonids will escape. So having healthier ecosystems, it will benefit. It will salmon will have a better chance. It's time for us to stop babysitting salmon as we have done it, and yes, <laughs> give the whole. We're going to cut. We're going to cut and quote that. The, the time to, to thrift, to restore what it used to be in the foil: a sprat, a smelt, a dogfish, a, you name so it. You're, um, you're you're sort of turning it on its head there and saying instead of you know calling or, or management of the predators, add more prey to the system and put more on the menu. Yeah. Is that yeah. possible? You know, more diverse. So hands menu. are going up left, right, and center here. Who wants to come in on that one, Francis? Yeah, I, I, would, I would just like to come in on that. I think that's that's a very well made point, but you're to consider that you consider all the actors, all the departments. You know, it's about what you can control for a period of time to keep a particular stock at a certain level, that it doesn't go so low that you know you have a local extinction. You know, and that, that simply can't happen or, or come very close. We see rivers, small, small rivers all over Ireland that have only 20, 30 fish going into them now. That's not sustainable. So I do get your point, but you have to get so many stakeholders on board, so many departments on board. Um, so it, it, you could look at it either way. Um, mm -hmm. It just depends what lens you're looking, looking through. I think we have time for one more point to come in, Art. Yeah, just to build on that, uh, it's about an evidence base. We've talked a lot today about uh, that evidence base, but we didn't have any avian or other predator information, uh, maybe in the seals, uh, cetaceans, etc. we had, but from an avian predator perspective, uh, you know, there's maybe further evidence base to be developed. And I agree with Diego wholeheartedly about managing to abundance. You know, it's very hard to 
start making overarching selective decisions. Uh, we've seen where that's led humanity to now. <laughs> if we <coughs> keep making complicated decisions like that, it uh, could be to our detriment and to the species that we're meant to be conserving's detriment as well. So let's manage for abundance and uh, collect further evidence base to make proactive, active management decisions. Okay, Robert, yeah, I'll just let you one, one, go and for I it. think back to Diego's point from earlier, the, I think the structure, physical structure of um, river and estuarine environments, particularly urban ones, which humans have created, adds massively to this problem in cases. Um, one of the most traumatic days of my fishery science life um, well, there's a small salmon population in the River Lagan, which we have introduced, um, and we introduced by, by, from bush stock one day about 20 years ago. In a very dry summer, we had pretty much the entire summer run at Strand Middles Weir in, in top end of Belfast, where the tide meets the river in a vertical sluice with a little side cut. We had four seals came in, Atlantic greys, and my staff watched as they collectively herded the salmon in successive waves into the little cut beside the lock. And they took 12 fish that we saw in a population that we reckoned was totaling 50 in a single day. Now, the solution to that, obviously, take out the seals. Well, they're far too popular in Belfast for you to do that. You could scare them away, or you could remove the weir and disperse those salmon and we're four kilometers of river, problem gone. Mm -hmm. So the structure of environments and the changes we've made, not in, in ecology by people, on, is where that affects the balance. We need to look at that. Yeah. And that might be our solution. Yeah. More natural environments, as Diego pointed out earlier. Given the, the yeah, it's just, it's nice to see seals in Belfast. They weren't there until we put the salmon back. Um, but it's nice to see them there. And it's nice to see otters, and it's good to see a balance. So the questions are absolutely right. Um, what's the balance? And get the environment right. And, and we might go somewhere to fixing the problem. Please. And in the days of the North Coast and coastal salmon fisheries, where individual seals could be identified coming to sites repeatedly, licenses were issued to fishermen to shoot the, the ones that were being a nuisance. So, yeah. so, but one would rather not do it. Um, we would rather it wasn't necessary. And I would take a stab and say that's unlikely to change, that legislation. Dennis. Robert mentioned the key word here, um, in my opinion. I mean, what we have now is a system where, you know, we protect certain species, and they are protected species, so is salmon. But if you protect species to the detriment of another species, there is no, as the word Robert used, balance. And that's what's really required here from people like me and politicians, yes. etc. So that's an important uh, point that Robert has made. I think what I've gathered from today is that having the evidence that these types of projects generate can allow you to inch forward more towards what balance looks like or should look like. And it certainly is a complex issue even when you ask a seemingly simple question like should we control some of these predators that we're identifying and look at the can of worms we've opened up. But it sounds like the solutions are out there maybe more on a case by case, habitat by habitat basis, um, dependent on where you're looking. But they're certainly there for us to explore and consider further. Conscious of time, we're not gonna get through all the questions, but that's the joy of having another day and uh, time tonight to, you know, 
ask them individually if you'd like. There were a few technical questions about the types of tags and, the, and, and that sort of thing, so please feel free to chat more and mingle this evening. I'd like to thank uh, our distinguished panel here. Um, we've got a best water-based film poll that's gone up, so Jaws has won pretty convincingly. And Salmon stayed ahead. You'll be happy to know, Salmon panelists, Salmon stayed ahead as our most popular animal, though it should be said the skate probably due to the panel earlier and the scientists in the room of a close second, so go skate. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. So that brings today's um, events to a close. And well, for now, we're going to take a short break and have dinner. Um, I've, thank you very much for your attention today. I know it was a lot of information thrown at you. Um, we've gone on a little bit longer. That's, that's okay. I think it's been worth it. Um, we're now going to take a break until about 7.30. If you could show up at the City Hotel around then uh, for a drinks reception and some grub, um, we'll see that you're fed and that you've got more opportunity to mingle and ask questions directly to the experts and the scientists and enjoy the time we've got left. So unless there's anything else that I'm forgetting, I'm not seeing any hands going up. I think I've covered it. Thanks once again. Really appreciate your attention and your time. We'll see you at the City Hotel.